Chapter thirty seven of The Egoist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Egoist by George Meredith. Chapter thirty seven. Contains clever fencing and intimations of the need for it. That woman Lady Bush had predicted after the event, Constantia Durham's defection. She had also, subsequent to Willoughby's departure on his travels, uttered sceptical things concerning his rooted attachment to Letitia Dale. In her bitter vulgarity, that beaten rival of Mrs. Mountstuart Jenkinson for the leadership of the county, had taken his nose for a melancholy prognostic of his fortunes. She had recently played on his name, she had spoken the hideous English of his fate. Little as she knew, she was alive to the worst interpretation of appearances. No other eulogy occurred to her now than to call him the best of cousins, because Vernon Whitford was housed and clothed and fed by him. She had nothing else to say for a man she thought luckless. She was a woman barren of wit, stripped of style, but she was wealthy and a gossip, a forge of showering sparks, and she carried Lady Culmer with her. The two had driven from his house to spread the malignant rumour abroad. Already they blew the biting world on his raw wound. Neither of them was like Mrs. Mountstuart, a witty woman, who could be hoodwinked. They were dull women, who steadily kept on their own scent of the fact, and the only way to confound such inveterate forces was to be ahead of them, and seize and transform the expected fact, and astonish them, when they came up to him, with a totally unanticipated fact. "'You see, you were in error, ladies.' "'And so we were, Sir Willoughby, and we acknowledge it. We never could have guessed that.' Thus the phantom couple in the future delivered themselves, as well they might at the revelation. He could run far ahead. Ay, but to combat these dolts, facts had to be encountered, deeds done, in groaning earnest. These representatives of the pig-sconces of the population judged by circumstances. Airy shows and seams had no effect on them. Dexterity of fence was thrown away. A flying peep at the remorseless might of dullness in compelling us to a concrete performance counter to our inclinations, if we would deceive its terrible instinct, gave Willoughby for a moment the survey of a sage. His intensity of personal feeling struck so vivid an illumination of mankind at intervals that he would have been individually wise had he not been moved by the source of his accurate perceptions to a personal feeling of opposition to his own sagacity. He loathed and he despised the vision, so his mind had no benefit of it, though he himself was whipped along. He chose rather, and the choice is open to us all, to be flattered by the distinction it revealed between himself and mankind. But if he was not as others were, why was he discomfited, solicitous, miserable? To think that it should be so, ran dead against his conqueror's theories wherein he had been trained, which, so long as he gained success, awarded success to native merit, grandeur to the grand in soul, as light kindles light, nature presents the example. His early training, his bright beginning of life, had taught him to look to earth's principal fruits as his natural portion, and it was owing to a girl that he stood for a mark for tongues, naked, wincing at the possible malignity of a pair of harridans. Why not whistle the girl away? Why, then he would be free to enjoy, careless, younger than his youth in the rebound to happiness. And then would his nostrils begin to lift, and sniff at the creeping up of a thick, pestiferous vapour. Then in that volume of stench would he discern the sullen yellow eye of malice. A malarious earth would hunt him all over it. The breath of the world, the world's view of him, was partly his vital breath, his view of himself. The ancestry of the tortured man had bequeathed him this condition of high civilization among their other bequests. Your withered contracted egoists of the hut and the grot reck not of public opinion. They crave but for liberty and leisure to scratch themselves and soothe an excessive scratch. Willoughby was expansive, a blooming one, born to look down upon a tributary world, and to exult in being looked to. Do we wonder at his consternation in the prospect of that world's blowing foul on him? Princes have their obligations to teach them they are mortal, and the brilliant air of a tributary world is equally enchained by the homage it brings him. More inasmuch as it is immaterial, elusive, not gathered by the tax, and he cannot capitally punish the treasonable recusants. Still must he be brilliant, he must court his people. He must ever, both in his reputation and his person, aching though he be, show them a face and a leg. 
The wounded gentleman shut himself up in his laboratory, where he could stride to and fro, and stretch out his arms for physical relief, secure from observation of his fantastical shapes, under the idea that he was meditating. There was perhaps enough to make him fancy it in the heavy fire of shots exchanged between his nerves and the situation. There were notable flashes. He would not avow that he was in agony. It was merely a desire for exercise. Quintessence of worldliness, Mrs. Mountstuart appeared through his farthest window, swinging her skirts on a turn at the end of the lawn, with Horace de Craye smirking beside her. And the woman's vaunted penetration was unable to detect the histrionic Irishism of the fellow. Or she liked him for his acting and nonsense. Nor she only. The voluble beast was created to snare women. Willoughby became smitten with an adoration of steadfastness in women. The incarnation of that divine quality crossed his eyes. She was clad in beauty. A horrible nondescript convulsion composed of yawn and groan drove him to his instruments, to avert a renewal of the shock. And while arranging and fixing them for their unwonted task, he compared himself advantageously with men like Vernon and de Craye, and others of the county, his fellows in the hunting-field and on the magistrate's bench, who neither understood nor cared for solid work, beneficial, practical work, the work of science. He was obliged to relinquish it. His hand shook. "'Experiments will not advance much at this rate,' he said, casting the noxious retardation on his enemies. It was not to be contested that he must speak with Mrs. Mountstuart, however he might shrink from the trial of his facial muscles. Her not coming to him seemed ominous, nor was her behaviour at the luncheon-table quite obscure. She had evidently instigated the gentleman to cross and counter-chatter Lady Bush and Lady Colmer. For what purpose? Clara's features gave the answer. They were implacable, and he could be the same. In the solitude of his room he cried right out. I swear it. I will never yield her to Horace de Cray. She shall feel some of my torments, and try to get the better of them by knowing she deserves them." He had spoken it, and it was an oath upon the record. Desire to do her intolerable hurt became an ecstasy in his veins, and produced another stretching fit that terminated in a violent shake of the body and limbs, during which he was a spectacle for Mrs. Mountstuart at one of the windows. He laughed as he went to her, saying, no, no work to-day. It won't be done. Positively refuses." "'I am taking the professor away,' said she. "'He is fidgety about the cold he caught.' Sir Willoughby stepped out to her. "'I was trying at a bit of work for an hour, not to be idle all day.' "'You work in that den of yours every day?' "'Never less than an hour, if I can snatch it.' "'It is a wonderful resource.' The remark set him throbbing, and thinking that a prolongation of his crisis exposed him to the approaches of some organic malady, possibly heart disease. "'A habit,' he said. "'In there I throw off the world.' "'We shall see some results in due time.' "'I promise none. I like to be abreast of the real knowledge of my day, that is all.' "'And a pearl among country gentlemen.' "'In your gracious consideration, my dear lady. Generally speaking, it would be more advisable to become a chatterer and keep an anecdotal notebook. I could not do it simply because I could not live with my own emptiness for the sake of making an occasional display of fireworks. I aim at solidity. It is a narrow aim, no doubt, not much appreciated." "'Letitia Dale appreciates it.' A smile of enforced ruefulness, like a leaf curling in heat, wrinkled his mouth. Why did she not speak of her conversation with Clara? "'Have they caught Crossjay?' he said. "'Apparently they are giving chase to him.' The likelihood was that Clara had been overcome by timidity. "'Must you leave us?' "'I think it prudent to take Professor Crooklyn away.' "'He still—' "'The extraordinary resemblance.' "'A word aside to Dr. Middleton will dispel that.' "'You are thoroughly good.' This hateful encomium of commiseration transfixed him. Then she knew of his calamity. "'Philosophical,' he said, "'would be the proper term, I think. "'Colonel de Craye, by the way, promises me a visit when he leaves you.' "'Tomorrow?' "'The earlier, the better. He is too captivating. He is delightful. He won me in five minutes. I don't accuse him. Nature gifted him to cast the spell. We are weak women, Sir Willoughby.' She knew. "'Like to like, the witty to the witty, ma'am. You won't compliment me with a little bit of jealousy? I forbear from complimenting him. Be philosophical, of course, if you have the philosophy. 
I pretend to it. Probably I suppose myself to succeed because I have no great requirement of it. I cannot say. We are riddles to ourselves." Mrs. Mountstuart pricked the turf with the point of her parasol. She looked down, and she looked up. "'Well,' said he to her eyes, "'Well! And where is Letitia Dale?' He turned about to show his face elsewhere. When he fronted her again, she looked very fixedly, and set her head shaking. "'It will not do, my dear Sir Willoughby.' What? I never could solve enigmas. Playing ta-ta-ta-ta ad infinitum, then. Things have gone far. All parties would be happier for an excursion. Send her home. Letitia! I can't part with her. Mrs. Mountstuart put a tooth on her under lip as her head renewed its brushing negative. In what way can it be hurtful that she should be here, ma'am? He ventured to persist. Think! She is proof. Twice! The word was big artillery. He tried the affectation of a staring stupidity. She might have seen his heart thump, and he quitted the mask for an agreeable grimace. She is inaccessible. She is my friend. I guarantee her on my honour. Have no fear for her. I beg you to have confidence in me. I would perish, rather. No soul on earth is to be compared with her." Mrs. Mountstuart repeated, Twice. The low monosyllable, musically spoken in the same tone of warning of a gentle ghost, rolled a thunder that maddened him, but he dared not take it up to fight against it on plain terms. "'Is it for my sake?' he said. "'It will not do, Sir Willoughby.' She spurred him to a frenzy. "'My dear Mrs. Mountstuart, you have been listening to tales. I am not a tyrant. I am one of the most easy-going of men. Let us preserve the forms due to society. I say no more. As for poor old Vernon, people call me a good sort of cousin. I should like to see him comfortably married, decently married, this time. I have proposed to contribute to his establishment. I mention it to show that the case has been practically considered. He has had a tolerably souring experience of the State. He might be inclined, if, say, you took him in hand for another venture. It's a demoralizing lottery. However, government sanctions it. But, Sir Willoughby, what is the use of my taking him in hand, when, as you tell me, Letitia Dale holds back?" She certainly does. Then we are talking to no purpose, unless you undertake to melt her. He suffered a lurking smile to kindle to some strength of meaning. You are not over-considerate in committing me to such an office. You are afraid of the danger, she all but sneered. Sharpened by her tone, he said, I have such a love of steadfastness of character, that I should be a poor advocate in the endeavour to break it. And frankly, I know the danger. I saved my honour when I made the attempt. That is all I can say." "'Upon my word!' Mrs. Mountstuart threw back her head to let her eyes behold him summarily over their fine aquiline bridge. "'You have the art of mystification, my good friend. Abandon the idea of Letitia Dale. And marry your cousin Vernon to whom? Where are we?" "'As I said, ma'am, I am an easy-going man. I really have not a spice of the tyrant in me. An intemperate creature held by the collar may have that notion of me, while pulling to be released as promptly as it entered the noose. But I do strictly and sternly object to the scandal of violent separations, open breaches of solemn engagements, a public rupture. Put it that I am the cause, I will not consent to a violation of decorum. Is that clear? It is just possible for things to be arranged, so that all parties may be happy in their way, without much hubbub. Mind, it is not I who have willed it so. I am, and I am forced to be, passive. But I will not be obstructive." He paused, waving his hand to signify the vanity of the more that might be said. Some conception of him, dashed by incredulity, excited the lady's intelligence. "'Well!' she exclaimed. You have planted me in the land of conjecture. As my husband used to say, I don't see light, but I think I see the lynx that does. We won't discuss it at present. I certainly must be a younger woman than I supposed, for I am learning hard. Here comes the professor, buttoned up to the ears, and Dr. Middleton flapping in the breeze. There will be a cough, and a footnote referring to the young lady at the station, if we stand together. So please order my carriage." You found Clara complacent, roguish. I will call to-morrow. You have simplified my task, Sir Willoughby, very much. That is, assuming that I have not entirely mistaken you. I am so far in the dark that I have to help myself by recollecting how Lady Bush opposed my view of a certain matter formerly. 
Skepticism is her forte. It will be the very oddest thing, if after all— No, I shall own, romance has not departed. Are you fond of dupes? I detest the race. An excellent answer. I could pardon you for it. She refrained from adding, If you are making one of me. Sir Willoughby went to ring for her carriage. She knew. That was palpable. Clara had betrayed him. The earlier Colonel de Craye leaves Pattern Hall the better, she had said that, and all parties would be happier for an excursion. She knew the position of things, and she guessed the remainder. But what she did not know, and could not divine, was the man who fenced her. He speculated further on the witty and the dull. These latter are the redoubtable body. They will have facts to convince them. They had, he confessed it to himself, precipitated him into the novel sphere of his dark hints to Mrs. Mountstuart, from which the utter darkness might allow him to escape. Yet it embraced him singularly, and even pleasantly, with the sense of a fact established. It embraced him even very pleasantly. There was an end to his tortures. He sailed on a tranquil sea, the husband of a steadfast woman, no rogue. The exceeding beauty of steadfastness in women clothed Letitia in graces Clara could not match. A tried steadfast woman is the one jewel of the sex. She points to her husband like the sunflower. Her love illuminates him. She lives in him, for him. She testifies to his worth. She drags the world to his feet. She leads the chorus of his praises. She justifies him in his own esteem. Surely there is not on earth such beauty. If we have to pass through anguish to discover it, and cherish the peace it gives to clasp it, calling it ours, is a full reward. Deep in his reverie, he said his adieus to Mrs. Mountstuart, and strolled up the avenue behind the carriage-wheels, unwilling to meet Letitia till he had exhausted the fresh savour of the cud of fancy. Supposing it done. It would be generous on his part. It would redound to his credit. His home would be a fortress, impregnable to tongues. He would have divine security in his home. One who read and knew and worshipped him would be sitting there star-like, sitting there awaiting him, his fixed star. It would be marriage with a mirror, with an echo, marriage with a shining mirror, a choric echo. It would be marriage with an intellect, with a fine understanding, to make his home a fountain of repeatable wit, to make his dear old pattern hall the luminary of the county. He revolved it as a chant, with anon and anon involuntarily a discordant animadversion on Lady Bush. Its attendant imps heard the angry inward cry. Forthwith he set about painting Letitia in delectable human colours, like a miniature of the past century, reserving her ideal figure for his private satisfaction. The world was to bow to her visible beauty, and he gave her enamel and glow, a taller stature, a swimming air, a transcendency that exorcised the image of the old witch who had driven him to this. The result in him was, that Letitia became humanly and avowedly beautiful. Her dark eyelashes on the pallor of her cheeks lent their aid to the transformation, which was a necessity to him, so it was performed. He received the waxen impression. His retinue of imps had a revel. We hear wonders of men, and we see a lifting up of hands in the world. The wonders would be explained, and never a hand needed to interject, if the mystifying man were but accompanied by that monkey-eyed confraternity. They spy the heart and its twists. The heart is the magical gentleman. None of them would follow where there was no heart. The twists of the heart are the comedy. The secret of the heart is its pressing love of self, says the book. By that secret the mystery of the organ is legible, and a comparison of the heart to the mountain rillet is taken up to show us the unbaffled force of the little channel in seeking to swell its volume, strenuously, sinuously, ever in pursuit of self, the busiest as it is the most single aiming of forces on our earth. And we are directed to the sinuosities for posts of observation, chiefly instructive. Few maintain a stand there. People see, and they rush away to interchange liftings of hands at the sight, instead of patiently studying the phenomenon of energy. Consequently, a man in love with one woman, and in all but absolute consciousness, behind the thinnest of veils, preparing his mind to love another, will be barely credible. 
The particular hunger of the forceful but adaptable heart is the key of him. Behold the mountain rillet, become a brook, become a torrent, how it in arms a handsome boulder! Yet if the stone will not go with it, on it hurries, pursuing self in extension, down to where perchance a dam has been raised of a sufficient depth to enfold and keep it from inordinate restlessness. Letitia represented this peaceful restraining space in prospect. But she was a faded young woman. He was aware of it, and systematically looking at himself with her upturned orbs, he accepted her benevolently as a god grateful for worship, and used the divinity she imparted to paint and renovate her. His heart required her so. The heart works the springs of imagination. Imagination received its commission from the heart, and was a cunning artist. Cunning to such a degree of seductive genius that the masterpiece it offered to his contemplation enabled him simultaneously to gaze on Clara and think of Letitia. Clara came through the park gates with Vernon, a brilliant girl indeed, and a shallow one, a healthy creature and an animal, attractive but capricious, impatient, treacherous, foul, a woman to drag men through the mud. She approached. End of chapter 37 Chapter thirty eight of the Egoist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Magdalena Cook. The Egoist by George Meredith. In which we take a step to the centre of the egoism. They met. Vernon soon left them. You have not seen Crossjay? Willoughby inquired. No, said Clara. Once more, I beg you to pardon him. He spoke falsely, owing to his poor boy's idea of chivalry. The chivalry to the sex which commences in lies ends by creating the woman's hero, whom we see about the world and in certain courts of law. His ability to silence her was great. She could not reply to speech like that. You have, said he, made a confidant of Mrs. Mountstuart? Yes. This is your purse. I thank you. Professor Crooklyn had managed to make your father acquainted with your project. That, I suppose, is a railway ticket in the fold of the purse. He was assured at the station that you had taken a ticket to London, and would not want the fly. It is true. I was foolish. You have had a pleasant walk with Vernon, turning me in and out. We did not speak of you. You allude to what he would never consent to. He's an honest fellow in his old-fashioned way. He's a secret old fellow. Does he ever talk about his wife to you? Clara dropped her purse and stooped to pick it up. I know nothing of Mr. Whitford's affairs, she said, and she opened the purse and tore to pieces the railway ticket. The stories are proof that romantic spirits do not furnish the most romantic history. You have the word chivalry frequently on your lips. He chivalrously married the daughter of the lodging-house, where he resided before I took him. We obtained information of the auspicious union in a newspaper report of Mrs. Whitford's drunkenness and rioting at a London railway terminus. Probably the one with your ticket would have taken you yesterday, for I heard the lady was on her way to us for supplies. The connubial larder being empty. I am sorry. I am ignorant. I have heard nothing. I know nothing, said Clara. You are disgusted, but half the students and authors you hear of marry in that way, and very few have Vernon's luck. She had good qualities, asked Clara. Her underlip hung. It looked like disgust. He begged her not indulge the feeling. Literary men, it is notorious, even with the entry to society, have no taste in women. The housewife is their object. Ladies frighten and would, no doubt, be an annoyance and hindrance to them at home. You said he was fortunate? You have a kindness for him. I respect him. He is a friendly old fellow in his awkward fashion, honourable and so forth. But a disreputable alliance of that sort sticks to a man. The world will talk. Yes, he was so fortunate so far. He fell into the mire and got out of it. Were he to marry again, she died. Don't be startled. It was a natural death. 
she responded to the sole wishes left to his family. He buried the woman, and I received him. I took him on my tour. A second marriage might cover the first. There would be a buzz about the old business. The woman's relatives write to him still. Try to bleed him, I dare say. However, now you understand his gloominess. I don't imagine he regrets his loss. He probably sentimentalizes, like most men when they are well rid of a burden. You must not think the worst of him. I do not, said Clara. I defend him whenever the matter's discussed. I hope you do. Without approving his folly, I can't wash him clean. They were at the hall's doors. She waited for any personal communications he might be pleased to make, and as there was none, she ran upstairs to her room. He had tossed her to Vernon in his mind, not only painlessly, but with a keen acid of satisfaction. The heart is the wizard. Next he bent his deliberate steps to Laetitia. The mind was guilty of some hesitation. The feet went forward. She was working at an embroidery by an open window. Colonel de Cray leaned outside, and Willoughby pardoned her air of demure amusement on hearing him say, No, I have had one of the pleasantest half-hours of my life, and would rather idle here, if idle you will have it, than employ my faculties on horseback. Time is not lost in conversing with Miss Dale, said Willoughby. The light was tender to her complexion where she sat in partial shadow. De Cray asked whether Crossjay had been caught. Letitia murmured a kind word for the boy. Willoughby examined her embroidery. The ladies Eleanor and Isabel appeared. They invited her to take carriage exercise with them. Letitia did not immediately answer, and Willoughby remarked, Miss Dale has been reproving Horace for idleness, and I recommend you to enlist him to do duty, while I relieve him here. The ladies had but to look at the colonel. He was at their disposal, if they would have him. He was marched to the carriage. Letitia plied her threads. Colonel de Cray spoke of Crossjay, she said. May I hope you have forgiven the poor boy, Sir Willoughby? He replied, plead for him. I wish I had eloquence. In my opinion, you have it. If he offends, it is never from meanness. At school, among comrades, he would shine. He is in too strong a light. His feelings and his moral nature are overexcited. That was not the case when he was at home with you. I am severe. I am stern. A Spartan mother. My system of managing a boy would be after that model. Except in this, he should always feel that he could obtain forgiveness. Not at the expense of justice. Ah, young creatures are not to be arraigned before the higher courts. It seems to me perilous to terrify their imaginations. If we do so, are we not likely to produce their very evil we are combating? The alternations for the young should be school and home, and it should be in their hearts to have confidence that forgiveness alternates with discipline. They are of too tender an age for the rigours of the world. We are in danger of hardening them. I prove to you that I am not possessed of eloquence. You encourage me to speak, Sir Willoughby. You speak wisely, Laetitia. I think it true. Will not you reflect on it? You have only to do so to forgive him. I am growing bold indeed, and shall have to beg forgiveness for myself. You still write? You continue to work with your pen? said Willoughby. A little, a very little. I do not like you to squander yourself, waste yourself on the public. You are too precious to feed the beast. Giving out incessantly must end by attenuating. Reserve yourself for your friends. Why should they be robbed of so much of you? It is not reasonable to assume that by lying fallow you would be more enriched for domestic life. Candidly, had I authority, I would confiscate your pen. I would away with that bauble. You will not often find me quoting Cromwell, but his words apply in this instance. I would say rather that Lancet... Perhaps it is the more correct term. It bleeds you. It wastes you. For what? For a breath of fame? A right for money. And there, I would say of another, you subject yourself to the risk of mental degradation. Who knows? Moral. 
trafficking the brains for money must bring them to the level of the purchases in time. I confiscate your pen, Laetitia. It will be to confiscate your own gift, Sir Willoughby. Then that proves. Will you tell me the date? You sent me a gold pen holder on my sixteenth birthday. It proves my utter thoughtlessness then, and later, and later. He rested an elbow on his knee and covered his eyes, murmuring in that profound hollow which is haunted by the voice of a contrite past. And later. The deed could be done. He had come to the conclusion that it could be done, though the effort to harmonise the figure sitting near him with the artistic figure of his purest pigments had cost him labour and a blinking of the eyelids. That also could be done. Her pleasant tone, sensible talk, and the light favouring her complexion helped him in his effort. She was a sober cup, sober and wholesome. Deliriousness is for adolescence. The men who seek intoxicating cups are men who invite their fates. Curiously, yet as positively as things be affirmed, the husband of this woman would be able to boast of her virtues and treasures abroad. As he could not, impossible to say why not, boast of a beautiful wife or a blue-stocking wife. One of her merits as a wife would be this extraordinary neutral merit of a character that demanded colour from the marital hand, and would take it. Laetitia had not to learn that he had much to distress him. Her wonder at his exposure of his grief counteracted a fluttering of vague alarm. She was nervous. She sat in expectation of some burst of regrets or of passion. "'I may hope that you have pardoned Crossjay,' she said. "'My friend,' said he, uncovering his face, "'I am governed by principles. Convince me of an error. I shall not obstinately pursue a premeditated course. But you know me. Men who have not principles to rule their conduct are, well, they are unworthy of half an hour of companionship with you. I will speak to you to-night. I have letters to dispatch. To-night, at twelve in the room where we spoke last. Or await me in the drawing-room. I have to attend to my guest till late. He bowed. He was in a hurry to go. The deed could be done. It must be done. It was his destiny. End of chapter 38「Chapter 39 of The Egoist This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Magdalena Cook The Egoist by George Meredith In the Heart of the Egoist But already he had begun to regard the deed as his executioner. He dreaded meeting Clara. The folly of having retained her stood before him. How now to look on her and keep a sane resolution unwavering? She tempted to the insane. Had she been away, he could have walked through the performance composed by the sense of doing a duty to himself. Perhaps, faintly, hating the poor wretch he made happy at last. Kind to her in a manner, polite. Clara's presence in the house previous to the deed, and, oh, heaven, after it, threatened his wits. Pride? He had none. He cast it down for her to trample it. He caught it back ere it was trodden on. Yes, he had pride. He had it as a dagger in his breast. His pride was his misery. But he was too proud to submit to misery. What I do is right. He said the words, and rectitude smoothed his path, till the question clamoured for answer. Would the world countenance and endorse his pride in Laetitia? At one time, yes. And now? Clara's beauty ascended, laid a beam on him. We are on board the labouring vessel of humanity in a storm, when cries and counter-cries ring out. Disorderliness mixes the crew, and the fury of self-preservation divides. This one is for the ship, that one for his life. Clara was the former to him, Laetitia the latter. But what if there might not be greater safety in holding tenaciously to Clara than in casting her off for Laetitia? No, she had done things to set his pride throbbing in the quick. She had gone bleeding about first to one, then to another. 
she had betrayed him to Vernon and to Mrs. Mountstuart. A look in the eyes of Horace de Cray said to him as well, To whom not? He might hold to her for vengeance, but that appetite was short-lived in him, if it ministered nothing to his purposes. I discard all idea of vengeance, he said, and thrilled burningly to a smart in his admiration of the man, who could be so magnanimous under mortal injury. For the more admirable he, the more pitiable. He drank a drop or two of self-pity like a poison, repelling the assaults of public pity. Clara must be given up. It must be seen by the world that, as he felt, the thing he did was right. Laocoon of his own serpents, he struggled to a certain magnificence of attitude in the muscular net of constrictions he flung around himself. Clara must be given up. Oh, bright abominable! She must be given up, but not to one whose touch of her would be darts in the blood of the yielder, snakes in his bed. She must be given up to an extinguisher, to be the second wife of an old-fashioned semi-recluse, disgraced in his first. And were it publicly known that she had been cast off and had fallen on old Vernon for a refuge, and, part in spite, part in shame, part in desperation, part in a fit of good sense under the circumstances, espoused him, her beauty would not influence the world in its judgment. The world would know what to think. As the instinct of self-preservation whispered to Willoughby, the world, were it requisite, might be taught to think what it assuredly would not think if she should be seen tripping to the altar with Horace de Cray. Self-preservation, not vengeance, breathed that whisper. He glanced at her iniquity for a justification of it, without any desire to do her a permanent hurt. He was highly civilised, but with a strong intention to give her all the benefit of a scandal, supposing a scandal or ordinary tattle and so he handed her to his cousin and secretary, Vernon Whitford, who opened his mouth and shut his eyes. You hear the world. How are we to stop it from chattering? Enough that he had no desire to harm her. Some gentle anticipations of her being tarnished were imperative. They came spontaneously to him. Otherwise the radiance of that bright abominable in loss would have been insufferable. He could not have borne it. He could never have surrendered her. Moreover, a happy present effect was the result. He conjured up the anticipated chatter and shrug off the world so vividly that her beauty grew hectic with a stain, bereft of its formidable magnetism. He could meet her calmly. He had steeled himself. Purity in women was his principal stipulation, and a woman puffed at was not the person to cause him tremors. Consider him indulgently. The egoist is the son of himself. He is likewise the father, and the son loves the father, the father the son. They reciprocate affection through the closest of ties, and shall they view behaviour unkindly, wounding either of them, not for each other's dear sake abhorring the criminal? They would not injure you, but they cannot consent to see one another suffer or crave in vain. The two rub together in sympathy besides relationship to an intenser one. Are you, without much offending, sacrificed by them? It is on the altar of their mutual love, to filial piety or paternal tenderness. The younger has offered a dainty morsel to the elder, or the elder to the younger. Absorbed in their great example of devotion, do they not think of you? They are beautiful. Yet is it most true that the younger has the passions of youth? Whereof will come division between them, and this is a tragic state. They are then pathetic. This was the state of Sir Willoughby lending ear to his elder, until he submitted to bite at the fruit proposed to him. With how wry a mouth the venerable senior chose not to mark, at least, as we perceive, a half of him was ripe of wisdom in his own interests. The cruder half had but to be obedient to the leadership of the sagacity for his interest to be secured, and a filial disposition assisted him, painfully indeed. But the same rare quality directed the good gentleman to swallow his pain. That the son should bewail his fate were a dishonour to the sire. He reverenced and submitted. Thus, to say, consider him indulgently, is too much an appeal for charity on behalf of one requiring but initial anatomy. 
a slicing in halves. To exonerate, perchance exalt him. The egoist is a fountainhead, primeval man. The primitive is born again, the elemental reconstituted. Born again into new conditions, the primitive may be highly polished of men and forfeit nothing save the roughness of his original nature. He is not only his own father, he is ours, and he is also our son. We have produced him, he us. Such were we, to such are we returning. Not other, sings the poet, than one who toilfully works his shallop against the tide. Si braccia forti remiset. Let him happily relax the labour of his arms, however high up the stream, and back he goes. Impeges, to the early principle of our being, with seeds and plants, that are as carelessly weighed in the hand, and as indiscriminately husbanded as our humanity. Poets, on the other side, may be cited for an assurance that the primitive is not the degenerate. Rather is he a sign of the indestructibility of the race, of the ancient energy in removing obstacles to individual growth a sample of what we would be, had we his concentrated power. He is the original innocent, the pure simple. It is we who have fallen, we have melted into society, diluted our essence, dissolved. He stands in the midst, monumentally, a landmark of the tough and honest old ages, with a symbolic alphabet of striking arms and running legs, our early language, scrawled over his person, and the glorious first flint and arrow-head for his crest. At once the spectre of the kitchen midden, and our ripest issue. But society is about him. The occasional spectacle of the primitive dangling on a rope has impressed his mind with the strength of his natural enemy, from which uncongenial sight he has turned shuddering, hardly less to behold the blast that is blown upon a reputation, where one has been disrespectful of the many. By these means, through meditation on the contrast of circumstances in life, a pulse of imagination has begun to stir, and he has entered the upper sphere or circle of spiritual egoism. He has become the civilised egoist, primitive still, as sure as man has teeth, but developed in his manner of using them. Degenerate or not, and there is no just reason to suppose it, Sir Willoughby was a social egoist fiercely imaginative in whatsoever concerned him. He had discovered a greater realm than that of the sensual appetites, and he rushes across and around it in his conquering period with an Alexander's pride. On these wind-like journeys he had carried Constantia, subsequently Clara, and however it may have been in the case of Miss Durham. In that of Miss Middleton it is almost certain she caught a glimpse of his interior, from sheer fatigue in hearing him discourse of it. What he revealed was not the course of her sickness. Women can bear revelations. They are exciting, but the monotonousness. He slew imagination. There is no direr disaster in love than the death of imagination. He dragged her through the labyrinths of his penetralia, in his hungry coveting to be loved more and still more, more still, until imagination gave up the ghost, and he talked to her plain hearing like a monster. It must have been that, for the spell of the primitive upon women is masterful up to the time of contact. And so he handed her to his cousin and secretary, Vernon Whitford, who opened his mouth and shut his eyes. The urgent question was how it was to be accomplished. Willoughby worked at the subject with all his power of concentration, a power that had often led him to feel and say, that as a barrister, a diplomatist, or a general, he would have won his grades, and granting him a personal interest in the business, he might have achieved eminence. He schemed and fenced remarkably well. He projected a scene, following expressions of anxiety on account of old Vernon and his future settlement, and then Clara maintaining her doggedness, to which he was now so accustomed that he could not conceive a change in it says he, if you determine on breaking, I give you back your word on one condition. Whereupon she starts. He insists on her promise. She declines. 
affairs resume their former footing she frets she begs for the disclosure he flatters her by telling her his desire to keep her in the family she is unilluminated but strongly moved by curiosity he philosophizes on marriage what are we poor creatures we must get through life as we can doing as much good as we can to those we love and think as you please i love old vernon am i not giving you the greatest possible proof of it she will not see then flatly out comes the one condition that and no other take vernon and i release you she refuses now ensues the debate all the oratory being with him is it because of his unfortunate first marriage you assured me you thought no worse of him etc she declares the proposal revolting he can distinguish nothing that should offend her in a proposal to make his cousin happy if she will not him irony and sarcasm relieve his emotions but he convinces her he is dealing plainly and intends generosity she is confused she speaks in maiden fashion he touches again on vernon's early escapade she does not enjoy it the scene closes with his bidding her reflect on it and remember the one condition of her release mrs mountstuart jenkinson now reduced to believe that he burns to be free is then called in for an interview with clara his aunt eleanor and isabel besiege her Laetitia, in passionate earnest, besieged her. Her father is wrought on to besiege her. Finally, Vernon is attacked by Willoughby and Mrs. Mountstuart, and here, Willoughby chose to think, was the main difficulty. But the girl has money. She is agreeable. Vernon likes her. She is fond of his Alps. They have tastes in common. He likes her father. And, in the end, he besieges her. Will she yield? De Cray is absent. There is no other way of shunning a marriage she is incomprehensibly but frantically averse to. She is in the toils. Her father will stay at Patton Hall as long as his host desires it. She hesitates. She is overcome, in spite of a certain nausea due to Vernon's preceding alliance. She yields. Willoughby revolved the entire drama in Clara's presence. It helped him to look on her coolly. Conducting her to the dinner-table, he spoke of Crossjay, not unkindly, and at the table he revolved the set of scenes with a heated animation that took fire from the wine and the face of his friend Horace, while he encouraged Horace to be flowingly Irish. He nipped the fellow good-humouredly once or twice, having never felt so friendly to him since the day of his arrival. But the position of critic is instinctively taken by men who do not flow, and Patton Port kept Dr. Middleton in a benevolent reserve when Willoughby decided that something said by de Cray was not new, and laughingly accused him of failing to consult his anecdotal notebook for the double-cross to his last sprightly sally. Your sallies are excellent, Horace, but spare us your aunt sallies. De Cray had no repartee, nor did Dr. Middleton challenge a pun. We have only to sharpen our wits to trip your seductive rattler whenever we may choose to think proper, and, evidently, if we condescended to it, we could do better than he. The critic who has hatched a witticism is impelled to this opinion. Judging of the smiles of the ladies, they thought so too. Shortly before eleven o'clock, Dr. Middleton made a Spartan stand against the offer of another bottle of port. The regulation couple of bottles had been consumed in equal partnership, and the Reverend Doctor and his host were free to pay a ceremonial visit to the drawing-room, where they were not expected. A piece of work of the elder ladies, a silken boudoir sofa rug, was being examined, with high approval of the two younger. Vernon and Colonel de Cray had gone out in search of Crossjay, one to Mr. Dale's cottage, the other to call at the head and under gamekeepers. They were said to be strolling and smoking, for the night was fine. Willoughby left the room and came back with the key of Crossjay's door in his pocket. He foresaw that the delinquent might be of service to him. Laetitia and Clara sang together. 
Laetitia was flushed, Clara pale. At eleven they saluted the ladies Eleanor and Isabel. Willoughby said good-night to each of them, contrasting as he did so the downcast look of Laetitia with Clara's frigid directness. He divined that they were off to talk over their one object of common interest, Crossjay. Saluting his aunts, he took up the rug to celebrate their diligence and taste, and that he might make Dr. Middleton impatient for bed, he provoked him to admire it, held it out and laid it out, and caused the courteous old gentleman some confusion in hitting on fresh terms of commendation. Before midnight the room was empty. Ten minutes later Willoughby paid her a visit, and found her untenanted by the person he had engaged to be there. Vexed by his disappointment, he paced up and down, and chanced abstractly to catch the rug in his hand. For what purpose, he might well ask himself. Admiration of ladies' work in their absence was unlikely to occur to him. Nevertheless, the touch of the warm, soft silk was meltingly feminine. A glance at the mantelpiece clock told him Letitia was twenty minutes behind the hour. Her remissness might endanger all his plans, alter the whole course of his life. The colours in which he painted her were too lively to last. The madness in his head threatened to subside. Certain it was that he could not be ready a second night for the sacrifice he had been about to perform. The clock was at the half-hour after twelve. He flung the silken thing on the central ottoman, extinguished the lamps, and walked out of the room, charging the absent Letitia to bear her misfortune with a consciousness of deserving it. End of chapter 39、chapter、40 of the Egoist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Magdalena Cook. The Egoist by George Meredith. Midnight. Sir Willoughby and Laetitia with young Crossjay under a coverlet. Young Crossjay was a glutton at holidays, and never thought of home till it was dark. The close of day saw him several miles away from the hall, dubious whether he would not round his numerous adventures by sleeping at an inn, for he had lots of money, and the idea of jumping up in the morning in a strange place was thrilling. Besides, when he was shaken out of sleep by Sir Willoughby, he had been told that he was to go, and not to show his face at Paterne again. On the other hand, Miss Middleton had bidden him come back. There was little question with him which person he should obey. He followed his heart. Supper at an inn where he found a company to listen to his adventures delayed him, and a short cut intended to make up for it lost him his road. He reached the hall very late, ready to be in love with the horrible pleasure of a night's rest under the stars if necessary. But a candle burned at one of the back windows. He knocked and a kitchen maid let him in. She had a bowl of hot soup prepared for him. Crossjay tried a mouthful to please her. His head dropped over it. She roused him to his feet, and he pitched against her shoulder. The dry air of the kitchen department had proved too much for the tired youngster. Mary, the maid, got him to step as firmly as he was able, and led him by the back way to the hall, bidding him creep noiselessly to bed. He understood his position in the house, and though he could have gone fast asleep on the stairs, he took a steady aim at his room and gained the door cat-like. The door resisted. He was appalled and unstrung in a minute. The door was locked. Crossjay felt as if he were in the presence of Sir Willoughby. He fled on rickety legs and had a fall and bumps down half a dozen stairs. A door opened above. He rushed across the hall to the drawing-room, invitingly open, and there staggered in darkness to the ottoman and rolled himself in something sleek and warm, soft as hands of ladies and redolent of them, so delicious that he hugged the folds about his head and heels. While he was endeavouring to think where he was, his legs curled, his eyelids shut, and he was in the thick of the day's adventures, doing yet more wonderful things. He heard his own name, that was quite certain. He knew that he had heard it with his ears, as he pursued the fleetest dreams ever accorded to mortal. It did not mix, it was outside him, and like the danger pole in the ice, which the skater shooting hither and yonder comes on again. It recurred, and now it marked a point in his career how it caused him to relax his pace. 
he began to circle and whirl closer around it, until, as a blow, his heart knocked, he tightened himself, thought of bolting, and lay dead still to throb and hearken. "'Oh, Sir Willoughby,' a voice had said. The accents were sharp with alarm. "'My friend, my dearest,' was the answer. "'I came to speak of Crossjay. "'Will you sit here on the ottoman?' "'No, I cannot wait. "'I hoped I had heard Crossjay return. "'I would rather not sit down. "'May I entreat you to pardon him when he comes home? "'You, and only you, may do so. "'I permit no one else. "'Of Crossjay tomorrow.' He may be lying in the fields. We are anxious. The rascal can take pretty good care of himself. Crossjay is perpetually meeting accidents. He shall be indemnified if he has had excess of punishment. I think I will say good night, Sir Willoughby. When freely and unreservedly you have given me your hand. There was hesitation. To say good night? I ask you for your hand. Good night, Sir Willoughby. You do not give it? You are in doubt? Still? What language must I use to convince you? And yet, you know me. Who knows me but you? You have always known me. You are my home and my temple. Have you forgotten your verses of the day of my majority? The dawn star has risen in plentitude of light. Do not repeat them, pray, cried Letitia with a gasp. I have repeated them to myself a thousand times, in India, America, Japan. They were like our English skylark, carolling to me. My heart now burst thy prison, with proud aerial flight. Oh, I beg you, you will not force me to listen to nonsense that I wrote when I was a child. No more of those foolish lines. If you knew what it is to write and despise one's writing, you would not distress me. And since you will not speak of Crossjay tonight, allow me to retire. You know me, and therefore you know my contempt for verses, as a rule, Letitia, but not for yours to me. Why should you call them foolish? They expressed your feelings, hold them sacred. They are something religious to me, not mere poetry. Perhaps the third verse is my favourite. It will be more than I can bear. You were in earnest when you wrote them. I was very young, very enthusiastic, very silly. You were and are my image of constancy. It is an error, Sir Willoughby. I am far from being the same. We are older, I trust wiser. I am, I will own, much wiser. Wise at last, I offer you my hand. She did not reply. I offer you my hand and name, Letitia. No response. You think me bound in honour to another? She was mute. I am free, thank heaven. I am free to choose my mate, the woman I have always loved, freely and unreservedly, as I ask you to give your hand. I offer mine. You are the mistress of Patern Hall, my wife. She had not a word. My dearest, do you not rightly understand? The hand I am offering you is disengaged. It is offered to the lady I respect above all others. I have made the discovery that I cannot love without respecting and as I will not marry without loving, it ensues that I am free. I am yours. At last. Your lips move. Tell me the words. Have always loved, I said. You carry in your bosom the magnet of constancy, and I, in spite of apparent deviations, declare to you that I have never ceased to be sensible of the attraction. And now there is not an impediment. We two, against the world, we are one. Let me confess to an old foible, perfectly youthful, and you will ascribe it to youth. Once I decide to absorb, I mistrusted. That was the reason. I perceive it. You teach me the difference of an alliance with a lady of intellect. The pride I have in you, Letitia, definitely cures me of that insane passion. Call it an insatiable hunger. I recognize it as folly of youth. I have, as it were, gone the tour to come home to you, at last and live our manly life of comparative equals. At last, then, but remember that in the younger man you would have had a despot, perhaps a jealous despot. Young men, I assure you, are orientally inclined in their ideas of love. Love gets a bad name from them. We, my Letitia, do not regard love as a selfishness. If it is, it is the essence of life. At least it is our selfishness rendered beautiful. 
I talk to you like a man who has found a compatriot in a foreign land. It seems to me that I have not opened my mouth for an age. I certainly have not unlocked my heart. Those who sing for joy are not unintelligible to me. If I had not something in me worth saying, I think I should sing. In every sense you reconcile me to men and the world, Letitia. Why press you to speak? I will be the speaker. As surely as you know me, I know you, and... Letitia burst forth with, No! I do not know you, said he, searchingly mellifluous. Hardly. How not? I am changed. In what way? Deeply. Sedata. Materially. Colour will come back. Have no fear. I promise it. If you imagine you want renewing, I have the specific. I, my love, I. Forgive me. Will you tell me, Sir Willoughby, whether you have broken with Miss Middleton? Rest satisfied, my dear Letitia. She is as free as I am. I can do no more than a man of honour should do. She releases me. Tomorrow or next day she departs. We, Letitia, you and I, my love, are home birds. It does not do for the home bird to couple with the migratory. The little imperceptible change you allude to is nothing. Italy will restore you. I am ready to stake my own health, never yet shaken by a doctor of medicine. I say medicine advisedly, for there are doctors of divinity who would shake giants. That an Italian trip will send you back. That I shall bring you home from Italy a blooming bride. You shake your head, despondently. My love, I guarantee it. Cannot I give you colour? Behold, come to the light, look in the glass. I may redden, said Letitia. I suppose that is due to the action of the heart. I am changed. Heart, for any other purpose, I have not. I am like you, Sir Willoughby, in this. I could not marry without loving, and I do not know what love is, except that it is an empty dream. Marriage, my dearest. You are mistaken. I will cure you, my Letitia. Look to me, I am the tonic. It is not common confidence, but conviction. I, my love, I. There is no cure for what I feel, Sir Willoughby. Spare me the formal prefix, I beg. You place your hand in mine, relying on me. I am pledged for the remainder. We end as we began. My request is for your hand, your hand in marriage. I cannot give it. To be my wife? It is an honour. I must decline it. Are you quite well, Letitia? I propose in the plainest terms I can employ to make you Lady Patern. Mine! I am compelled to refuse. Why? Refuse? Your reason? The reason has been named. He took a stride to inspirit his wits. There's a madness comes over women at times, I know. Answer me, Letitia, by all the evidence a man can have. I could swear it. But answer me. You loved me once. I was an exceedingly foolish romantic girl. You evade my question. I'm serious. Oh. He walked away from her, booming a sound of utter repudiation of her present imbecility, and hurrying to her side, said, But it was manifest to the whole world. It was a legend. To love like Letitia Dale was a current phrase. You were an example, a light to women. No one was your match for devotion. You were a precious cameo, still gazing. And I was the object. You loved me. You loved me. You belonged to me. You were mine. My possession, my jewel. I was prouder of your constancy than of anything else that I had on earth. It was a part of the order of the universe to me. A doubt of it would have disturbed my creed. Why, good heaven, where are we? Is nothing solid on earth? You loved me. I was childish indeed. You loved me passionately. Do you insist on shaming me through and through, Sir Willoughby? I have been exposed enough. You cannot blot out the past. It is written. It is recorded. You loved me devotely. Silence is no escape. You loved me. I did. You never loved me, you shallow woman. I did as if there could be a cessation of a love. What are we to reckon on as ours? We prize a woman's love, we guard it jealously, we trust to it, dream of it. There is our wealth, there is our talisman, and when we open the casket it has flown. Barren vacuity. We are poorer than dogs. As well think of keeping a costly wine in potter's clay, 
as love in the heart of a woman. There are women, women, oh, they are all of a stamp coin. Coin for any hand. It's a fiction, an imposture. They cannot love. They are the shadows of men. Compared with men, they have as much heart in them as a shadow beside the body. Letitia. Sir Willoughby. You refuse my offer? I must. You refuse to take me for your husband? I cannot be your wife. You have changed. You have set your heart. You could marry. There is a man. You could marry one. I will have an answer. I am sick of evasions. What was in the mind of heaven when women were created will be the riddle to the end of the world. Every good man in turn has made the inquiry. I have a right to know who robs me. We may try as we like to solve it. Satan is painted laughing. I say, I have a right to know who robs me. Answer me. I shall not marry. That is not an answer. I love no one. You loved me. You are silent. But you confessed it. Then you confess it was a love that could die. Are you unable to perceive how that redounds to my discredit? You love me. You have ceased to love me. In other words, you charge me with the incapacity to sustain a woman's love. You accuse me of inspiring a miserable passion that cannot last a lifetime. You let the world see that I am a man to be aimed at for a temporary mark, and simply because I happen to be in your neighbourhood at an age when a young woman is impressionable. You make a public example of me, as of for whom women may have caprice, but that is all. He cannot enchain them. He fascinates passingly. They fall off. Is it just for me to be taken up and cast down at your will? Reflect on that scandal. Shadows. Why, a man's shadow is faithful to him at least. What are women? There is not a comparison in nature that does not tower above them. Not one that does not hoot at them. I, throughout my life, guided by absolute deference to their weakness, paying them politeness, courtesy, whatever I touch I am happy in, except when I touch women. How is it? What is the mystery? Some monstrous explanation must exist. What can it be? I am favoured by fortune from my birth until I enter into relations with women. But will you be so good as to account for it in your defence of them? Oh, were the relations dishonourable, it would be quite another matter. Then they, I could recount. I disdain to chronicle such victories. Quite another matter. But they are flies, and I am something more stable. They are flies. I look beyond the day. I owe a duty to my line. They are flies. I foresee it. I shall be crossed in my fate so long as I fail to shun them. Flies! Not merely born for the day, I maintain that they are spiritually ephemeral. Well, my opinion of your sex is directly traceable to you. You may alter it, or fling another of us men out on the world with the old bitter experience. Consider this, that it is on your head if my ideal of women is wrecked. It rests with you to restore it. I love you. I discover that you are the one woman I have always loved. I come to you, I see you, and suddenly you have changed. I have changed, I am not the same. What can it mean? I cannot marry, I love no one. And you say you do not know what love is, avowing in the same breath that you did love me. Am I the empty dream? My hand, heart, fortune, name are yours at your feet. You kick them hence. I am here. You reject me. But why? For what mortal reason am I here other than my faith in your love? You drew me to you. To repel me and have a wretched revenge? You know it is not that, Sir Willoughby. Have you any possible suspicion that I am still entangled? Not, as I assure you I am, perfectly free in fact and in honour? It is not that. Name it, for you see your power. Would you have me kneel to you, madame? Oh, no, it would complete my grief. You feel grief? Then you believe in my affection, and you hurl it away. I have no doubt that as a poetess you would say, Love is eternal. And you have loved me, and you tell me you love me no more. You are not very logical, Letitia Dale. Poetesses really are, if I am one, which I little pretend to be for writing silly verses. I have passed out of that delusion with the rest. You shall not wrong those dear old days, Letitia. I see them now, when I rode by your cottage and you were at your window, pen in hand, 
your hair straying over your forehead. Romantic, yes, not foolish. Why were you foolish in thinking of me? Some day I will commission an artist to paint me that portrait of you from my description. And I remember when we first whispered. I remember your trembling. You have forgotten. I remember. I remember our meeting in the park on the path to church. I remember the heavenly morning of my return from my travels. And the same Laetitia meeting me, steadfast and unchangeable. Could I ever forget? Those are ineradicable scenes. Pictures of my youth, interwound with me. I may say that as I recede from them, I dwell on them the more. Tell me, Laetitia, was there not a certain prophecy of your father's concerning us two? I fancy I heard of one. There was one. He was an invalid. Elderly people nurse illusions. Ask yourself, Laetitia, who is the obstacle to this fulfilment of his prediction? Truth, if ever a truth was foreseen on earth. You have not changed so far that you would feel no pleasure in gratifying him. I go to him tomorrow morning with the first light. You will compel me to follow and undeceive him. Do so, and I denounce an unworthy affection you are ashamed to avow. That would be idle, though it would be base. Proof of love, then, for no one but you should it be done, and no one but you dare accuse me of a baseness. Sir Willoughby, you will let my father die in peace. He and I together will contrive to persuade you. You tempt me to imagine that you want a wife at any cost. You, Laetitia, you. I am tired, she said. It is late. I would rather not hear more. I am sorry if I have caused you pain. I suppose you have spoken with candour. I defend neither my sex nor myself. I can only say I am a woman as good as dead happy to be made happy in my way, but so little alive that I cannot realise any other way. As for love, I am thankful to have broken a spell. You have a younger woman in your mind. I am an old one. I have no ambition and no warmth. My utmost prayer is to float on the stream, a purely physical desire of life. I have no strength to swim. Such a woman is not the wife for you, Sir Willoughby. Good night. One final word. Weigh it. Express no conventional regrets. Resolutely, you refuse? Resolutely, I do. You refuse? Yes. I have sacrificed my pride for nothing? You refuse? Yes. Humbled myself, and this is the answer. You do refuse? I do. Good night, Letitia Dale. He gave her passage. Good night, Sir Willoughby. I am in your power, he said, in a voice between supplication and menace that laid a claw on her, and she turned and replied, You will not be betrayed. I can trust you. I go home tomorrow before breakfast. Permit me to escort you upstairs. If you please, but I see no one here either tonight or tomorrow. It is for the privilege of seeing the last of you. They withdrew. Young Crossjay listened to the drumming of his head. Somewhere in or over the cavity, a drummer rattled tremendously. Sir Willoughby's laboratory door shut with a slam. Crossjay tumbled himself off the ottoman. He stole up to the unclosed drawing-room door and peeped. Never was the boy more thoroughly awakened. His object was to get out of the house and go through the night avoiding everything human, for he was big with information of a character that he knew to be of the nature of gunpowder, and he feared to explode. He crossed the hall. In the passage to the scullery, he ran against Colonel de Cray. "'So there you are,' said the Colonel. "'I've been hunting you.' Crossjay related that his bedroom door was locked and the key gone, and Sir Willoughby sitting up in the laboratory. Colonel de Cray took the boy to his own room, where Crossjay lay on the sofa, comfortably covered over and snug in a swelling pillow. But he was restless. He wanted to speak, to bellow, to cry, and he bounced round to his left side, and bounced to his right, not knowing what to think, except that there was treason to his adored Miss Middleton. "'Why, my lad, you're not half a campaigner,' the Colonel called out to him, attributing his uneasiness to the material discomfort of the sofa, and Crossjay had to swallow the taunt, bitter though it was, a dim sentiment of impropriety in unburdening his overcharged mind on the subject of Miss Middleton to Colonel de Cray, 
restrained him from defending himself, and so he heaved and tossed about till daybreak. At an early hour, while his hospitable friend, who looked very handsome in profile half breast and head above the sheets, continued to slumber, Crossjay was on his legs and away. He says I'm not half a campaigner, and a couple of hours of bed are enough for me, the boy thought proudly, and snuffed the springing air of the young sun on the fields. A glance back at Paterne Hall dismayed him, for he knew not how to act, and he was immoderately combustible, too full of knowledge for self-containment, much too zealously excited on behalf of his dear Miss Middleton to keep silent for many hours of the day. End of chapter 40、Chapter The Reverend Dr. Middleton, Clara, and Sir Willoughby. When Master Crossjay tumbled down the stairs, Letitia was in Clara's room, speculating on the various mishaps which might have befallen that battered youngster, and Clara listened anxiously after Letitia had run out, until she heard Sir Willoughby's voice, which in some way satisfied her that the boy was not in the house. She waited, expecting Miss Dale to return. Then undressed, went to bed, tried to sleep. She was tired of strife. Strange thoughts for a young head shot through her, as that it is possible for the sense of duty to counteract distaste, and that one may live a life apart from one's admirations and dislikes. She owned the singular strength of Sir Willoughby in outwearying. She asked herself how much she had gained by struggling. Every effort seemed to expend her spirit's force, and rendered her less able to get the clear vision of her prospects, as though it had sunk her deeper. The contrary of her intention to make each further step confirm her liberty. Looking back, she marvelled at the things she had done, looking round how ineffectual they appeared. She had still the great scene of positive rebellion to go through with her father. The anticipation of that was the cause. Of her extreme discouragement, he had not spoken to her since he became aware of her attempted flight, but the scene was coming, and besides the wish not to inflict it on him, as well as to escape it herself, the girl's peculiar unhappiness lay in her knowledge that they were alienated and stood opposed, owing to one among the more perplexing masculine weaknesses, which she could not hint at, dared barely think of. And would not name in her meditations. Diverting to other subjects, she allowed herself to exclaim, "Wine, wine!" In renewed wonder of what there could be in wine to entrap venerable men and obscure their judgments. She was too young to consider that her being very much in the wrong gave all the importance to the cordial glass in a venerable gentleman's appreciation of his dues. Why should he fly from a priceless wine to gratify the caprices of a fantastical child, guilty of seeking to commit a breach of faith? He harped on those words. Her fault was grave. No doubt the wine coloured it to him as a drop or two will do in any cup. Still, her fault was grave. She was too young for such considerations. She was ready to expatiate on the gravity of her fault. So long as the humiliation assisted to her disentanglement, her snared nature in the toils would not permit her to reflect on it further. She had never accurately perceived it, for the reason perhaps that Willoughby had not been moving in his appeals, but admitting the charge of waywardness, she had come to terms with conscience, upon the understanding that she was to perceive it and regret it. And do penance for it by and by, by renouncing marriage altogether. How light a penance! In the morning she went to Letitia's room, knocked, and had no answer. She was informed at the breakfast table of Miss Dale's departure. The ladies Eleanor and Isabel 
feared it to be a case of urgency at the cottage. No one had seen Vernon, and Clara requested Colonel de Cray to walk over to the cottage for news of Crossjay. He accepted the commission, simply to obey and be in her service, assuring her, however, that there was no need to be disturbed about the boy. He would have told her more, had not Dr. Middleton led her out. Sir Willoughby marked a lapse of ten minutes by his watch. His excellent aunts had ventured a comment on his appearance that frightened him lest he himself should be the person to betray his astounding discomfiture. He regarded his conduct as an act of madness, and Letitia's as no less that of a mad woman, happily mad, very happily mad indeed. Her rejection of his ridiculously generous proposal seemed to show an intervening hand in his favor that sent her distraught at the right moment. He entirely trusted her to be discreet. But she was a miserable creature who had lost the one last chance offered her by Providence, and furnished him with a signal instance of the mediocrity of woman's love. Time was flying. In a little while Mrs. Mountstuart would arrive. He could not fence her without a design in his head. He was destitute of an armory if he had no scheme. He racked the brain only to succeed in rousing phantasmal vapors. Her infernal twice would cease now to apply to Letitia. It would be an echo of Lady Bush. Nay, were all in the secret, thrice jilted, might become the universal roar, and this, he reflected bitterly, of a man whom nothing but duty to his line had arrested from being the most mischievous of his class with women. Such is our reward for uprightness. At the expiration of fifteen minutes by his watch, he struck a knuckle on the library door. Dr. Middleton held it open to him. You're disengaged, sir. The sermon is upon the paragraph which is toned to awaken the clerk, replied the reverend doctor. Clara was weeping. Sir Willoughby drew near her solicitously. Dr. Middleton's mane of silvery hair was in a stage bearing witness to the vehemence of the sermon, and Willoughby said, I hope, sir, you have not made too much of a trifle. I believe, sir, that I have produced an effect, and that was the point in contemplation. Clara, my dear Clara, Willoughby touched her. She sincerely repents her conduct, I may inform you, said Dr. Middleton. My love, Willoughby whispered, we have had a misunderstanding. I am at a loss to discover where I have been guilty, but I take the blame, all the blame. I implore you not to weep. Do me the favor to look at me. I would not have had you subjected to any interrogation whatever. You are not to blame, Clara said on a sob. Undoubtedly Willoughby is not to blame. It was not he who was bound on a runaway errand in flagrant breach of duty and decorum, nor he who inflicted a guitar on a brother of my craft and cloth said her father. "'The clerk, sir, has pronounced amen,' observed Willoughby. "'And no man is happier to hear an ejaculation that he has laboured for with so much sweat of his brow than the parson, I can assure you,' Dr. Middleton mildly groaned. "'I have notions of the trouble of Abraham. A sermon of that description is an immolation of the parent,' however it may go with the child. Willoughby soothed his Clara. I wish I had been here to share it. I might have saved you some tears. I may have been hasty in our little dissensions. I will acknowledge that I have been. My temper is often irascible. And so is mine, exclaimed Dr. Middleton, and yet I am not aware that I made the worse husband for it nor do I rightly comprehend how a probably justly excitable temper 
can stand for a plea in mitigation of an attempt at an outrageous breach of faith. The sermon is over, sir. Reverberations, the Reverend Doctor waved his arm placably. Take it for thunder heard remote. Your hand, my love, Willoughby murmured. The hand was not put forth. Dr. Middleton remarked the fact. He walked to the window, and, perceiving the pair in the same position when he faced about, he delivered a cough of admonition. It is cruel, said Clara. That the owner of your hand should petition you for it, inquired her father. She sought refuge in a fit of tears. Willoughby bent above her mute. Is a scene that is hardly conceivable as a parent's obligation once in a lustrum to be repeated within the half hour? shouted her father. She drew up her shoulders and shook, let them fall, and dropped her head. My dearest, your hand, fluted Willoughby. The hand surrendered. It was much like an icicle of a sudden thaw. Willoughby squeezed it to his ribs. Dr. Middleton marched up and down the room with his arms locked behind him. The silence between the young people seemed to denounce his presence. He said cordially, Old Hyams has but to withdraw for buds to burst. Yam where ye galidos refert to poris. The equinoctial fury departs. I will leave you for a term. Clara and Willoughby simultaneously raised their faces with opposing expressions. My girl! Her father stood by her, laying gentle hand on her. Yes, papa, I will come out to you. She replied to his apology for the rather heavy weight of his vocabulary and smiled. No, sir, I beg you will remain, said Willoughby. I keep you frostbound. Clara did not deny it. Willoughby emphatically did. Then which of them was the more lover-like? Dr. Middleton would for the moment have supposed his daughter. Clara said, Shall you be on the lawn, papa? Willoughby interposed. Stay, sir, give us your blessing. That you have, Dr. Middleton hastily motioned the paternal ceremony in outline. A few minutes, papa, said Clara. Will she name the day? came eagerly from Willoughby. I cannot, Clara cried in extremity. The day is important on its arrival, said her father. But I apprehend the decision to be of the chief importance at present. First, prime your piece of artillery, my friend. The decision is taken, sir. Then I will be out of the way of the firing. Hit what day you please. Clara checked herself on an impetuous exclamation. It was done that her father might not be detained. Her astute self-compression sharpened Willoughby as much as it mortified and terrified him. He understood how he would stand in an instant were Dr. Middleton absent. Her father was the tribunal she dreaded, and affairs must be settled and made irrevocable while he was with them. To sting the blood of the girl, he called her his darling, and half enwound her, shadowing forth a salute. She strung her body to submit seeing her father take it as a signal for his immediate retirement. Willoughby was upon him before he reached the door. Here's out, sir. Do not go. Stay at my entreaty. I fear we have not come to a perfect reconcilement. If that is your opinion, said Clara, it is good reason for not distressing my father. Dr. Middleton, I love your daughter. I wooed her and won her. I had your consent to our union, and I was the happiest of mankind. In some way, since her coming to my house, I know not how she will not tell me or cannot, I offended. One may be innocent and offend. I have never pretended to impeccability, which is an admission that I may very naturally offend. 
My appeal to her is for an explanation or for pardon. I obtain neither. Had our positions been reversed, oh, not for any real offence, not for the worst that can be imagined, I think not, I hope not, could I have been tempted to propose the dissolution of our engagement? To love is to love with me, an engagement, a solemn bond. With all my errors I have that merit of utter fidelity, to the world laughable. I confess to a multitude of errors. I have that single merit, and am not the more estimable in your daughter's eyes on account of it, I fear. In plain words, I am, I do not doubt, one of the fools among men, of the description of human dog commonly known as faithful, whose destiny is that of a tribe, a man who cries out when he is heard is absurd, and I am not asking for sympathy. Call me luckless. But I abhor a breach of faith. A broken pledge is hateful to me. I should regard it myself as a form of suicide. There are principles which civilized men must contend for. Our social fabric is based on them. As my word stands for me, I hold others to theirs. If that is not done, the world is more or less a carnival of counterfeits. In this instance, ah, Clara, my love, and you have principles. You have inherited, you have been indoctrinated with them. Have I then, in my ignorance, offended past penitence, that you, of all women, and without being able to name my sin, not only for what I lose by it, but in the abstract, judicially, apart from the sentiment of personal interest, grief, pain, and the possibility of my having to endure that which no temptation would induce me to commit, judicially. I fear, sir, I am a poor forensic orator. The situation, sir, does not demand a Cicero. Proceed, said Dr. Middleton, balked in his approving nods at the right true things delivered. Judicially, I am bold to say, though it may appear a presumption in one suffering acutely, I abhor a breach of faith. Dr. Middleton brought his nod down low upon the phrase he had anticipated. And I, said he, personally and presently, abhor a breach of faith. Judicially, judicially to examine, judicially to condemn. But does the judicial mind detest? I think, sir, we are not on the bench when we say that we abhor. We have unseated ourselves. Yet our abhorrence of bad conduct is very certain. You would signify impersonally, which suffices for this exposition of your feelings. He peered at the gentleman under his brows and resumed. She has had it, Willoughby. She has had it in plain Saxon and in uncompromising Olympian. There is, I conceive, no necessity to revert to it. Pardon me, sir, but I am still unforgiven. You must babble out the rest between you. I am about as much at home as a turkey with a pair of pigeons. Leave us, father, said Clara. First, join our hands, and let me give you that title, sir. Reach the good man your hand, Clara, forthright, from the shoulder, like a brave boxer. Humor a lover, he asks for his own. It is more than I can do, father. How? It is more than you could do? You are engaged to him, a plighted woman. I do not wish to marry. The apology is inadequate. I am unworthy. Chatter, chatter. I beg him to release me. Lunacy. I have no love to give him. Have you gone back to your cradle, Clara Middleton? Oh, leave us, dear father. My offense, Clara, my offense. What is it? Will you only name it? Father, will you leave us? We can better speak together. We have spoken, Clara. How often will be resumed? With what result? That you loved me, that you have ceased to love me, that your heart is mine, that you have withdrawn it, plucked it from me, that you request me to consent to a sacrifice involving my reputation, my life. And what have I done? I am the same unchangeable. 
I loved and love you. My heart was yours and is and will be yours forever. You are my affianced. That is my wife. What have I done? It is indeed useless, Clara sighed. Not useless, my girl, that you should inform this gentleman, your affianced husband, of the ground of the objection you conceived against him. I cannot say. Do you know? If I could name it, I could hope to overcome it. Dr. Middleton addressed Sir Willoughby. I verily believe we are directing the girl to dissect a caprice. Such things are seen large by these young people, but as they have neither organs, nor arteries, nor brains, nor membranes, dissection and inspection will be alike profitlessly practiced. Your inquiry is natural for a lover, whose passion to enter into relations with the sex is ordinarily in proportion to his ignorance of the stuff composing them. At a particular age they traffic in whims, which are, I presume, the spiritual of hysterics, and are indubitably preferable so long as they are not pushed too far. Examples are not wanting to prove that a flighty initiative on the part of the male is a handsome corrective. In that case, we should probably have had the roof off the house, and the girl now at your feet. Ha! Despise me, father. I am punished for ever thinking myself the superior of any woman, said Clara. Your hand out to him, my dear, since he is for a formal reconciliation, and I can't wonder. Father, I have said I do not, I have said I cannot, by the most merciful. What? What? The name for it, words for it. Do not frown on me, father. I wish him happiness. I cannot marry him. I do not love him. You will remember that you informed me aforetime that you did love him. I was ignorant. I did not know myself. I wish him to be happy. You deny him the happiness you wish him. It would not be for his happiness were I to wed him. Oh, burst from Willoughby. You hear him. He rejects your prediction, Clara Middleton. She caught her clasped hands up to her throat. Wretched, wretched, both. And you have not a word against him, miserable girl. Miserable, I am. It is the cry of an animal. Yes, father. You feel like one? Your behavior is of that shape. You have not a word? Against myself, not against him. And I, when you speak so generously, am to yield you? Give you up? cried Willoughby. Ah, my love, my Clara, impose what you will on me. Not that. It is too much for a man. It is, I swear it, beyond my strength. Pursue, continue the strain, tis in the right key, said Dr. Middleton, departing. Willoughby wheeled and waylaid him with a bound. Plead for me, sir, you are all-powerful. Let her be mine. She shall be happy, or I will perish for it. I will call it on my head. Impossible. I cannot lose her. Lose you, my love. It would be to strip myself of every blessing of body and soul. It would be to deny myself possession of grace, beauty, wit, all the incomparable charms of loveliness of mind and person and woman and plant myself in a desert. You are my mate, the sum of everything I call mine. Clara, I should be less than man to submit to such a loss. Consent to it? But I love you. I worship you. How can I consent to lose you? He saw the eyes of the desperately wily young woman slink sideways. Dr. Middleton was pacing at ever shorter lengths, closer by the door. "'You hate me?' Willoughby sunk his voice. "'If it should turn to hate,' she murmured, "'hatred of your husband?' "'I could not promise,' she murmured, more softly in her wiliness. "'Hatred!' he cried aloud. And Dr. Middleton stopped in his walk and flung up his head. 
hatred of your husband, of the man you have vowed to love and honor? Oh, no. Once mine, it is not to be feared. I trust to my knowledge of your nature. I trust in your blood. I trust in your education. Had I nothing else to inspire confidence, I could trust in your eyes. And, Clara, take the confession. I would rather be hated than lose you. For if I lose you, you are in another world, out of this one holding me in its death-like cold. But if you hate me, we are together. We are still together. Any alliance, any in preference to separation. Clara listened with critical ear. His language and tone were new, and comprehending that they were in part addressed to her father, whose phrase, a breach of faith, he had so cunningly used, disdain of the actor prompted the extreme blunder of her saying, frigidly though she said it, you have not talked to me in this way before. Finally, remarked her father, summing up the situation to settle it from that little speech. He talks to you in this way now, and you are under my injunction to stretch your hand out to him for a symbol of union, or to state your objection to that course. He, by your admission, is at the terminus, and there, failing the why not, must you join him. Her head whirled. She had been severely flagellated and weak and previous to Libby's entrance. Language to express her peculiar repulsion eluded her. She formed the words and perceived that they would not stand to bear a breath from her father. She perceived, too, that Willoughby was as ready with his agony of supplication as she with hers. If she had tears for a resource, he had gestures quite as eloquent and a cry of her loathing of the union would fetch a countervailing torrent of the man's love. What could she say? He is an egoist? The epithet has no meaning in such a scene. Invent, shrieked the hundred-voiced instinct of dislike within her, and alone with her father, alone with Willoughby, she could have invented some equivalent to do her heart justice for the injury it sustained in her being unable to name the true and immense objection but the pair in presence paralyzed her. She dramatized them, each springing forward by turns with crushing rejoinders. The activity of her mind reveled in giving them a tongue, but would not do it for herself. Then ensued the inevitable consequence of an incapacity to speak at the heart's urgent dictate. Heart and mind became divided. One throbbed hotly, the other hung aloof and mentally, while the sick, inarticulate heart kept clamoring, she answered it with all that she imagined for those two men to say, and she dropped poison on it to still its reproaches, bidding herself remember her fatal postponements in order to preserve the seeming of consistency before her father, calling it hypocrite, asking herself what was she, who loved her, and thus beating down her heart, she completed the mischief with a piercing view of the foundation of her father's advocacy of Willoughby, and more lamentably asked herself what her value was, if she stood bereft of respect for her father. Reason, on the other hand, was animated by her better nature to plead his case against her. She clung to her respect for him, and felt herself drowning with it. And she echoed Willoughby consciously, doubling her horror with the consciousness, in crying out on a world where the most sacred feelings are subject to such lapses. It doubled her horror that she should echo the man, but it proved that she was no better than he, only some years younger. Those years would soon be outlived, after which he and she would be of a pattern. She was unloved. She did no harm to anyone by keeping her word to this man. She had pledged it, and it would be a breach of faith not to keep it. No one loved her. Behold the quality of her father's love. To give him happiness was now the principal aim for her, her own happiness being decently buried. And here he was happy. Why should she be the cause of his going and losing the poor pleasure he so much enjoyed? The idea of her devotedness flattered her feebleness. She betrayed signs of hesitation. 
and in hesitating she looked away from a look at willoughby thinking so much against her nature was it to resign herself to him that it would not have been so difficult with an ill-favoured man with one horribly ugly it would have been a horrible exultation to cast off her youth and take the fiendish leap unfortunately for sir willoughby he had his reasons for pressing impatience and seeing her deliberate seeing her hasty look at his fine figure his opinion of himself combined with his recollection of a particular maxim of the great book to assure him that her resistance was over chiefly owing as he supposed to his physical perfections frequently indeed in the contest between gentlemen and ladies have the maxims of the book stimulated the assailant to victory they are rosy with blood of victims to bear them is to hear a horn that blows the mort has blown it a thousand times it is good to remember how often they have succeeded when for the benefit of some future lady valvin who may bestir her wits to gather maxims for the inspiriting of the defence the circumstance of a failure has to be recorded willoughby could not wait for the melting of the snows he saw full surely the dissolving process and sincerely admiring and coveting her as he did rashly this ill-fated gentleman attempted to precipitate it and so doing arrested whence might we draw a note from yonder maxim in words akin to these make certain ere a breath come from thee that thou be not a frost mine she's mine he cried mine once more mine utterly mine eternally and he followed up his devouring exclamations in person as she less decidedly retreated she retreated as young ladies should ever do two or three steps and he would not notice that she had become an angry diane all arrows her maidenliness in surrendering pleased him grasping one fair hand he just allowed her to edge on the outer circle of his embrace crying not a syllable of what i have gone through you shall not have to explain it my clara i will study you more diligently to be guided by you my darling if i offend again my wife will not find it hard to speak what my bride withheld i do not ask why perhaps not able to weigh the effect of her reticence not at that time when she was younger and less experienced estimating the sacredness of a plighted engagement it's past we are one my dear sir and father you may leave us now i profoundly rejoice to hear that i may said dr middleton clara writhed her captured hand no papa stay it's an error an error you must not leave me do not think me utterly eternally belonging to any one but you no one shall say i am his but you are you quicksands clara middleton that nothing can be built on you whither is a flighty head and a shifty will carrying this girl clara and i sir said willoughby and so you shall said the doctor turning about not yet papa clara sprang to him why you 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 it was you who craved to be alone with willoughby her father shouted and here we are rounded to our starting point with the solitary difference that now you do not want to be alone with willoughby first i'm bidden go next i'm pulled back and judging by collar and coat tag i suspect you to be a young woman to wear an angel's temper threadbare before you determine upon which one of the tides driving him to and fro you intend to launch on yourself where is your mind clara smoothed her forehead i wish to please you papa i request you to please the gentleman who is your appointed husband i am anxious to perform my duty that should be a satisfactory basis for you willoughby as girls go let me sir simply entreat to have her hand in mine before you why not clara Oh, why an empty ceremony papa the implication is that she is prepared for the important one fred willoughby her hand sir the reassurance of her hand in mine under your eyes after all that i have suffered i claim it 
I think I claim it reasonably to restore me to confidence. Quite reasonably, which is not to say necessarily. But I will add justifiably, and it may be sagaciously when dealing with the volatile. And here, said Willoughby, is my hand. Clara recoiled. He stepped on. Her father frowned. She lifted both her hands from the shrinking elbows, darted a look of repulsion at her pursuer, and ran to her father, crying, "'Call it my mood! I'm volatile, capricious, flighty, very foolish. But you see that I attach a real meaning to it and feel it to be binding. I cannot think it an empty ceremony if it is before you. Yes, only be a little considerate to your moody girl. She will be in a fitter state in a few hours. Spare me this moment. I must collect myself. I thought I was free. I thought he would not press me. If I give my hand hurriedly now, I shall, I know, immediately repent it. There is the picture of me. But, Papa, I mean to try to be above that, and if I go and walk by myself, I shall grow calm to perceive where my duty lies. In which direction shall you walk? said Willoughby. Wisdom is not upon a particular road, said Dr. Middleton. I have a dread, sir, of that one which leads to the railway station. With some justice, Dr. Middleton sighed over his daughter. Clara colored to deep crimson. But she was beyond anger and was rather gratified by an offense coming from Willoughby. I will promise not to leave his grounds, papa. My child, you have threatened to be a breaker of promises. Oh, she wailed. But I will make it a vow to you. Why not make a vow to me this moment for this gentleman's contentment that he shall be your husband within a given period? I will come to you voluntarily. I burn to be alone. I shall lose her, exclaimed Willoughby in heartfelt earnest. How so, said Dr. Middleton. I have her, sir, if you will favour me by continuing in abeyance. You will come within an hour voluntarily, Clara, and you will either at once yield your hand to him, or you will furnish reasons, and they must be good ones for withholding it. Yes, papa. You will? I will. Mind I say reasons. Reasons, papa. If I have none... If you have none that are to my satisfaction, you implicitly and instantly and cordially obey my command. I will obey. What more would you require? Dr. Middleton bowed to Sir Willoughby in triumph. Will she... Sir, sir. She is your daughter, sir. I am satisfied. She has perchance wrestled with her engagement as the aboriginals of a land newly discovered by a crew of adventurous colonists do battle with the garments imposed on them by our considerate civilization. Ultimately, to rejoice with excessive dignity in the wearing of a battered cocked hat and trousers not extending to the shanks. But she did not break her engagement, sir. And we will anticipate that, moderating a young woman's native wildness, she may, after the manner of my comparison, take a similar pride in her fortune in good season. Willoughby had not leisure to sound the depth of Dr. Middleton's compliment. He had seen Clara gliding out of the room during the delivery, and his fear returned on him that, not being won, she was lost. She has gone. Her father noticed her absence. She does not waste time in her mission to procure that astonishing product of a shallow soil, her reasons, if such be the object of her search. But, no, it signifies that she deems herself to have need of a composure nothing more no one likes to be turned about we like to turn ourselves about and in the question of an act to be committed we stipulate that it shall be our act girls and others after the lapse of an hour it will appear to her as her act happily will it be we do not dine away from pattern to-night no sir it may be attributable to a sense of deserving but I could plead guilty to a weakness for our old port to-day. There shall be an extra bottle, sir. All going favorably with you, as I have no cause to doubt, said Dr. Middleton, with the motion of wafting his host 
out of the library. End of chapter 41. Recording by Linda Woods, Maitland, Florida. Chapter 42 of The Egoist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Woods. The Egoist by George Meredith. Chapter 42. Shows the divining arts of a perceptive mind. Starting from the hall a few minutes before Dr. Middleton and Sir Willoughby had entered the drawing-room overnight, Vernon parted company with Colonel de Cray at the park gates, and betook himself to the cottage of the Dales, where nothing had been heard of his wanderer, and he received the same disappointing reply from Dr. Corney out of the bedroom window of the genial physician, whose astonishment at his covering so long a stretch of road at night for news of a boy like Crossjay, gifted with the lives of a cat, became violent and rapped punch-like blows on the window-sill at Vernon's refusal to take shelter and rest. Vernon's excuse was that he had no one but that fellow to care for, and he strode off, naming a farm five miles distant. Dr. Corney howled an invitation to early breakfast to him, in the event of his passing on his way back, and retired to bed to think of him. The result of a variety of conjectures caused him to set Vernon down as Miss Middleton's knight, and he felt a strong compassion for his poor friend. Though, thought he, a hopeless attachment is as pretty an accompaniment to the tune of life as a gentleman might wish to have, for it's one of those big doses of discord which make all the minor ones fit in like an agreeable harmony, and so he shuffles along as pleasantly as the fortune favored when they come to compute. Sir Willoughby was the fortune favorite in the little doctor's mind. That high-stepping gentleman having wealth and public consideration, and the most ravishing young lady in the world for a bride. Still, though he reckoned all these advantages enjoyed by Sir Willoughby at their full value, he could imagine the ultimate balance of good fortune to be in favor of Vernon. But to do so, he had to reduce the whole calculation to the extreme abstract, and feed his lean friend, as it were, on dew and roots. And the happy effect for Vernon lay in a distant future, on the borders of old age, where he was to be blessed with his lady's regretful preference, and rejoice in the fruits of good constitutional habits. The reviewing mind was Irish. Sir Willoughby was a character of man profoundly opposed to Dr. Corney's nature. The latter's instincts bristled with antagonism. Not to his race, for Vernon was of the same race, partly of the same blood. And Corney loved him. The type of person was the annoyance. And the circumstance of its prevailing successfulness in the country where he was placed, while it held him silent as if under a law, heaped stores of insurgency in the Celtic bosom. Corney, contemplating Sir Willoughby, and a trotting kern governed by Strongbow, have a point of likeness between them, with the point of difference that Corney was enlightened to know of a friend better adapted for eminent station, and especially better adapted to please a lovely lady. Could these high-bred Englishwomen be taught to conceive another idea of manliness than the formal carved-in-wood idol of their national worship. Dr. Corney breakfasted very early, without seeing Vernon. He was off to a patient while the first lark of the morning caroled above, and the business of the day, not yet fallen upon men in the shape of cloud, was happily intermixed with nature's hues and pipings. Turning off the high road tip a green lane an hour later, he beheld a youngster prying into a hedge head and arms, by the peculiar strenuous twist of those hinder parts, indicative of a frame plunged on the pursuit in hand, he clearly distinguished young Crossjay. Out came eggs. The doctor pulled up. What bird, he bellowed. Yellowhammer, Crossjay yelled back. 
Now, sir, you'll drop a couple of those eggs in the nest. Don't order me, Crossjay was retorting. Oh, it's you, Dr. Corney. Good morning. I said that because I always do drop a couple back. I promised Mr. Whitford I would, and Miss Middleton, too. Had breakfast? Not yet. Not hungry? I should be if I thought about it. Jump up. I think I'd rather not, Dr. Corney. And you'll just do what Dr. Corney tells you, and set your mind on rashers of curly fat bacon and sweetly smoking coffee, toast, hot cakes, marmalade, and damson jam. Wide go the fellow's nostrils, and there's water at the dimples of his mouth. Up, my man! Cross Jade jumped up beside the doctor, who remarked as he touched his horse, I don't want a man this morning, though I'll enlist you in my service if I do. You're fond of Miss Middleton. Instead of answering, Crossjay heaved the sigh of love that bears a burden. And so am I, pursued the doctor. You'll have to put up with a rival. It's worse than fond. I'm in love with her. How do you like that? I don't mind how many love her, said Crossjay. You're worthy of a gratuitous breakfast in the front parlor of the best hotel of the place they call Arcadia. And how about your bed last night? Pretty middling. Hard, was it, where the bones I haven't cushioned? I don't care for bed. A couple of hours and that's enough for me. But you're fond of Miss Middleton, anyhow, and that's a virtue. To his great surprise, Dr. Corney beheld two big round tears force their way out of this tough youngster's eyes, and all the while the boy's face was proud. Crossjay said, when he could trust himself to disjoin his lips, I want to see Mr. Whitford. Have you got news for him? I have something to ask him. It's about what I ought to do. Then, my boy, you have the right name addressed in the wrong direction. For I found you turning your shoulders on Mr. Whitford. And he has been out of his bed hunting you all the unholy night you've made it for him. That's melancholy. What do you say to asking my advice? Crossjay sighed. I can't speak to anybody but Mr. Whitford. And you're hot to speak to him? I want to. And I found you running away from him. You're a curiosity, Mr. Crossjay Pattern. Ha! So would anybody be who knew as much as I do, said Crossjay, with a sober sadness that caused the doctor to treat him seriously. The fact is, he said, Mr. Whitford is beating the country for you. My best plan will be to drive you to the hall. I'd rather not go to the hall, Crossjay spoke resolutely. You won't see Miss Middleton anywhere but at the hall. I don't want to see Miss Middleton if I can't be a bit of use to her. No danger threatening the lady, is there? Crossjay treated the question as if it had not been put. Now tell me, said Dr. Corney, would there be a chance for me, supposing Miss Middleton were disengaged? The answer was easy. I'm sure she wouldn't. And why, sir, are you so cocksure? There was no saying, but the doctor pressed for it, and at last Crossjay gave his opinion that she would take Mr. Whitford. The doctor asked why, and Crossjay said it was because Mr. Whitford was the best man in the world. To which, with a lusty amen to that, Dr. Corney remarked, I should have fancied Colonel de Cray would have had the first chance. He's more of a lady's man. Crossjay surprised him again by petulantly saying, Don't. The boy added, I don't want to talk except about birds and things. What a jolly morning it is. I saw the sunrise. No rain today. You're right about being hungry, Dr. Corney. The kindly little man swung his whip. Crossjay informed him of his disgrace at the hall and of every incident connected with it, from the tramp to the baronet, save Miss Middleton's adventure and the night seen in the drawing-room. A strong smell of something left out struck Dr. Corney, and he said, You'll not let Miss Middleton know of my affection. After all, it's only a little bit of love. But as Patrick said to Kathleen, when she owned to such a little bit, that's the best bit of all. And he was as right as 
I am about hungry. Crossjay scorned to talk of loving, he declared. I never tell Miss Middleton what I feel. Why, there's Miss Dale's cottage. It's nearer to your empty inside than my mansion, said the doctor, and we'll stop just to inquire whether a bed's to be had for you there tonight, and if not, I'll have you with me, and bottle you, and exhibit you, for you're a rare specimen. Breakfast you may count on from Mr. Dale. I spy a gentleman. It's Colonel de Cray. Come after news of you. I wonder. Miss Middleton sends him. Of course she does. Crossjay turned his full face to the doctor. I haven't seen her for such a long time, but he saw me last night, and he might have told her that, if she's anxious. Good morning, Colonel. I've had a good walk and a capital drive, and I'm as hungry as the boat's crew of Captain Bly. He jumped down. The Colonel and the doctor saluted, smiling. I've rung the bell, said de Cray. A maid came to the gate, and upon her steps appeared Miss Dale, who flung herself at Crossjay, mingling kisses and reproaches. She scarcely raised her face to the colonel more than to reply to his greeting, and excuse the hungry boy for hurrying indoors to breakfast. I'll wait, said de Cray. He had seen that she was paler than usual. So had Dr. Corney. And the doctor called to her concerning her father's health. She reported that he had not yet risen and took Crossjay to herself. That's well, said the doctor, if the invalid sleeps long. The lady is not looking so well, though. But ladies vary. They show the mind on the countenance, for want of the punching we meet with to conceal it. They're like military flags for a funeral or a gala, one day furled and the next day streaming. Men are ship's figureheads, about the same for a storm or a calm, and not too handsome, thanks to the ocean. It's an age since we encountered last, Colonel, on board the Dublin boat, I recollect, and a night it was. I recollect that you set me on my legs, doctor. Ah, and you'll please to notify that Corney's no quack at sea, by favor of the monks of the Chartreuse, whose elixir has power to still the waves, and we hear that miracles are done with. Roll a physician and a monk together, doctor. True, it'll be a miracle if they combine, though the cure of the soul is often the entire and total cure of the body and it's maliciously said that the body given over to our treatment is a signal to set the soul flying. By the way, Colonel, that boy has a trifle on his mind. I suppose he has been worrying a farmer or a gamekeeper. Try him. You'll find him tight. He's got Miss Middleton on the brain. There's a bit of a secret, and he's not so cheerful about it. We'll see, said the Colonel. Dr. Corney nodded. I have to visit my patient here presently. I'm too early for him, so I'll make a call or two on the lame birds that are up, he remarked and drove away. De Cray strolled through the garden. He was a gentleman of those actively perceptive wits which, if ever they reflect, do so by hops and jumps, upon some dancing mirror within, we may fancy. He penetrated a plot in a flash, and in a flash he formed one. But in both cases it was after long hovering and not over-eager deliberation, by the patient exercise of his quick perceptives. The fact that Crossjay was considered to have Miss Middleton on the brain, threw a series of images of everything relating to Crossjay for the last forty hours into a relief before him, and as he did not in the slightest degree speculate on any one of them, but merely shifted and surveyed them, the falcon that he was in spirit as well as in his handsome face leisurely allowed his instinct to direct him where to strike. A reflective disposition has this danger in action, that it commonly precipitates conjecture for the purpose of working upon probabilities with the methods and in the tracks to which it is accustomed. And to conjecture rashly is to play into the puzzles of the maze. He who can watch encircling above it a while, quietly viewing and collecting in his eye, gathers matter that makes the secret thing discourse to the brain by weight and balance. He will get either the right clue or none, more frequently none, but he will escape the entanglement of his own cleverness. He will always be nearer to the enigma than the guesser or the calculator, 
and he will retain a breadth of vision forfeited by them. He must, however, to have his chance of success, be acutely besides calmly perceptive, a reader of features, audacious at the proper moment. De Cray wished to look at Miss Dale. She returned home very suddenly, not, as it appeared, owing to her father's illness, and he remembered a redness of her eyelids when he passed her on the corridor one night. She sent Crossjay out to him as soon as the boy was well filled. He sent Crossjay back with a request. She did not yield to it immediately. She stepped to the front door reluctantly and seemed disconcerted. De Cray begged for a message to Miss Middleton. There was none to give. He persisted. But there was really none at present, she said. You won't entrust me with the smallest word, said he and set her visibly thinking whether she could dispatch a word. She could not. She had no heart for messages. I shall see her in a day or two, Colonel de Cray. She will miss you severely. We shall soon meet. And poor Willoughby! Letitia colored and stood silent. A butterfly of some rarity allured Crossjay. I fear he has been doing mischief, she said. I cannot get him to look at me. His appetite is good, very good indeed. De Cray nodded. A boy with a noble appetite is never a hopeless lock. The colonel and Crossjay lounged over the garden. And now, said the colonel, we'll see if we can't arrange a meeting between you and Miss Middleton. You're a lucky fellow, for she's always thinking of you. I know I'm always thinking of her, said Crossjay. If ever you're in a scrape, she's the person you must go to. Yes, if I know where she is. Why, generally, she'll be at the hall. There was no reply. Crossjay's dreadful secret jumped to his throat. He certainly was a weaker lock for being full of breakfast. I want to see Mr. Whitford so much, he said. Something to tell him? I don't know what to do. I don't understand it. The secret wriggled to his mouth. He swallowed it down. Yes, I want to talk to Mr. Whitford. He's another of Miss Middleton's friends. I know he is. He's true steel. We are all her friends, Crossjay. I flatter myself I'm a Toledo when I'm wanted. How long have you been in the house last night before you ran into me? I don't know, sir. I fell asleep for some time and then I woke. Where did you find yourself? I was in the drawing room. Come, Crossjay, you're not a fellow to be scared by ghosts. You looked it when you made a dash at my midriff. I don't believe there are such things. Do you, Colonel? You can't. There's no saying. We'll hope not. For it wouldn't be fair fighting. A man with a ghost to back him had beat any ten. We couldn't box him or play cards or stand a chance with him as a rival in love. Did you now catch a sight of a ghost? They weren't ghosts, Crossjay said what he was sure of, and his voice pronounced his conviction. I doubt whether Miss Middleton is particularly happy, remarked the colonel. Why? Why, you upset her, you know, now and then. The boy swelled. I'd do. I'd go. I wouldn't have her unhappy. It's, it's that, that's it. And I don't know what I ought to do. I wish I could see Mr. Whitford. You get into such headlong scrapes, my lad. I wasn't in any scrape yesterday. So you made yourself up a comfortable bed in the drawing room? Luckily, Sir Willoughby didn't see you. He didn't, though. A close shave, was it? I was under a covering of something silk. He woke you? I suppose he did. I heard him. Talking? He was talking. What? Talking to himself? No! The secret threatened Crossjay to be out or suffocate him. De Cray gave him a respite. You like Sir Willoughby, don't you? Crossjay produced a stillborn affirmative. He's kind to you, said the colonel. He'll set you up and look after your interests. Yes, I like him, said Crossjay, with his customary rapidity in touching the subject. I like him. He's kind and all that and tips and plays with you and all that. But I never can make out why he wouldn't see my father when my father came here to see him ten miles, 
and had to walk back ten miles in the rain, to go by rail a long way, down home, as far as Devonport, because Sir Willoughby wouldn't see him, though he was at home my father saw. We all thought it so odd, and my father wouldn't let us talk much about it. My father's a very brave man. Captain Pattern is as brave a man as ever lived, said de Cray. I'm positive you'd like him, Colonel. I know of his deeds, and I admire him, and that's a good step to liking. He warmed the boy's thoughts of his father. Because what they say at home is a little bread and cheese, and a glass of ale, and a rest to a poor man, lots of great houses will give you that, and we wouldn't have asked for more than that. My sisters say they think Sir Willoughby must be selfish. He's awfully proud. And perhaps it was because my father wasn't dressed well enough. But what can we do? We're very poor at home, and lots of us, and all hungry. My father says he isn't paid very well for his services to the government. He's only a marine. He's a hero, said de Cray. He came home very tired, with a cold, and had a doctor. But Sir Willoughby did send him money, and mother wished to send it back. And my father said she was not like a woman, with our big family. He said he thought Sir Willoughby an extraordinary man. Not at all. Very common. Indigenous, said de Cray. The art of cutting is one of the branches of a polite education in this country, and you'll have to learn it if you expect to be looked on as a gentleman and a pattern, my boy. I begin to see how it is Miss Middleton takes to you so. Follow her directions. But I hope you did not listen to a private conversation. Miss Middleton would not approve of that. Colonel de Cray, how could I help myself? I heard a lot before I knew what it was. There was poetry. Still, Crossjay, if it was important, was it? Boy swelled again, and the colonel asked him, Does Miss Dale know of your having played listener? She, said Crossjay, oh, I couldn't tell her. He breathed thick, then came a threat of tears. She wouldn't do anything to hurt Miss Middleton. I'm sure of that. It wasn't her fault. She... There goes Mr. Whitford! Crossjay bounded away. The colonel had no inclination to wait for his return. He walked fast up the road, not perspicuously conscious that his motive was to be well in advance of Vernon Whitford, to whom, after all, the knowledge imparted by Crossjay would be of small advantage. That fellow would probably trot off to Willoughby to row him for breaking his word to Miss Middleton. There are men, thought de Cray, who see nothing, feel nothing. He crossed a stile into the wood above the lake, where, as he was in the humor to think himself signally lucky, espying her, he took it as a matter of course that the lady who taught his heart to leap should be posted by the fates and he wondered little at her power, for rarely had the world seen such union of princess and sylph as in that lady's figure. She stood holding by a beech branch, gazing down on the water. She had not heard him. When she looked, she flushed at the spectacle of one of her thousand thoughts, but she was not startled. The color overflowed a grave face. "'And tis not quite the first time that Willoughby has played this trick, De Cray said to her, keenly smiling with a parted mouth. Clara moved her lips to recall remarks introductory to so abrupt and strange a plunge. He smiled in that peculiar manner of an illuminated comic perception. For the moment he was all falcon, and he surprised himself more than Clara, who was not in the mood to take surprises. It was the sight of her which had animated him to strike his game. He was down on it. Another instinct at work, they spring up in twenties oftener than in twos when the heart is the hunter, prompted him to directness and quickness, to carry her on the flood of the discovery. She regained something of her mental self-possession as soon as she was on a level with a meaning she had not yet inspected, but she had to submit to his lead, distinctly perceiving where its drift divided to the forked currents of what might be in his mind and what was in hers. Miss Middleton, I bear a bit of a likeness to the messenger to the glorious despot. My head is off if I speak not true. Everything I have is on the die. Did I guess wrong your wish? 
I read it in the dark by the heart. But here's a certainty. Willoughby set you free. You have come from him? She could imagine nothing else, and she was unable to preserve a disguise. She trembled. From Miss Dale. Ah! Clara drooped. She told me that once. Tis the fact that tells it now. You have not seen him since you left the house? Darkly, clear enough, not unlike the hand of destiny through a veil. He offered himself to Miss Dale last night, about between the witching hours of twelve and one. Miss Dale. Would she other? Could she? The poor lady is languished beyond a decade. She's love in the feminine person. Are you speaking seriously, Colonel de Croix? Would I dare to trifle with you, Miss Middleton? I have reason to know it cannot be. If I have a head, it is a fresh and blooming truth, and more, I stake my vanity on it. Let me go to her. She stepped. Consider, said he. Miss Dale and I are excellent friends. It would not seem indelicate to her. She has a kind of regard for me through Crossjay. Oh, can it be? There must be some delusion. You have seen... You wish to be of service to me. You may too easily be deceived. Last night? He last night? And this morning? Tis not the first time our friend has played the trick, Miss Middleton. But this is incredible, that last night, and this morning, in my father's presence, he presses. You have seen Miss Dale? Everything is possible of him. They were together, I know. Colonel de Cray, I have not the slightest chance of concealment with you. I think I felt that when I first saw you. Will you let me hear why you are so certain? Miss Middleton, when I first had the honor of looking on you, it was in a posture that necessitated my looking up, and morally so it has been since. I conceived that Willoughby had won the greatest prize of earth, and next I was led to the conclusion that he had won it to lose it. Whether he much cares is the mystery I haven't leisure to fathom. Himself is the principal consideration with himself, and ever was. You discovered it, said Clara. He uncovered it, said de Cray. The miracle was that the world wouldn't see. But the world is a piggy-wiggy world for the wealthy fellow who fills a trough for it, and that he has always very sagaciously done. Only women besides myself have detected him. I have never exposed him. I have been an observer, pure and simple." And because I apprehended another catastrophe, making something like the fourth, to my knowledge, one being public, you knew Miss Durham? And Harry Oxford, too. And there a pair as happy as blackbirds in a cherry tree, in a summer sunrise, with the owner of the garden asleep. Because of that apprehension of mine, I refused the office of best man till Willoughby had sent me a third letter. He insisted on my coming. I came, saw and was conquered. I trust with all my soul I did not betray myself. I owed that duty to my position of concealing it. As for entirely hiding that I had used my eyes, I can't say. They must answer for it. The colonel was using his eyes with an increasing suavity that threatened more than sweetness. I believe you have been sincerely kind, said Clara. We will descend to the path round the lake. She did not refuse her hand on the descent, and he let it escape the moment the service was done. As he was performing the admiral character of the man of honor, he had to attend to the observance of details. And sure of her, though he was beginning to feel, there was a touch of the unknown in Clara Middleton which made him fear to stamp assurance, despite a barely resistible impulse coming of his emotions and approved by his maxims. He looked at the hand, now a free lady's hand. Willoughby settled. His chance was great. Who else was in the way? No one. He counseled himself to wait for her. She might have ideas of delicacy. Her face was troubled, speculative. The brows clouded, the lips compressed. You have not heard this from Miss Dale, she said. Last night they were together. This morning she fled. I saw her this morning distressed. She is unwilling to send you a message. She talks vaguely of meeting you some days hence, and it is not the first time he has gone to her for his consolation. That is not a proposal, Clara reflected. He is too prudent. 
he did not propose to her at the time you mention. Have you not been hasty, Colonel de Kai? Shadows crossed her forehead. She glanced in the direction of the house and stopped her walk. Last night, Miss Middleton, there was a listener. Who? Crossjay was under that pretty silk coverlet worked by the Miss Patterns. He came home late, found his door locked, and dashed downstairs into the drawing-room, where he snuggled up and dropped asleep. The two speakers woke him. They frightened the poor dear lad in his love for you, and after they had gone he wanted to run out of the house, and I met him just after I had come back from my search, bursting, and took him to my room, and laid him on the sofa, and abused him for not lying quiet. He was restless as a fish on a bank. When I woke in the morning he was off. Dr. Corney came across him somewhere on the road and drove him to the cottage. I was ringing the bell. Corney told me the boy had you on his brain and was miserable, so Crossjay and I had a talk. Crossjay did not repeat to you the conversation he had heard, said Clara. No. She smiled rejoicingly, proud of the boy as she walked on. But you'll pardon me, Miss Middleton, and I'm for him as much as you are, if I was guilty of a little angling. My sympathies are with the fish. The poor fellow had a secret that hurt him. It rose to the surface, crying to be hooked, and I spared him twice or thrice, because he had a sort of holy sentiment I respected, that none but Mr. Whitford ought to be his father confessor. Crossjay, she cried, hugging her love of the boy. The secret was one not to be communicated to Miss Dale, of all people. He said that? As good as the very words. She informed me, too, that she couldn't induce him to face her straight. Oh, that looks like it. And Crossjay was unhappy? Very unhappy? He was just where tears are on the brim, and would have been over, if he were not such a manly youngster. It looks... She reverted in thought to Willoughby, and doubted, and blindly stretched hands to her recollection of the strange old monster she had discovered in him. Such a man could do anything. That conclusion fortified her to pursue her walk to the house and give battle for freedom. Willoughby appeared to her scarce human, unreadable, save by the key that she could supply. She determined to put faith in Colonel de Cray's marvellous divination of circumstances in the dark. Marvels are solid weapons when we are attacked by real prodigies of nature. Her countenance cleared. She conversed with de Cray of the polite and the political world, throwing off her personal burden completely and charming him. At the edge of the garden on the bridge that crossed the ha-ha from the park, he had a second impulse, almost a warning within, to seize his heavenly opportunity to ask for thanks and move her tender, lowered eyelids to hint at his reward. He repressed it, doubtful of the wisdom. Something like, Heaven forgive me, was in Clara's mind, though she would have declared herself innocent before the scrutator. End of chapter 42 Recording by Linda Woods, Maitland, Florida Chapter 43 of The Egoist This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Woods The Egoist by George Meredith Chapter 43 In which Sir Willoughby is led to think that the elements have conspired against him. Clara had not taken many steps in the garden before she learned how great was her debt of gratitude to Colonel de Craye. Willoughby and her father were awaiting her. De Craye, with his ready comprehension of circumstances, turned aside unseen among the shrubs. She advanced slowly. The vapors we may trust have dispersed, her father hailed her. "'One word, and these discussions are over. "'We dislike them equally,' said Willoughby. "'No scenes,' Dr. Middleton added. 
speak your decision my girl pro forma seeing that he who has the right demands it and pray release me clara looked at willoughby i have decided to go to miss dale for her advice there was no appearance in him of a man that has been shot to miss dale for advice dr middleton invoked the furies what is the signification of this new freak miss dale must be consulted papa consulted with reference to the disposal of your hand in marriage she must be miss dale do you say i do papa dr middleton regained his natural elevation from the bend of body habitual with men of an established sanity pedagogues and others who are called on at odd intervals to inspect the magnitude of the infinitesimally absurd in human nature small that is under the light of reason immense in the realms of madness his daughter profoundly confused him he swelled out his chest remarking to willoughby i do not wonder at your scared expression of countenance my friend to discover yourself engaged to a girl mad as cassandra without a boast of the distinction of her being sunstruck can be no specially comfortable enlightenment i am opposed to delays and i will not have a breach of faith committed by daughter of mine do not repeat those words clara said to willoughby he started she had evidently come armed but how was so short a space what could have instructed her and in his bewilderment he gazed hurriedly above gulped air and cried scared sir i am not aware that my countenance can show a scare i am not accustomed to sue for long i am unable to sustain the part of humble supplicant she puts me out of harmony with creation we are plighted clara it is pure waste of time to speak of soliciting advice on the subject would it be a breach of faith for me to break my engagement she said you ask it is a breach of sanity to propound the interrogation said her father she looked at willoughby now he shrugged haughtily since last night she said last night am i not released not by me by your act my dear clara have you not virtually disengaged me i who claim you as mine can you i do and must after last night tricks shufflings jabber of a barbarian woman upon the evolutions of a serpent exclaimed dr middleton you were to capitulate or to furnish reasons for your refusal you have none give him your hand girl according to the compact I praised you to him for returning within the allotted term, and now forbear to disgrace yourself and me. Is he perfectly free to offer his? Ask him, papa. Perform your duty. Do let us have peace. Perfectly free, as on the day when I offered it first, Willoughby frankly waved his honorable hand. His face was blanched enemies in the air seemed to have whispered things to her he doubted the fidelity of the powers above since last night said she oh if you insist i reply since last night you know what i mean sir willoughby oh certainly you speak the truth sir willoughby her father ejaculated in wrath but will you explain what you mean epitome that you are of all the contradictions and mutabilities ascribed to women from the beginning certainly he says and knows no more than i she begs grace for an hour and returns with a fresh store of evasions to insult the man she has injured it is my humiliation to confess that our share in this contract is rescued from public ignominy by his generosity nor can i congratulate him on his fortune should he condescend to bear with you to the utmost for instead of the young woman i suppose myself to be bestowing on him i see a fantastical planuncula enlivened by the wanton tempers of a nursery chit 
if one may conceive a meaning in her, in miserable apology for such behavior, some spirit of jealousy informs the girl. I can only remark that there is no foundation for it, said Willoughby. I'm willing to satisfy you, Clara. Name the person who discomposes you. I can scarcely imagine one to exist, but who can tell? She could name no person. The detestable imputation of jealousy would be confirmed if she mentioned a name, and indeed Letitia was not to be named. He pursued his advantage. Jealousy is one of the fits I am a stranger to. I fancy, sir, that gentlemen have dismissed it. I speak for myself, but I can make allowances. In some cases it is considered a compliment, and often a word will soothe it. The whole affair is so senseless. However, I will enter the witness box, or stand at the prisoner's bar. Anything to quiet a distempered mind. Of you, sir, said Dr. Middleton, might a parent be justly proud. It is not jealousy. I could not be jealous, Clara cried, stung by the very passion and she ran through her brain for a suggestion to win a sign of meltingness, if not esteem, from her father. She was not an iron maiden, but one among the nervous natures which live largely in the moment, though she was then sacrificing it to her nature's deep dislike. You may be proud of me again, papa. She could hardly have uttered anything more impolitic. Optune, but deliver yourself ad rem, he'd rejoined alarmingly pacified. Fermawit fidem, do you likewise, and double on us no more like puss in the field. I wish to see Miss Dale, she said. Up flew the Reverend Doctor's arms in wrathful despair resembling an imprecation. She is at the cottage. You could have seen her, said Willoughby. Evidently she had not. Is it untrue that last night, between twelve o'clock and one, in the drawing-room, you propose marriage to Miss Dale? He became convinced that she must have stolen downstairs during his colloquy with Letitia, and listened at the door. On behalf of old Vernon, he said, lightly laughing. The idea is not novel, as you know. They are suited, if they could see it. Letitia Dale and my cousin Vernon Whitford, sir. Fairly schemed, my friend, and I will say for you, you have the patience, Willoughby, of a husband. Willoughby bowed to the encomium, and allowed some fatigue to be visible. He half yawned. I claim no happier title, sir, and made light of the wearful discussion. Clara was shaken. She feared that Crossjay had heard incorrectly, or that Colonel De Cray had guessed erroneously. It was too likely that Willoughby should have proposed Vernon to Letitia. There was nothing to reassure her save the vision of the panic amazement of his face at her persistency in speaking of Miss Dale. She could have declared on oath that she was right while admitting all the suppositions to be against her, and unhappily all the delicacies, a doughty battalion for the defense of ladies until they enter into difficulties and are shorn of them at a blow, bare as dairymaids, all the bodyguard of a young gentlewoman, the drawing-room syphides, which bear her train, which wreathe her hair, which modulate her voice and tone or complexion, which are arrows and shield to all the creature man, forbade her utterance of what she felt, on pain of instant fulfillment of their oft-repeated threat of late to leave her to the last remnant of a protecting sprite. She could not, as in a dear melodrama, from the aim of a pointed finger denounce him, on the testimony of her instincts, false of speech, false indeed. She could not even declare that she doubted his truthfulness. The refuge of a sullen fit, the refuge of tears, the pretext of a mood, were denied her now by the rigor of those laws of decency which are a garment to ladies of pure breeding. One more respite, papa, she implored him, bitterly conscious of the closer tangle her petition involved, and, if it must be betrayed of her, perceiving in an illumination how the knot might become so woefully Gordian, that haply in a cloud of wild events 
the intervention of a gallant gentleman out of heaven, albeit in the likeness of one of earth, would have to cut it. Her cry within, as she succumbed to weakness, being fervider, anything but marry this one. She was faint with strife and dejected, a condition in the young when their imaginative energies hold revel uncontrolled and are projectively desperate. No respite, said Willoughby genially. And I say no respite, observed her father. You have assumed a position that has not been granted you, Clara Middleton. I cannot bear to offend you, father. Him. Your duty is not to offend him. Address your excuses to him. I refuse to be dragged over the same ground to reiterate the same command perpetually. If authority is deputed to me, I claim you, said Willoughby. You have not broken faith with me? Assuredly not. Or would it be possible for me to press my claim? And join the right hand to the right, said Dr. Middleton. No, it would not be possible. What insane root she has been nibbling, I know not. But she must consign herself to the guidance of those whom the gods have not abandoned, until her intellect is liberated. She was once there. I look not back. If she it was, and no simulacrum of a reasonable daughter. I welcome the appearance of my friend Mr. Whitford. He is my sea bath and supper on the beach of Troy, after the day's battle and dust. Vernon walked straight up to them, an act unusual with him, for he was shy of committing an intrusion. Clara guessed by that, and more by the dancing frown of speculative humor he turned on Willoughby, that he had come charged in support of her. His forehead was curiously lively, as of one who has got a surprise well under to feed on its amusing contents. "'Have you seen Crossjay, Mr. Whitford?' she said. "'I have pounced on Crossjay. His bones are sound.' "'Where did he sleep? On a sofa, it seems.' She smiled with good hope. Vernon had the story. Willoughby thought it just to himself that he should defend his measure of severity. The boy lied. He played a double game, for which he should have been reasoned with at the Grecian portico of a boy, said the Reverend Doctor. My system is different, sir. I could not inflict what I would not endure myself. So is Greek excluded from the later generations? and you leave a field the most fertile in the moralities in youth, unplowed and unsown. Ah, well, this growing too fine is our way of relapsing upon barbarism. Beware of oversensitiveness, where nature has plainly indicated her alternative gateway of knowledge. And now, I presume, I am at liberty. Vernon will excuse us for a minute or two. I hold Mr. Whitford now I have him. I'll join you in the laboratory, Vernon, Willoughby nodded bluntly. We will leave them, Mr. Whitford. They are at the time-honored dissension upon a particular day that, for the sake of dignity, blushes to be named. What day, said Vernon, like a rustic? The day, these people call it. Vernon sent one of his vivid eye-shots from one to the other, his eyes fixed on Willoughby's with a quivering glow, beyond amazement as if his humor stood at furnace heat and absorbed all that came. Willoughby motioned to him to go. "'Have you seen Miss Dale, Mr. Whitford?' said Clara. He answered, "'No, something has shocked her. Is it her feeling for Crossjay?' "'Ah,' Vernon said to Willoughby, "'your pocketing of the key of Crossjay's bedroom door was a master stroke.' The celestial irony suffused her, and she bathed and swam in it, on hearing its dupe reply, My methods of discipline are short. I was not aware that she had been to his door. But I may hope that Miss Dale will see me, said Clara. We are in sympathy about the boy. Mr. Dale might be seen. He seems to be of a divided mind with his daughter, Vernon rejoined. She has locked herself up in her room. He is not the only father in the unwholesome predicament, said Dr. Middleton. He talks of coming to you, Willoughby. 
Why to me? Willoughby chastened his irritation. He will be welcome, of course. It would be better that the boy should come. If there is a chance of your forgiving him, said Clara, let the Dales know I am prepared to listen to the boy, Vernon. There can be no necessity for Mr. Dale to drag himself here. How are Mr. Dale and his daughter of a divided mind, Mr. Whitford, said Clara. Vernon simulated an uneasiness. With a vacant gaze that enlarged around Willoughby and was more discomforting than intentness, he replied, Perhaps she is unwilling to give him her entire confidence, Miss Middleton. In which respect, then, our situations present their solitary point of unlikeness and resemblance, for I have it in excess, observed Dr. Middleton. Clara dropped her eyelids for the wave to pass over. It struck me that Miss Dale was a person of the extremest candor. Why should we be prying into the domestic affairs of the Dales? Willoughby interjected, and drew out his watch, merely for a diversion. He was on tiptoe to learn whether Vernon was as well instructed as Clara, and hung to the view that he could not be, while drenching in the sensation that he was. And if so, what were the powers above but a body of conspirators? He paid Letitia that compliment. He could not conceive the human betrayal of the secret. Clara's discovery of it had set his common sense adrift. The domestic affairs of the Dales do not concern me, said Vernon. And yet, my friend, Dr. Middleton, balanced himself, and with an air of benevolent slyness, the import of which did not awaken Willoughby until too late, remarked, They might concern you. I will even add that there is a probability of your being not less than the font and origin of this division of father and daughter. Though Willoughby in the drawing-room last night stands accusably the agent. Favor me, sir, with an explanation, said Vernon, seeking to gather it from Clara. Dr. Middleton threw the explanation upon Willoughby. Clara communicated as much as she was able in one of those looks of still depth which say, Think, and without causing a thought to stir, takes us into the pellucid mind. Vernon was enlightened before Willoughby had spoken. His mouth shut rigidly, and there was a springing increase of the luminous wavering of his eyes. Some star that Clara had watched at night was like them in the vivid wink and overflow of its light. Yet, as he was perfectly sedate, none could have suspected his blood to be chasing wild with laughter, and his frame strung to the utmost to keep it from volleying. So happy was she in his aspect that her chief anxiety was to recover the name of the star whose shining beckons and speaks and is in a quick of spirit fire. It is the sole star which on a night of frost and strong moonlight preserves an indomitable fervency. That she remembered, and the picture of a whore earth and a lean Orion in a flooded heavens, and the star beneath eastward of him. But the name, the name, she heard Willoughby indistinctly. Oh, the old story, another effort, you know my wish. A failure, of course, and no thanks on either side. I suppose I must ask your excuse. They, neither of them, see what's good for them, sir. Manifestly, however, said Dr. Middleton, if one may opine from the division we have heard of, the father is disposed to back your nominee. I can't say. As far as I am concerned, I made a mess of it. Vernon withstood the incitement to acquiesce but he sparkled with his recognition of the fact. You meant well, Willoughby. I hope so, Vernon. Only you have driven her away. We must resign ourselves. It won't affect me, for I'm off tomorrow. You see, sir, the thanks I get? Mr. Whitford, said Dr. Middleton, you have a tower of strength in the lady's father. Would you have me bring it to bear upon the lady, sir? Wherefore not? to make her marriage a matter of obedience to her father? I, my friend, a lusty lover would have her gladly on those terms, well knowing it to be for the lady's good. What do you say, Willoughby? Sir, say, what can I say? Miss Dale has not plighted her faith. Had she done so, she is a lady who would never dishonor it. She is an ideal of constancy, who would keep to it though it had been broken on the other side said Vernon, and Clara thrilled. 
I take that, sir, to be a statue of constancy, modelled upon which a lady of our flesh may be proclaimed as graduating for the condition of idiocy, said Dr. Middleton. But faith is faith, sir. But the broken is the broken, sir, whether in porcelain or in human engagements. And all that one of the two continuing faithful, I should rather say regretful, can do is to devote the remainder of life to the picking up of fragments, an occupation properly to be pursued for the comfort of mankind within the enclosure of an appointed asylum. You destroy the poetry of sentiment, Dr. Middleton, to invigorate the poetry of nature, Mr. Whitford. Then you maintain, sir, that when faith is broken by one, the engagement ceases, and the other is absolutely free? I do. I am the champion of that platitude, and sound that knell to the sentimental world. And since you have chosen to defend it, I will appeal to Willoughby, and ask him if he would not side with the world of good sense in applauding the nuptials of man or maid married within a month of a jilting. Clara slipped her arm under her father's. Poetry, sir, said Willoughby. I never have been hypocrite enough to pretend to understand or care for. Dr. Middleton laughed. Vernon, too, seemed to admire his cousin for a reply that rung in Clara's ears as the dullest ever spoken. Her arm grew cold on her father's. She began to fear Willoughby again. He depended entirely on his agility to elude the thrust that assailed him. Had he been able to believe in the treachery of the powers above, he would at once have been designed in these deadly strokes, for his feelings had rarely been more acute than at the present crisis, and he would then have led away Clara to wrangle it out with her, relying on Vernon's friendliness not to betray him to her father. But a wrangle with Clara promised no immediate fruits, nothing agreeable, and the lifelong trust he had reposed in his protecting genie obscured his intelligence to evidence he would otherwise have accepted on the spot, on the faith of his delicate susceptibility to the mildest impressions which wounded him. Clara might have stooped to listen at the door. She might have heard sufficient to create a suspicion. But Vernon was not in the house last night. She could not have communicated it to him, and he had not seen Letitia, who was, besides trustworthy, an admirable, if a foolish and ill-fated woman. Preferring to consider Vernon a pragmatical moralist, played upon by a sententious drone, he thought it politic to detach them, and vanquish Clara while she was in the beaten mood, as she had appeared before Vernon's vexatious arrival. I'm afraid, my dear fellow, you are rather too dainty and fussy for a very successful wooer, he said. It's beautiful on paper, and absurd in life. We have a bit of private business to discuss. We will go inside, sir, I think. I will soon release you. Clara pressed her father's arm. More, said he. Five minutes. There's a slight delusion to clear, sir. My dear Clara, you will see with different eyes. Papa wishes to work with Mr. Whitford. Her heart sunk to hear her father say, No, tis a lost morning. I must consent to pay tax of it for giving another young woman to the world. I have a daughter. You will, I hope, compensate me, Mr. Whitford, in the afternoon. Be not downcast. I have observed you meditative of late. You will have no clear brain so long as that stuff is on the mind. I could venture to propose to do some pleading for you, should it be needed for the prompter expedition of the affair. Vernon briefly thanked him and said, Willoughby has exerted all his eloquence, and you see the result. You have lost Miss Dale, and I have not won her. He did everything that one man can do for another in so delicate a case, even to the repeating of her famous birthday verses to him, to flatter the poetess. His best efforts were foiled by the lady's indisposition for me. Behold, said Dr. Middleton, as Willoughby, electrified by the mention of the verses, took a sharp stride or two. You have in him an advocate who will not be rebuffed by one refusal, and I can affirm that he is tenacious, pertinacious as are few, justly so. Not to believe in a lady's no is the approved method of carrying that fortress built to yield. 
although unquestionably to have a young man pleading in our interest with a lady counts its objections. Yet Willoughby, being notoriously engaged, may be held to enjoy the privileges of his elders. As an engaged man, sir, he was on a level with his elders in pleading on my behalf with Miss Dale, said Vernon. Willoughby strode and muttered. Providence had grown mythical in his thoughts, if not malicious, and it is the peril of this worship that the object will wear such an alternative aspect when it appears no longer subservient. "'Are we coming, sir?' he said, and was unheeded. The reverend doctor would not be defrauded of rolling his billow. As an honorable gentleman faithful to his own engagement and desirous of establishing his relatives, he deserves, in my judgment, the lady's esteem, as well as your cordial thanks. Nor should a temporary failure dishearten either of you, notwithstanding the precipitate retreat of the lady from pattern, and her seclusion in her sanctum on the occasion of your recent visit. Supposing he had succeeded, said Vernon, driving Willoughby to frenzy, should I have been bound to marry? Mad of her cogitation was offered to Dr. Middleton. The proposal was without your sanction, entirely. You admire the lady, respectfully. You do not incline to the state. An inch of an angle would exaggerate my inclination. How long are we to stand and hear this insufferable nonsense you talk? cried Willoughby. But if Mr. Whitford was not consulted, Dr. Middleton said, and was overborne by Willoughby's hurried, Oblige me, sir, oblige me, my good fellow. He swept his arm to Vernon and gestured a conducting hand to Clara. "'Here's Mrs. Mountstuart!' she exclaimed. Willoughby stared. Was it an eruption of a friend or a foe? He doubted and stood petrified between the double question. Clara had seen Mrs. Mountstuart and Colonel de Cray separating, and now the great lady sailed along the sward like a royal barge in festival trim. She looked friendly, but friendly to everybody, which was always a frost on Willoughby, and terribly friendly to Clara. Coming up to her, she whispered, News, indeed, wonderful. I could not credit his hint of it yesterday. Are you satisfied? Pray, Mrs. Mountstuart, take an opportunity to speak to papa, Clara whispered in return. Mrs. Mountstuart bowed to Dr. Middleton, nodded to Vernon, and swam upon Willoughby with, is it? But is it? Am I really to believe? You have? My dear Sir Willoughby, really? The confounded gentleman heaved on a bare plank of wreck in mid-sea. He could oppose only a paralyzed smile to the assault. His intuitive discretion taught him to fall back a step while she said, So, the plummet word of our mysterious deep fathoms. And he fell back further, saying, Madam in a tone advising her to speak low. She recovered her volubility, followed his partial retreat, and dropped her voice. Impossible to have imagined it as an actual fact. You were always full of surprises, but this, this! Nothing manlier, nothing more gentlemanly has ever been done, nothing. Nothing that so completely changes an untenable situation into a comfortable and proper footing for everybody. It is what I like. It is what I love. Sound sense. Men are so selfish. One cannot persuade them to be reasonable in such positions. But you, Sir Willoughby, have shown wisdom and sentiment, the rarest of all combinations in men. Where have you, Willoughby contrived to say, heard? The hedges, the housetops, everywhere. All the neighborhood will have it before nightfall. Lady Bush and Lady Calmer will soon be rushing here, and declaring they never expected anything else, I do not doubt. I am not so pretentious. I beg your excuse for that twice of mine yesterday. Even if it hurt my vanity, I should be happy to confess my error. I was utterly out. But then I did not reckon on a fatal attachment. I thought men were incapable of it. I thought we women were the only poor creatures persecuted by a fatality. It is a fatality. You tried hard to escape. Indeed, you did. And she will do honor to your final surrender, my dear friend. She is gentle and very clever, very. She is devoted to you. 
and she will entertain excellently. I see her like a flower in sunshine. She will expand to a perfect hostess. The pattern will shine under her reign. You have my warrant for that, and so will you. Yes, you flourish best when adored. It must be adoration. You have been under a cloud of late. Years ago I said it was a match when no one supposed you could stoop. Lady Bush would have it was a screen, and she was deemed high wisdom. The world will be with you. All the women will be, excepting, of course, Lady Bush, whose pride is in prophecy, and she will soon be too glad to swell the host. There, my friend, your sincerest and oldest admirer congratulates you. I could not contain myself. I was compelled to pour forth. And now I must go and be talked to by Dr. Middleton. Does he take it? They leave? He is perfectly well, said Willoughby, aloud, quite distraught. She acknowledged his just correction of her for running on to an extreme in low-toned converse, though they stood sufficiently isolated from the others. These had by this time been joined by Colonel de Cray, and were all chatting in a group. Of himself, Willoughby horribly suspected. Clara was gone from him, gone, but he remembered his oath and vowed it again. Not to Horace de Cray. She was gone, lost, sunk into the world of waters of rival men, and he determined that his whole force should be used to keep her from that man, the false friend who had supplanted him in her shallow heart, and might, if he succeeded, boast of having done it by simply appearing on the scene. Willoughby intercepted Mrs. Mountstuart as she was passing over to Dr. Middleton. My dear lady, spare me a minute. De Cray sauntered up with a face of the friendliest humor. Never was man like you, Willoughby, for shaking new patterns in a kaleidoscope. Have you turned punster, Horace? Willoughby replied, smarting to find yet another in the demon secret, and he draw Dr. Middleton two or three steps aside, and hurriedly begged him to abstain from prosecuting the subject with Clara. We must try to make her happy as we best can, sir. She may have her reasons, a young lady's reasons, he laughed and left the reverend doctor, considering within himself under the arch of his lofty frown of stupefaction. De Cray smiled slyly and winningly as he shadowed a deep droop on the bend of his head before Clara, signifying his absolute devotion to her service, and this present good fruit for witness of his merits. She smiled sweetly, though vaguely. There was no concealment of their intimacy. The battle is over, Vernon said quietly, when Willoughby had walked some paces beside Mrs. Mountstuart, adding, You may expect to see Mr. Dale here. He knows. Vernon and Clara exchanged one look, hard on his part, in contrast with her softness, and he proceeded to the house. De Cray waited for a word or a promising look. He was patient, being self-assured, and passed on. Clara linked her arm with her father's once more, and said on a sudden brightness, "'Serious, papa!' He repeated it in the profoundest manner. "'Serious! And is there,' he asked, "'a feminine scintilla of sense in that?' "'It is the name of the star I was thinking of, dear papa.' It was the star observed by King Agamemnon before the sacrifice in Aulus. You were thinking of that? But my love, my Ephigenia, you have not a father who will insist on sacrificing you. Did I hear him tell you to humor me, papa? Dr. Middleton humphed. Verily the dog star rages in many heads, he responded. End of chapter 43 Recording by Linda Woods, Maitland, Florida. Chapter 44 of The Egoist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen The Egoist by George Meredith Chapter 44 
Dr. Middleton, the ladies Eleanor and Isabel, and Mr. Dale. Clara looked up at the flying clouds. She travelled with them now, and tasted freedom, but she prudently forbore to vex her father. She held herself in reserve. They were summoned by the midday bell. Few were speakers at the meal, few were eaters. Clara was impelled to join it by her desire to study Mrs. Mountstuart's face. Willoughby was obliged to preside. It was a meal of an assembly of mutes and plates that struck the ear like the well-known sound of a collection of offerings in church after an impressive exhortation from the pulpit. A sally of Colonel de Craye's met the reception given to a charity boy's muffled burst of animal spirits in the silence of the sacred edifice. Willoughby tried politics with Dr. Middleton, whose regular appetite preserved him from uncongenial speculations when the hour for appeasing it had come, and he alone did honour to the dishes replying to his host times are bad you say and we have a ministry doing with us what they will well sir and that being so and opposition a manner of kicking them into greater stability it is the time for wise men to retire within themselves with the steady determination of the seed in the earth to grow repose upon nature sleep in firm faith and abide the seasons that is my counsel to the weaker party the counsel was excellent but it killed the topic dr middleton's appetite was watched for the signal to rise and breathe freely and such is the grace accorded to a good man of untroubled conscience engaged in doing his duty to himself that he perceived nothing of the general restlessness he went through the dishes calmly and as calmly he quoted milton to the ladies eleanor and isabel when the company sprung up all at once upon his closing his repast vernon was taken away from him by willoughby Mrs. Mountstuart beckoned covertly to Clara. Willoughby should have had something to say to him, Dr. Middleton thought. The position was not clear. But the situation was not disagreeable, and he was in no serious hurry, though he wished to be enlightened. This, Dr. Middleton said to the spinster aunts as he accompanied them to the drawing-room, shall be no lost day for me if i may devote the remainder of it to you the thunder we fear is not remote murmured one we fear it is imminent sighed the other they took to chanting in alternation we are accustomed to peruse our willoughby and we know him by a shadow from his infancy to his glorious youth and his established manhood he was ever the soul of chivalry duty duty first the happiness of his family the well-being of his dependents if proud of his name it was not an overweening pride it was founded in the conscious possession of exalted qualities he could be humble when occasion called for it Dr. Middleton bowed to the litany, feeling that occasion called for humbleness from him. "'Let us hope,' he said, with unassumed penitence on behalf of his inscrutable daughter. The ladies resumed. "'Vernon Whitford, not of his blood, is his brother. A thousand instances. Letitia Dale remembers them better than we.' that any blow should strike him that another should be in store for him it seems impossible he can be quite misunderstood let us hope said dr middleton 
one would not deem it too much for the dispenser of goodness to expect to be a little looked up to when he was a child he one day mounted a chair and there he stood in danger would not let us touch him because he was taller than we and we were to gaze do you remember him eleanor i am the son of the house it was inimitable your feelings he would have your feelings he was fourteen when his cousin grace whitford married and we lost him they had been the greatest friends and it was long before he appeared among us he has never cared to see her since but he has befriended her husband never has he failed in generosity his only fault is his sensitiveness and that is his secret and that you are not to discover it is the same with him in manhood no one will accuse willoughby patterne of a deficiency of manliness but what is it he suffers as none suffer if he is not loved he himself is inalterably constant in affection what it is no one can say we have lived with him all his life and we know him ready to make any sacrifice only he does demand the whole heart in return and if he doubts he looks as we have seen him to-day shattered as we have never seen him look before we will hope said dr middleton this time hastily he tingled to say what it was he had it in him to solve perplexity in their inquiry he did say adopting familiar speech to suit the theme you know ladies we english come of a rough stock a dose of rough dealing in our youth does us no harm braces us otherwise we are likely to feel chilly we grow too fine where tenuity of stature is necessarily buffeted by gales namely in our self-esteem we are barbarians on a forcing soil of wealth in a conservatory of comfortable security but still barbarians so you see we shine at our best when we are plucked out of that to where hard blows are given in a state of war in a state of war we are at home our men are high-minded fellows scipios and good legionaries in the state of peace we do not live in peace our native roughness breaks out in unexpected places under extraordinary aspects tyrannies extravagances domestic exactions and if we have not had sharp early training within and without the old-fashioned island instrument to drill us into the civilization of our masters the ancients we show it by running here and there to some excess <clears throat> yet added the reverend doctor abandoning his effort to deliver a weighty truth obscurely for the comprehension of dainty spinster ladies the superabundance of whom in england was in his opinion largely the cause of our decay as a people yet i have not observed this ultra sensitiveness in willoughby he has borne to hear more than i certainly no example of the frailty could have endured he concealed it said the ladies it is intense then is it a disease it bears no explanation it is mystic it is a cultus then a form of self-worship self they ejaculated but is not self indifferent to others is it self that craves for sympathy love and devotion he is an admirable host ladies he is admirable in all respects admirable must he be who can impress discerning women his lifelong housemates so favourably he is i repeat a perfect host 
he will be a perfect husband in all probability it is a certainty let him be loved and obeyed he will be guided that is the secret for her whom he so fatally loves that if we had dared we would have hinted to her she will rule him through her love of him and through him all about her and it will not be a rule he submits to but a love he accepts if she could see it if she were a metaphysician sighed dr middleton but a sensitiveness so keen as his might fretted by an unsympathizing mate in the end become for the best of us is mortal callous he would perhaps feel as much or more he would still be tender but he might grow outwardly hard both ladies looked up at dr middleton as they revealed the dreadful prospect it is the story told of corns he said sad as they the three stood drooping the ladies with an attempt to digest his remark the reverend doctor in dejection lest his gallantry should no longer continue to wrestle with his good sense he was rescued the door opened and a footman announced mr dale miss eleanor and miss isabel made a sign to one another of raising their hands they advanced to him and welcomed him pray be seated mr dale you have not brought us bad news of our Letitia. So rare is the pleasure of welcoming you here, Mr. Dale, that we are in some alarm when, as we trust, it should be a matter for unmixed congratulation. Has Dr. Corney been doing wonders? I am indebted to him for the drive to your house, ladies, said Mr. Dale a spare close-buttoned gentleman with an indian complexion deadened in the sick chamber it is unusual for me to stir from my precincts the reverend dr middleton mr dale bowed he seemed surprised you live in a splendid air sir observed the reverend doctor i can profit little by it sir replied mr dale he asked the ladies will sir willoughby be disengaged they consulted he is with vernon we will send to him the bell was rung i have had the gratification of making the acquaintance of your daughter mr dale a most estimable lady said dr middleton mr dale bowed she is honoured by your praises sir to the best of my belief i speak as a father she merits them hitherto i have had no doubts of Letitia, exclaimed the ladies and spoke of her as gentleness and goodness incarnate hitherto i have devoutly thought so said mr dale surely she is the very sweetest nurse the most devoted of daughters as far as concerns her duty to her father i can say she is that ladies in all her relations mr dale it is my prayer he said the footman appeared he announced that sir willoughby was in the laboratory with mr whitford and the door locked domestic business the ladies remarked you know willoughby's diligent attention to affairs mr dale he is well mr dale inquired in excellent health body and mind but dear mr dale he is never ill ah oh, for one to hear that who is never well and mr whitford is quite sound sound the question alarms me for myself said dr middleton sound as our constitution the credit of the country the reputation of our prince of poets i pray you to have no fear for him mr dale gave the mild little sniff of a man thrown deeper into perplexity he said 
mr whitford works his head he is a hard student he may not be always if i may so put it at home on worldly affairs dismiss that defamatory legend of the student mr dale and take my word for it that he who persistently works his head has the strongest for all affairs ah your daughter sir is here my daughter is here sir and will be most happy to present her respects to the father of her friend miss dale they are friends very cordial friends mr dale administered another feebly pacifying sniff to himself letitia he sighed in apostrophe and swept his forehead with a hand seen to shake the ladies asked him anxiously whether he felt the heat of the room and one offered him a smelling bottle he thanked them i can hold out until sir willoughby comes we fear to disturb him when his door is locked mr dale but if you wish it we will venture on a message you have really no bad news of our letitia she left us hurriedly this morning without any leave-taking except a word to one of the maids that your condition required her immediate presence my condition and now her door is locked to me we have spoken through the door and that is all i stand sick and stupefied between two locked doors neither of which will open it appears to give me the enlightenment i need more than medicine dear me cried dr middleton i am struck by your description of your position mr dale it would aptly apply to our humanity of the present generation and were these the days when i sermonized i could propose that it should afford me an illustration for the pulpit for my part when doors are closed i try not their locks and i attribute my perfect equanimity health even to an uninquiring acceptation of the fact that they are closed to me i read my page by the light i have on the contrary the world of this day if i may presume to quote you for my purpose is heard knocking at those two locked doors of the secret things on each side of us and is beheld standing sick and stupefied because it has got no response to its knocking why sir let the world compare the diverse fortunes of the beggar and the postman knock to give and it is opened unto you knock to crave and it continues shut i say carry a letter to your locked door and you shall have a good reception but there is none that is handed out for which reason mr dale swept a perspiring forehead and extended his hand in supplication i am an invalid dr middleton he said i am unable to cope with analogies i have but strength for the slow digestion of facts for facts we are bradypeptics to a man sir we know not yet if nature be a fact or an effort to master one the world has not yet assimilated the first fact it stepped on we are still in the endeavour to make good blood of the fact of our being pressing his hands at his temples mr dale moaned my head twirls i did unwisely to come out i came on an impulse i trust honourable i am unfit i cannot follow you dr middleton pardon me nay sir let me say from my experience of my countrymen that if you do not follow me and can abstain from abusing me in consequence you are magnanimous the reverend doctor replied 
hardly consented to let go the man he had found to indemnify him for his gallant service of acquiescing as a mute to the ladies though he knew his breathing robustfulness to be as an east wind to weak nerves and himself an engine of punishment when he had been torn for a day from his books miss eleanor said the enlightenment you need mr dale can we enlighten you i think not he answered faintly i think i will wait for sir willoughby or mr whitford if i can keep my strength or could i exchange i fear to break down two words with the young lady who is was miss middleton my daughter sir she shall be at your disposition i will bring her to you dr middleton stopped at the window she it is true may better know the mind of miss dale than i but i flatter myself i know the gentleman better i think mr dale addressing you as the lady's father you will find me a persuasive i could be an impassioned advocate in his interests mr dale was confounded the weakly sapling caught in a gust falls back as he did advocate he said he had little breath his impassioned advocate i repeat for i have the highest opinion of him you see sir i am acquainted with the circumstances i believe dr middleton half turned to the ladies we must until your potent inducements mr dale have been joined to my instances and we have overcome what feminine scruples there may be treat the circumstances as not generally public our strephon may be chargeable with shyness but if for the present it is incumbent on us in proper consideration for the parties not to be nominally precise it is hardly requisite in this household that we should be he is now for protesting indifference to the state i fancy we understand that phase of amatory frigidity frankly mr dale i was once in my life myself refused by a lady and i was not indignant merely indifferent to the marriage tie my daughter has refused him sir temporarily it would appear that she has declined the proposal he was at liberty he could honourably his best friend and nearest relative is your guarantee i know it i hear so i am informed of that i have heard of the proposal and that he could honourably make it still i am helpless i cannot move until i am assured that my daughter's reasons are such as a father need not underline does the lady perchance equivocate i have not seen her this morning i rise late i hear an astounding account of the cause for her departure from patterne and i find her door locked to me no answer it is that she had no reasons to give and she feared the demand for them ladies dolorously exclaimed mr dale we guess the secret we guess it they exclaimed in reply and they looked smilingly as dr middleton looked she had no reasons to give mr dale spelled these words to his understanding then sir she knew you not adverse undoubtedly by my high esteem for the gentleman she must have known me not adverse but she would not consider me a principle she could hardly have conceived me an obstacle i am simply the gentleman's friend a zealous friend let me add mr dale put out an imploring hand it was too much for him 
pardon me i have a poor head and your daughter the same sir we will not measure it too closely but i may say my daughter the same sir and likewise may i not add these ladies mr dale made sign that he was overfilled where am i and letitia refused him temporarily let us assume will it not partly depend on you mr dale but what strange things have been happening during my daughter's absence from the cottage cried mr dale betraying an elixir in his veins i feel that i could laugh if i did not dread to be thought insane she refused his hand and he was at liberty to offer it my girl we are all on our heads the fairy tales were right and the lesson books were wrong but it is really it is really very demoralizing an invalid and i am one and no momentary exhilaration will be taken for the contrary clings to the idea of stability order the slightest disturbance of the wonted course of things unsettles him why for years i've been prophesying it and for years i have had everything against me and now when it is confirmed i am wondering that i must not call myself a fool and for years dear mr dale this union in spite of counter-currents and human arrangements has been our willoughby's constant preoccupation said miss eleanor his most cherished aim said miss isabel the name was not spoken by me said dr middleton but it is out and perhaps better out if we would avoid the chance of mystifications i do not suppose we are seriously committing a breach of confidence though he might have wished to mention it to you first himself i have it from willoughby that last night he appealed to your daughter mr dale not for the first time if i apprehend him correctly and unsuccessfully he despairs i do not supposing that is your assistance vouchsafed to us and i do not despair because the gentleman is a gentleman of worth of acknowledged worth you know him well enough to grant me that i will bring you my daughter to help me in sounding his praises dr middleton stepped through the window to the lawn on an elastic foot beaming with the happiness he felt charged to confer on his friend mr whitford ladies it passes all wonders mr dale gasped willoughby's generosity does pass all wonders they said in chorus the door opened lady bush and lady culmer were announced end of chapter forty four Recording by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter forty five of the Egoist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander the egoist a comedy in narrative by george meredith chapter forty five the patern ladies mr dale lady bush and lady culmer with mrs mountain stuart jenkinson lady bush and lady culmer entered spying to right and left at the sight of mr dale in the room lady bush murmured to her friend confirmation lady culmer murmured Coney is quite reliable. The man is his own best tonic. He is invaluable for the country. Miss Eleanor and Miss Isabel greeted them. 
The amiability of the Patern ladies, combined with their total eclipse behind their illustrious nephew, invited enterprising women of the world to take liberties, and they were not backward. Lady Bush said, Well, the news, we have the outlines. Don't be astonished. We know the points. We have heard the gun. I could have told you as much yesterday. I saw it, and I guessed it the day before. Oh, I do believe in fatalities now. Lady Calmer and I agree to take that view. It is the simplest. Well, and are you satisfied, my dears? The ladies grimaced interrogatively. With what? With it? With all? With her? With him? Our Willoughby? Can it be possible that they require a dose of corny? Lady Bush remarked to Lady Calmer. They play discretion to perfection, said Lady Calmer. But, my dears, we are in the secret. How did she behave? whispered Lady Bush. No high flights and flutters, I do hope. She was well connected, they say, though I don't comprehend what they mean by a line of scholars. One thinks of a row of pinafores, and she was pretty. That is well enough at the start. It never will stand against brains. He had the two in the house to contrast them, and uh, the result... A young woman with brains in a house beats all your beauties. Lady Calmer and I have determined on that view. He thought her a delightful partner for a dance, and found her rather tiresome at the end of the galopade. I saw it yesterday, clear as daylight. She did not understand him, and he did not understand her. That will be our report. She is young, she will learn, said the ladies uneasily, but in total ignorance of her meaning. And you are charitable, and always were. I remember you had a good word for that girl, Durham. Lady Bush crossed the room to Mr. Dale, who was turning over leaves of a grand book of the heraldic devices of our great families. Study it, she said, study it, my dear Mr. Dale. You are in it by right of possessing a clever and accomplished daughter. At page three hundred you will find the Patern crest, and mark me, she will drag you into the peerage before she has done. Relatively, you know. Sir Willoughby and wife will not be contented to sit down and manage the estates. Has not Letitia immense ambition? And very creditable, I say. Mr. Dale tried to protest something. He shut the book, examining the binding, flapped the cover with a finger, hoped her ladyship was in good health, alluded to his own, and the strangest of the bird out of the cage. You will probably take up your residence here in a larger and handsomer cage, Mr. Dale. He shook his head. Do I apprend, he said. I know, said she. Dear me, can it be? Mr. Dales gazed upward with the feelings of one awakened late to see a world alive in broad daylight. Lady Bush dropped her voice. She took the liberty permitted to her with an inferior in station, while treating him to a tone of familiarity in acknowledgment of his expected rise, which is high breeding, or the exact measurement of his social dues. Letitia will be happy, you may be sure. I love to see a long and faithful attachment rewarded. Love it. Her tale is the triumph of patience. Far above Grissel. No woman will be ashamed of pointing to Lady Patern. You are uncertain? You are in doubt? Let me hear, as slow as you like. But there is no doubt of the new shifting of the scene? No doubt of the proposal? Dear Mr. Dale, a very little louder. You are here because? Of course you wish to see Sir Willoughby. She? I did not catch you quite. She? It seems you say? Lady Calmer said to the Patern ladies, You must have had a distressing time. These affairs always mount up to a climax unless people are very well-bred. 
we saw it coming naturally we did not expect such a transformation of brides who could if i had laid myself down on my back to think i should have had it i am unerring when i set to speculating on my back one is cooler ideas come they have not to be forced that is why i am brighter on a dull winter afternoon on the sofa beside my tea service than at any other season however your trouble is over when did the middletons leave the middletons leave said the ladies dr middleton and his daughter they have not left us the middletons are here they are here yes why should they have left Paterne? why yes they are likely to stay some days longer goodness there is no ground for any report to the contrary lady calmer no ground lady calmer called out to lady bush a cry came back from that startled dame she has refused him who she has she sir willoughby refused declines the honour oh never no that carries the incredible beyond romance but is he perfectly at quiet it seems and she was asked in due form and refused no and no again my dear i have it from mr dale mr dale what can be the signification of her conduct indeed lady calmer said mr dale not unpleasantly agitated by the interest he excited in spite of his astonishment at a public discussion of the matter in this house i am in the dark her father should know but i do not her door is locked to me i have not seen her i am absolutely in the dark i am a recluse i have forgotten the ways of the world i should have supposed her father would first have been addressed tut tut modern gentlemen are not so formal they are creatures of impulse and take a pride in it he spoke we settled that but where did you get this tale of a refusal i have it from dr middleton from dr middleton shouted lady bush the middletons are here said lady calmer what world are we in lady bush got up ran two or three steps and seated herself in another chair oh do let us proceed upon system if not we shall presently be raging we shall be dangerous the middletons are here and dr middleton himself communicates to mr dale that letitia dale has refused the hand of sir willoughby who is ostensibly engaged to his own daughter and pray mr dale how did dr middleton speak of it compose yourself there is no violent hurry though our sympathy with you and our interest in all the parties does perhaps agitate us a little quite at your leisure speak madame uh, lady bush mr dale gulped a ball in his throat i see no reason why i should not speak i do not see how i can have been deluded the miss paterns heard him dr middleton began upon it not i i was unaware when i came that it was a refusal i had been informed that there was a proposal my authority for the tale was positive the object of my visit was to assure myself of the integrity of my daughter's conduct she had always the highest sense of honour but passion is known to mislead and there was this most strange report i fear that our humblest apologies were due to dr middleton and his daughter i know the charm letitia can exercise madam in the plainest language without a possibility of my misapprehending him dr middleton spoke of himself as the advocate of the suitor for my daughter's hand i have a poor head i supposed at once an amicable rupture between sir willoughby and miss middleton or that the version which had reached me of their engagement was not strictly accurate my head is weak dr middleton's language is trying to a head like mine but i can speak positively on the essential points 
he spoke of himself as ready to be impassioned advocate for the suitor for my daughter's hand those were his words i understood him to entreat me to intercede with her nay the name was mentioned there was no concealment i am certain there could not be a misapprehension and my feelings were touched by his anxiety for sir willoughby's happiness i attributed it to a sentiment upon which i need not dwell impassioned advocate he said we are in a perfect maelstrom cried lady bush turning to everybody it's a complete hurricane cried lady calmer a light broke over the faces of the patern ladies they exchanged it with one another they had been so shocked as to be almost offended by lady bush but their natural gentleness and habitual submission rendered them unequal to the task of checking her is it not said miss eleanor a misunderstanding that a change of name will rectify this is by no means the first occasion said miss isabel that willoughby has pleaded for his cousin vernon we deplore extremely the painful error into which mr dale has fallen it springs we now perceive from an entire misapprehension of dr middleton vernon was in his mind it was clear to us impossible that it could have been willoughby you see the impossibility the error and the middletons here said lady bush oh if we leave unilluminated we shall be the laughing-stock of the county mr dale please wake up do you see you have been mistaken lady bush he woke up i may have mistaken dr middleton he has a language that i can compare to a review day of the field forces but i have the story on authority that i cannot question it is confirmed by my daughter's unexampled behaviour and if i live through this day i shall look about me as a ghost to-morrow dear mr dale said the patern ladies compassionately lady bush murmured to them you know the two did not agree they did not get on i saw it i predicted it she will understand him in time said they never and my belief is they have parted by consent and letty dale wins the day at last yes now i do believe it the ladies maintained a decided negative but they knew too much not to feel perplexed and they betrayed it though they said dear lady bush is it credible in decency dear mrs mountstuart lady bush invoked her great rival appearing among them you come most opportunely we are in a state of inextricable confusion we are bordering on frenzy you and none but you can help us you know you always know we hang on you is there any truth in it a particle mrs mountstuart seated herself regally ah mr dale she said inclined to him yes dear lady bush there is a particle now do not roast us you can you have the art i have the whole story that is i have a part i mean i have the outlines i cannot be deceived but you can fill them in i know you can i saw it yesterday now tell us tell us it must be quite true or utterly false which is it be precise his fatality you called her yes i was sceptical but here we have it all come round again and if he the tale is true i shall own you infallible has he and she both and the middletons here they have not gone they keep the field and more astounding she refuses him and to add to it dr middleton intercedes with mr dale for sir willoughby dr middleton intercedes this was rather astonishing to mrs mountstuart for vernon for vernon miss eleanor emphasized for vernon whitford his cousin said miss isabel still more emphatically who said mrs mountstuart with a sovereign lift and turn of her head speaks of a refusal 
i have it from mr dale said lady bush i had it i thought distinctly from dr middleton said mr dale that willoughby proposed to letitia for his cousin vernon dr middleton meant said miss eleanor her sister followed hence this really ridiculous misconception sad indeed she added for balm to mr dale willoughby was vernon's proxy his cousin if not his first is ever the second thought with him but can we continue such a discussion mrs mountstuart gave them a judicial hearing they were regarded in the country as the most indulgent of non-entities and she as little as lady bush was restrained from the burning topic in their presence she pronounced each party is right and each is wrong a dry i shall shriek came from lady bush cruel groaned lady calmer mixed you are all wrong disentangled you are each of your right sir willoughby does think of his cousin vernon he is anxious to establish him he is the author of a proposal to that effect we know it the patern ladies exclaimed and letitia rejected poor vernon once more who spoke of miss dale's rejection of mr whitford is he not rejected lady calmer inquired it is in debate and at this moment being decided oh do be seated mr dale lady bush implored him rising to thrust him back to his chair if necessary any dislocation and we are thrown out again we must hold together if this riddle is ever to be read then dear mrs mountstuart we are to say that there is no truth in the other story you are to say nothing of the sort dear lady bush be merciful and what of the fertility as positive as the pole to the needle she has not refused him ask your own sagacity accept it wait and all the world's ahead of me now mrs mountstuart you are the oracle riddles if you like only speak if we can't have corn why give us husks is any of us able to anticipate events lady bush yes i believe that you are i bow to you i do sincerely so it is another person for mr whitford you nod and it is our letitia for sir willoughby you smile you would not deceive me a very little and i run about crazed and howl at your doors and dr middleton is made to play blind man in the midst and the other person is now i see day an amicable rupture and a smooth new arrangement she has money she was never the match for our hero never i saw it yesterday and before often and so he hands her over to thrum tum tum to thrum tum tum lady bush struck a quick march on her knee now isn't that clever guessing the shadow of a clue for me and because i know human nature one peep and i see the combination in a minute so he keeps the money in the family becomes a benefactor to his cousin by getting rid of the girl and succumbs to his fatality rather a pity he let it ebb and flow so long time counts the tides you know but it improves the story i defy any other county in the kingdom to produce one fresh and living to equal it let me tell you i suspected mr whitford and i hinted it yesterday did you indeed said mrs mountstuart humouring her excessive acuteness i really did there is that dear good man on his feet again and looks agitated again mr dale had been compelled both by the lady's voice and his interest in the subject to listen he had listened more than enough he was exceedingly nervous he held on by his chair afraid to quit his moorings and manners he said to himself unconsciously aloud 
as he cogitated on the libertine way with which these chartered great ladies of the district discussed his daughter he was heard and unnoticed the supposition if any would have been that he was admonishing himself at this juncture sir willoughby entered the drawing-room by the garden window and simultaneously dr middleton by the door End of chapter 45 Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 46 of The Egoist This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Reading by Lars Rolander the egoist a comedy in narrative by george meredith chapter forty six the scene of sir willoughby's generalship history we may fear will never know the qualities of leadership inherent in sir willoughby patern to fit him for the post of commander of an army seeing that he avoided the fatigues of the service and preferred the honours bestowed in his country upon the quiet administrators of their own estates but his possession of particular gifts which are military and especially of the proleptic mind which is the stamp and sign warrant of the heavens and general was displayed on every urgent occasion when in the midst of difficulties likely to have extinguished one less alert than he to the threatening aspect of disaster he had to manoeuvre himself he had received no intimation of mr dale's presence in his house nor of the arrival of the dreaded women lady bush and lady calmer his locked door was too great a terror to his domestics having finished with vernon after a tedious endeavour to bring the fellow to a sense of the policy of the step urged on him he walked out on the lawn with the desire to behold the opening of an interview not promising to lead too much and possibly to profit by its failure clara had been prepared according to his directions by mrs mountstuart jenkinson as vernon had been prepared by him his wishes candidly and kindly expressed both to vernon and mrs mountstuart were that since the girl appeared disinclined to make him a happy man she would make one of his cousin intimating to mrs mountstuart that he would be happier without her he alluded to the benefit of the girl's money to poor old vernon the general escape from its scandal if old vernon could manage to catch her as she dropped the harmonious arrangement it would be for all parties and only on the condition of her taking vernon would he consent to give her up this he said imperatively adding that such was the meaning of the news she had received relating to letitia dale from what quarter had she received it he asked she shuffled in her reply made a gesture to signify that it was in the air universal and fell upon the proposed arrangement he would listen to none of mrs mountstuart's woman of the world instances of the folly of pressing it upon a girl who had shown herself a girl of spirit she foretold the failure he would not be advised he said it is my scheme and perhaps the look of mad benevolence about it induced the lady to try whether there was a chance that it would hit the madness in our nature and somehow succeed or lead to pacification sir willoughby condescended to arrange things thus for clara's good he would then proceed to realize his own such was the face he put upon it we can wear what appearance we please before the world until we are found out nor is the world's praise knocking upon hollowness always hollow music but mrs mountstuart's laudation of his kindness and simplicity disturbed him for though he had recovered from his rebuff enough to imagine that letitia would not refuse him under the reiterated pressure he had let it be supposed that she was a submissive handmaiden 
throbbing for her elevation and mrs mountstuart's belief in it afflicted his recent bitter experience his footing was not perfectly or secure besides assuming it to be so he considered the sort of prize he had won and a spasm of downright hatred of a world for which we make mighty sacrifices to be repaid in a worn thin comparatively valueless coin troubled his counting of his gains letitia it was true had not passed through other hands in coming to him as vernon would know it to be clara's case time only had worn her but the comfort of the reflection was annoyed by the physical contrast of the two hence an unusual melancholy in his tone that mrs mountstuart thought touching it had the scenic effect on her which greatly contributes to delude the wits she talked of him to clara as being a man who had revealed an unsuspected depth vernon took the communication curiously he seemed readier to be in love with his benevolent relative than with the lady he was confused undisguisedly moved said the plan was impossible out of the question but thanked willoughby for the best of intentions thanked him warmly after saying that the plan was impossible the comical fellow allowed himself to be pushed forth on the lawn to see how miss middleton might have come out of her interview with mrs mountstuart willoughby observed mrs mountstuart meet him usher him to the place she had quitted among the shrubs and return to the open turf spaces he sprang to her she will listen mrs mountstuart said she likes him respects him thinks he is a very sincere friend clever a scholar a good mountaineer and thinks you mean very kindly so much i have impressed on her but i have not done much for mr whitford she consents to listen said willoughby snatching at that as the death-blow to his friend horace she consents to listen because you have arranged it so that if she declined she would be rather a savage you think it will have no result none at all her listening will do and you must be satisfied with it we shall see anything for peace she says and i don't say that a gentleman with a tongue would have not have a chance she wishes to please you old vernon has no tongue for women poor fellow you will have us be spider or fly and if a man can't spin a web all he can hope is not to be caught in one she knows his history too and that won't be in his favour how did she look when you left them not so bright like a bit of china that wants dusting she looked a trifle gauche it struck me more like a country girl with a hoyden taming in her than the well-bred creature she is i did not suspect her to have feeling you must remember sir willoughby that she has obeyed your wishes done her utmost i do think we may say she has made some amends and if she is to blame she repents and you will not insist too far i do insist said he beneficent but a tyrant well well he did not dislike the character they perceived dr middleton wandering over the lawn and willoughby went to him to put him on the wrong track mrs mountstuart swept into the drawing-room willoughby quitted the reverend doctor and hung about the bower where he supposed his pair of dupes had by this time ceased to stutter mutually or what if they had found the word of harmony he could bear that just bear that he rounded the shrubs and behold both had vanished the trellis decorated emptiness his idea was that they had soon discovered their inability to be turtles and desiring not to lose a moment while clara was fretted by the scene he rushed to the drawing-room with the hope of lighting on her there getting her to himself and finally urgently passionately offering her the sole alternative 
of what she had immediately rejected. Why had he not used passion before, instead of limping crippled between temper and policy? He was capable of it. As soon as imagination in him conceived his personal feelings unwounded and unimperiled, the might of it inspired him with heroical confidence, and Clara, grateful, Clara, softly moved, led him to think of Clara melted. Thus anticipating her, he burst into the room. One step there warned him that he was in the jaws of the world. We have the phrase that a man is himself under certain trying circumstances. There is no need to say it of Sir Willoughby. He was thrice himself when danger menaced. Himself inspired him. He could read at a single glance the polyphemous eye in the general head of a company. Lady Bush, Lady Calmer, Mrs. Mountstuart, Mr. Dale had a similarity in the variety of their expressions that made up one giant eye for him perfectly, if awfully, legible. He discerned the fact that his demon secret was abroad, universal. He ascribed it to fate. He was in the jaws of the world, on the world's teeth, this time he thought Letitia must have betrayed him, and bowing to Lady Bush and Lady Calmer, gallantly pressing their fingers and responding to their becks and archnesses. He ruminated on his defences before he should accost her father. He did not want to be alone with the man, and had considered how his presence might be made useful. "'I'm glad to see you, Mr. Dale. Pray be seated.' Is it nature asserting her strength, or the efficacy of medicine? I fancy it can't be both. You have brought us back to your daughter? Mr. Dale sank into a chair, unable to resist the hand forcing him. No, Sir Willoughby, no, I have not. I have not seen her since she came home this morning from Paterne. Indeed, she is unwell. I cannot say. She secludes herself. "'Has locked herself in,' said Lady Bush. Willoughby threw her a smile. It made them intimate. This was an advantage against the world, but an exposure of himself to the abominable woman. Dr. Middleton came up to Mr. Dale to apologize for not presenting his daughter Clara, whom he could find neither in nor out of the house. "'We have in Mr. Dale, I suspected,' he said to Willoughby, "'a stout alley.' "'If I may beg two minutes with you, Sir Willoughby,' said Mr. Dale. "'Your visits are too rare for me to allow of your numbering the minutes,' Willoughby replied. "'We cannot let Mr. Dale escape us now that we have him, I think, Dr. Middleton.' "'Not without a ransom,' said the Reverend Doctor. Mr. Dale shook his head. My strength, Sir Willoughby, will not sustain me long. You are at home, Mr. Dale. Not far from home, in truth, but too far for an invalid beginning to grow sensible of weakness. You will regard Patern as your home, Mr. Dale, Willoughby repeated for the world to hear. Unconditionally, Dr. Milliton inquired, with a humorous air of dissenting. Willoughby gave him a look that was coldly courteous, and then he looked at Lady Bush. She nodded imperceptibly. Her eyebrows rose, and Willoughby returned a similar nod. Translated the signs ran thus. Pestered by the reverend gentleman, I see you are. Is the story I have heard correct? Possibly it may err in a few details. This was fettering himself in loose manacles. But Lady Bush would not be satisfied with the compliment of the intimate looks and nods. She thought she might still be behind Mrs. Mountstuart, and she was a bold woman, and anxious about him, half crazed by the riddle of the pot she was boiling in, and having very few minutes to spare. Not extremely reticent by nature, privileged by station, and made intimate with him by his covert looks, she stood up to him. 
one word to an old friend which is the father of the fortunate creature i don't know how to behave to them no time was afforded him to be disgusted with her vulgarity and audacity he replied feeling her rivet his givis the house will be empty to-morrow i see a decent withdrawal and very well cloaked we had a tale here of her running off to decline the honour afraid on her dignity or something how was it that the woman was ready to accept the altered posture of affairs in his house if she had received a hint of them he forgot that he had prepared her in self-defence from whom did you have that he asked her father and the lady aunts declare it was the cousin she refused willoughby's brain turned over he righted it for action and crossed the room to the ladies eleanor and isabel his ears tingled he and his whole story discussed in public himself unroofed and the marvel that he of all men should be in such a tangle naked and blown on condemned to use his cunningest arts to unwind and cover himself struck him as though the lord of his kind were running the gauntlet of a legion of imps he felt their lashes the ladies were talking to mrs mountstuart and lady calmer of vernon and the suitableness of Letitia to a scholar he made sign to them and both rose it is the hour for your drive to the cottage mr dale is in she must come her sick father no delay going or returning bring her here at once poor man they sighed and willoughby said one and the other said there is a strange misconception you will do well to correct they were about to murmur what it was he swept his hand round and excusing themselves to their guests obediently they retired lady bush at his entreaty remained and took a seat beside lady calmer and mrs mountstuart she said to the latter you have tried scholars what do you think excellent but hard to mix was the reply i never make experiments said lady calmer some one must mrs mountstuart groaned over her dull dinner party lady bush consoled her at any rate the loss of a scholar is no loss to the county they are well enough in towns lady calmer said and then i am sure you must have them by themselves we have nothing to regret my opinion the voice of dr middleton in colloquy with mr dale swelled on a melodious thunder for whom else should i plead as the passionate advocate i proclaim myself to you sir there is but one man known to me who would move me to back him upon such an adventure willoughby join me i am informing mr dale willoughby stretched his hands out to mr dale to support him on his legs though he had shown no sign of a wish to rise you are feeling unwell mr dale do i look very ill sir willoughby it will pass letitia will be with us in twenty minutes mr dale struck his hands in a clasp he looked alarmingly ill and satisfactorily revealed to his host how he could be made to look so i was informing mr dale that the petitioner enjoys our concurrent good wishes and mine in no degree less than yours willoughby observed dr middleton whose pillows grew the bigger for a check. He supposed himself speaking confidentially. Ladies have the trick they have, I may say, the natural disposition for playing enigma now and again. Pressure is often a sovereign specific. Let it be tried upon her all round from every radiating line of the circle. You she refuses. Then I venture to propose myself to appeal to her my daughter has assuredly an esteem for the applicant that will animate a woman's tongue in such a case the ladies of the house will not be backward lastly if necessary we trust the lady's father to add his instances 
my prescription is to fatigue you her negatives and where no rooted objection exists i maintain it to be the unfailing receipt for the conduct of the siege no woman can say no for ever the defence has not such resources against even a single assailant and we shall have solved the problem of continuous motion before she will have learnt to deny in perpetuity that i stand on willoughby glanced at mrs mountstuart what is that she said treason to our sex dr middleton i think i heard that no woman can say no for ever remarked lady bush to a loyal gentleman ma'am assuming the field of the recurring request to be not unholy ground consecrated to affirmatives rather dr middleton was attacked by three angry bees they made him say yes and no alternately so many times that he had to admit in men a shiftier yieldingness than women were charged with willoughby gesticulated as mute chorus on the side of the ladies and a little show of party spirit like that coming upon their excitement under the topic inclined them to him genially he drew mr dale away while the conflict subsided in sharp snaps of rifles and an interval rejoinder of a cannon mr dale had shown by signs that he was growing fretfully restive under his burden of doubt sir willoughby i have a question i beg you to lead me where i may ask it i know my head is weak mr dale it is answered when i say that my house is your home and that letitia will soon be with us then this report is true i know nothing of reports you are answered can my daughter be accused of any shadow of falseness dishonourable dealing as little as i mr dale scanned his face he saw no shadow for i should go to my grave bankrupt if that could be said of her and i have never yet felt poor though you know the extent of a pensioner's income then this tale of refusal is nonsense she has accepted there are situations mr dale too delicate to be clothed in positive definitions ah sir willoughby but it becomes a father to see that his daughter is not forced into delicate situations i hope all is well i am confused it may be my head she puzzles me you are not can i ask it here you are quite will you moderate my anxiety my infirmities must excuse me sir willoughby conveyed by a shake of the head and a pressure of mr dale's hand that he was not and that he was quite dr middleton said mr dale he leaves us to-morrow really the invalid wore a look as if wine had been poured into him he routed his host's calculations by calling to the reverend doctor we are to lose you sir willoughby attempted an interposition but dr middleton crashed through it like the lordly organ swallowing a flute not before i score my victory mr dale and establish my friend upon his rightful throne you do not leave to-morrow sir have you heard sir that i leave to-morrow mr dale turned to sir willoughby the latter said clara named to-day to-morrow i thought preferable ah dr middleton towered on the swelling exclamation but with no dark light he radiated splendidly yes then to-morrow that is if we subdue the lady he advanced to willoughby seized his hand squeezed it thanked him praised him he spoke under his breath for a wonder but we are in your debt lastingly my friend was heard and he was impressive he seemed subdued and saying aloud though i should wish to aid in the reduction of that fortress he let it be seen that his mind was rid of a load dr middleton partly stupefied willoughby by his way of taking it 
but his conduct was too serviceable to allow of speculation on his readiness to break the match. It was the turning point of the engagement. Lady Bush made a stir. I cannot keep my horses waiting any longer, she said and beckoned. Sir Willoughby was beside her immediately. You are admirably perfect. Don't ask me to hold my tongue. I retract. I recant. It is a fatality. I have resolved upon that view. You could stand the shot of beauty, not of brains. That is our report. There. And it's delicious to feel that the county wins you. No tea. I cannot possibly wait. And, oh, here she is. I must have a look at her, my dear Letitia Dale. Willoughby hurried to Mr. Dale. You are not to be excited, sir. Compose yourself. You will recover and be strong to-morrow. You are at home. You are in your own house. You are in Letitia's drawing-room. All will be clear to-morrow. Till to-morrow we talk riddles by consent. Sit, I beg. You stay with us. He met Letitia and rescued her from Lady Bush, murmuring with the air of a lover who says, My love, my sweet, that she had done rightly to come and come at once. Her father had been thrown into the proper condition of clammy nervousness to create the impression. Letitia's anxiety sat prettily on her long eyelashes as she bent over him in his chair. Hereupon Dr. Corney appeared, and his name had a bracing effect on Mr. Dale. "'Corney has come to drive me to the cottage,' he said. "'I'm ashamed of this public exhibition of myself, my dear. Let us go. My head is a poor one.' Dr. Corney had been intercepted. He broke from Sir Willoughby with a dozen little nods of accurate understanding of him even to beyond the mark of the communications. He touched his patient's pulse lightly, briefly sighed with professional composure, and pronounced, Rest must not be moved. No, no, nothing serious. He quieted Letitia's fears. But rest, rest. A change of residence for a night will tone him. I will bring him a draught in the course of the evening. Yes, yes, I'll fetch everything wanted from the cottage for you and for him. Repose on Corney's forethought. You are sure, Dr. Corney? said Letitia, frightened on her father's account and on her own. Which aspect will be the best for Mr. Dale's bedroom? the hospitable ladies Eleanor and Isabel inquired. Southeast decidedly, let him have the morning sun, a warm air, a vigorous air, and a bright air, and the patient wakes and sings in his bed. Still doubtful whether she was in a trap, Letitia whispered to her father of the privacy and comforts of his home. He replied to her that he thought he would rather be in his own home. Dr. Corney positively pronounced no to it. Letitia breathed again of home, but with the sight of one overborne. The ladies Eleanor and Isabel took the word from Willoughby and said, "'But you are at home, my dear. This is your home. Your father will be at least as well attended here as at the cottage.' She raised her eyelids on them mournfully, and by chance diverted her look to Dr. Middleton quite by chance. It spoke eloquently to the assembly of all that Willoughby desired to be imagined. "'But there is cross, Jay,' she cried. "'My cousin has gone, and the boy is left alone. I cannot have him left alone. If we, if, Dr. Corney, you are sure it is unsafe for Papa to be moved to-day, cross Jay must. He cannot be left.' "'Bring him with you, Corney,' said Sir Willoughby and the little doctor heartily promised that he would, in the event of his finding Crossjay at the cottage, which he thought a distant probability. "'He gave me his word he would not go out till my return,' said Letitia. "'And if Crossjay gave you his word,' the accent of a new voice vibrated close by, 
be certain that he will not come back with dr corney unless he has authority in your handwriting clara middleton stepped gently to letitia and with a manner that was an embrace as much as kissed her for what she was doing on behalf of crossjay she put her lips in a pouting form to simulate saying press it he is to come said letitia then write him his permit there was a chatter about Crossjay and the sentinel true to his post that he could be, during which Letitia distressfully scribbled a line for Dr. Corney to deliver to him. Clara stood near. She had rebuked herself for want of reserve in the presence of Lady Bush and Lady Calmer, and she was guilty of a slightly excessive containment when she next addressed Letitia. It was, like Letitia's look at Dr. Middleton, opportune enough to make a man who watched as willoughby did a fatalist for life the shadow of a difference in her bearing toward letitia sufficed to impute acting either to her present coolness or her previous warmth better still when dr middleton said so we leave to-morrow my dear and i hope you have written to the daltons clara flushed and beamed and repressed her animation on a sudden with one grave look that might be thought regretful to where willoughby stood chance works for us when we are good captains willoughby's pride was high though he knew himself to be keeping it up like a fearfully dexterous juggler and for an empty reward but he was in the toils of the world have you written the post-bag leaves in half an hour he addressed her we are expected but i'll write she replied and her not having yet written counted in his favour she went to write the letter dr corney had departed on his mission to fetch crossjay and medicine lady bush was impatient to be gone corney she said to lady calmer is a deadly gossip inveterate was the answer my poor horses not the young pair of bays luckily they are my dear and don't let me hear of dining to-night sir willoughby was leading out mr dale to a quiet room contiguous to the invalid gentleman's bedchamber he resigned him to letitia in the hall that he might have the pleasure of conducting the ladies to their carriage as little agitation as possible corney will soon be back he said bitterly admiring the graceful subservience of letitia's figure to her father's weight on her arm he had won a desperate battle but what had he won what had the world given him in return for his efforts to gain it just a shirt it might be said simple scanty clothing no warmth lady bush was unbearable she gabbled she was ill-bred permitted herself to speak of dr middleton as ineligible no loss to the county and mrs mountstuart was hardly much above her with her inevitable stroke of caricature you see dr middleton's pulpit scampering after him with legs Perhaps the reverend doctor did punish the world for his having forsaken his pulpit, and might be conceived as haunted by it at his heels. But Willoughby was in the mood to abhor comic images. He hated the perpetrators of them and the grinners. Contempt of this laughing empty world, for which he had performed a monstrous immolation, led him to associate Dr. Middleton in his mind and clara too with the desirable things he had sacrificed a shape of youth and health a sparkling companion a face of innumerable charms and his own veracity his inner sense of his dignity and his temper and the limpid frankness of his air of scorn that was to him a visage of candid happiness in the dim retrospect Haply also he had sacrificed more. He looked scientifically into the future. He might have sacrificed a nameless more. And for what? he asked again. 
for the favourable looks and tongues of these women, whose looks and tongues he detested. Dr. Middleton says he is indebted to me. I am deeply in his debt, he remarked. It is we who are in your debt for a lovely romance, my dear Sir Willoughby, said Lady Bush, incapable of taking a correction. So thoroughly had he imbued her with his fiction, or with the belief that she had a good story to circulate. Away she drove, rattling her tongue to Lady Calmer. A hat and horn, and she would be in the old figure of a postboy on a you and cry sheet, said Mrs. Mountstuart. Willoughby thanked the great lady for her services, and she complimented the polished gentleman of his noble self-possession. But she complained at the same time of being defrauded of her charmer, Colonel de Cray, since luncheon. An absence of warmth in her compliment caused Willoughby to shrink and think the wretched shirt he had got from the world no covering after all. A breath flapped it. "'He comes to me to-morrow, I believe,' she said, reflecting on her superior knowledge of the facts in comparison with Lady Bush, who would presently be hearing of something novel and exclaiming. "'So that is why you patronized the Colonel?' and it was nothing of the sort for mrs mountstuart could honestly say she was not the woman to make a business of her pleasure horace is an enviable fellow said willoughby wise in the book which bids us ever for an assuagement to fancy our friend's condition worse than our own and recommends the deglution of irony as the most balsamic for wounds in the whole moral pharmacopoeia i don't know she replied with a marked accent of deliberation the colonel is to have you to himself to-morrow i can't be sure of what i shall have in the colonel your perpetual sparkler mrs mountstuart set her head in motion she left the matter silent i'll come for him in the morning she said and her carriage whirled her off Either she had guessed it, or Clara had confined it to her, the treacherous passion of Horace de Cray. However, the world was shut away from Patern for the night. End of chapter 46 Read by Lars Rolander Chapter forty seven of the Egoist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Egoist, a comedy in narrative by George Meredith. Chapter forty seven. Sir Willoughby and his friend Horace de Cray. Willoughby shut himself up in his laboratory to broad a while after the conflict. Sounding through himself, as it was habitual with him to do, for the plan most agreeable to his taste, he came on a strange discovery among the lower circles of that microcosm. He was no longer guided in his choice by liking and appetite. He had to put it on the edge of a sharp discrimination and try it by his acutest judgment before it was acceptable to his heart. And knowing well the direction of his desire, he was nevertheless unable to run two strides on a wish. He had learned to read the world. His partial capacity for reading persons had fled. The mysteries of his own bosom were bare to him, but he could comprehend them only in their immediate relation to the world outside. This hateful world had caught him and transformed him to a machine. The discovery he made was that in the gratification of the egoistic instinct we may so beset ourselves as to deal a slaughtering wound upon self to whatsoever quarter we turn. Surely there is nothing stranger in mortal experience. The man was confounded. 
at the game of chess it is the dishonour of our adversary when we are stalemated but in life combating the world such a winning of the game questions our sentiments willoughby's interpretation of his discovery was directed by pity he had no other strong emotion left in him he pitied himself and he reached the conclusion that he suffered because he was active he could not be quiescent had it not been for his devotion to his house and name never would he have stood twice the victim of womankind had he been selfish he would have been the happiest of men he said it aloud he schemed benevolently for his unborn young and for the persons about him hence he was in a position forbidding a step under pain of injury to his feelings he was generous otherwise would he not in scorn of soul at the outset straight off have pitched clara middleton to the wanton winds he was faithful in his affection Letitia dale was beneath his roof to prove it both these women were examples of his power of forgiveness and now a tender word to clara might fasten shame on him such was her gratitude and if he did not marry Letitia, laughter would be devilish all around him such was the world's probably vernon would not long be thankful for the chance which varied the monotony of his days what of horace willoughby stripped to enter the ring with horace he cast away disguise that man had been the first to divide him in the all but equal slices of his egoistic from his amatory self murder of his individuality was the crime of horace de Cray and further suspicion fixed on horace he knew not how except that the book bids us be suspicious of those we hate as the man who had betrayed his recent dealings with Letitia. willoughby walked the thoroughfares of the house to meet clara and make certain of her either for himself or if it must be for vernon before he took another step with Letitia dale clara could reunite him turn him once more into a whole and an animated man and she might be willing her willingness to listen to vernon promised it a gentleman with a tongue would have a chance mrs mountstuart had said how much greater the chance of a lover for he had not yet supplicated her he had shown pride and temper he could woo he was a torrential wooer and it would be glorious to swing round on lady bush and the world with clara nestling under his arm and protest astonishment at the erroneous and utterly unfounded anticipations of any other development and it would righteously punish Letitia. clara came downstairs bearing her letters to miss darleton must it be post willoughby said meeting her in the hall they expect us any day but it will be more comfortable for papa was her answer she looked kindly in her new shyness she did not seem to think he had treated her contemptuously in flinging her to his cousin which was odd you have seen vernon it was your wish you had a talk we conversed a long one we walked some distance clara i tried to make the best arrangement i could your intention was generous he took no advantage of it it could not be treated seriously it was meant seriously there i see the generosity willoughby thought this encomium and her consent to speak on the subject and her scarcely embarrassed air and richness of tone in speaking were strange and strange was her taking him quite in earnest apparently she had no feminine sensation of the unwontedness and the absurdity of the matter but clara am i to understand that he did not speak out we are excellent friends to miss it though his chance were the smallest you forget that it may not wear that appearance to him he spoke not one word of himself no 
Ah, the poor fellow was taught to see it was hopeless, chilled. May I plead? Will you step into the laboratory for a minute? We are two sensible persons. Pardon me, I must go to papa. Vernon's personal history, perhaps? I think it honourable to him. Honourable? Him? By comparison? Comparison with what? With others. He drew up to relieve himself of a critical and condemnatory expiration of a certain length. This young lady knew too much, but how physically exquisite she was. Could you, Clara, could you promise me? I hold to it. I must have it. I know his shy tricks. Promise me to give him ultimately another chance? Is the idea repulsive to you? It is one not to be thought of. It is not repulsive? Nothing could be repulsive in Mr. Whitford. I have no wish to annoy you, Clara. I feel bound to listen to you, Willoughby. Whatever I can do to please you, I will. It's my lifelong duty. Could you, Clara, could you conceive it, could you simply conceive it, give him your hand? As a friend, oh, yes. In marriage? She paused. She, so penetrative of him when he opposed her, was hoodwinked when he softened her feelings, for the heart, though the clearest is not the most constant instructor of the head, the heart, unlike the often obtuser head, works for itself, and not for the commonwealth. "'You are so kind. I would do much,' she said. "'Would you accept him, marry him? He is poor.' I'm not ambitious of wealth. Would you marry him? Marriage is not in my thoughts. But could you marry him? Willoughby expected no. In his expectation of it he hung inflated. She said these words. I could engage to marry no one else. His amazement breathed without a syllable. He flapped his arms, resembling for the moment those birds of enormous body, which attempt a rise upon their wings and achieve a hop. Would you engage it? he said, content to see himself stepped on as an insect, if he could but feel the agony of his false friend horrors. Their common pretensions to win her were now of that comparative size. Oh, there can be no necessity, and an oath, no said clara inwardly shivering at the recollection but you could my wish is to please you you could i said so it has been known to the patriotic mountaineer of a hoary pile of winters with little life remaining in him but that little on fire for his country that by the brink of the precipice he has flung himself on a young and lusty invader dedicating himself exultingly to death if only he may score a point for his country by extinguishing in his country's enemy the stronger man so likewise did willoughby in the blow that deprived him of hope exult in the toppling over of horace de craye they perished together but which one sublimely relished the headlong descent and Vernon, taken by Clara, would be Vernon simply tolerated, and Clara, taken by Vernon, would be Clara, previously touched, smirched. Altogether he could enjoy his fall. It was at least upon a comfortable bed, where his pride would be dressed daily, and would never be disagreeably treated. He was henceforth Letitia's own. The bell-telling of Dr. Corney's return was a welcome sound to Willoughby, and he said good-humouredly, Wait, Clara, you will see your hero, Crossjay. Crossjay and Dr. Corney tumbled into the hall. Willoughby caught Crossjay under the arms to give him a lift in the old fashion, pleasing to Clara to see. The boy was heavy as lead. I had work to hook him and worse to net him, said Dr. Corney. I had to make him believe he was to nurse every soul in the house, you among them, Miss Middleton. 
Willoughby pulled the boy aside. Crossjay came back to Clara heavier in looks than his limbs had been. She dropped her letter in the hall box and took his hand to have a private hug of him. When they were alone, she said, Crossjay, my dear, my dear, you look unhappy. Yes, and who wouldn't be, and you're not to marry Sir Willoughby. His voice threatened a cry. I know you're not, for Dr. Corney says you are going to leave. Did you so very much wish it, Crossjay? I should have seen a lot of you, and I shan't see you at all, and I'm sure if I'd known I wouldn't have, and he has been and tipped me this. Crossjay opened his fist in which lay three gold pieces. That was very kind of him, said Clara. Yes, but how can I keep it? By handing it to Mr. Whitford to keep for you. Yes, but Miss Middleton, oughtn't I to tell him? I mean, Sir Willoughby. What? Why, that I, Crossjay, got close to her. Why, that I, that I, you know, what you used to say. I wouldn't tell a lie, but oughtn't I, without his asking? And this money? I don't mind being turned out again. Consult Mr. Whitford, said Clara. I know what you think, though. Perhaps you had better not say anything at present, dear boy. But what am I to do with this money? Crossjay held the gold pieces out as things that had not yet mingled with his ideas of possession. I listened and I told of him, he said. I couldn't help listening, but I went and told. And I don't like being here, and his money, and he not knowing what I did. Haven't you heard? I'm certain I know what you think, and so do I, and I must take my luck. I'm always in mischief, getting into mess or getting out of it. I don't mind, I really don't, Miss Middleton. I can sleep in a tree quite comfortably. If you're not going to be here, I'd just as soon be anywhere. I must try to earn my living some day, and why not a cabin boy? Sir Cloudsley Shovel was no better. And I don't mind his being wrecked at last if you drowned an admiral. So I shall go and ask him to take his money back, and if he asks me I shall tell him, and there. You know what it is. I guess that from what Dr. Corney said. I'm sure I know you're thinking what's manly. Fancy me keeping his money, and you not marrying him. I wouldn't mind driving a plough. I shouldn't make a bad gamekeeper. Of course, I love boats best, but you can't have everything. Speak to Mr. Whitford first, said Clara too proud of the boy for growing as she had trained him, to advise a course of conduct opposed to his notions of manliness, though now that her battle was over she would gladly have acquiesced in little posuistic compromises for the sake of general peace. Some time later Vernon and Dr. Corney were arguing upon the question. Corney was dead against the sentimental view of the morality of the case propounded by Vernon as coming from Miss Middleton, and partly shared by him. If it is on the boy's mind, Vernon said, I can't prohibit his going to Willoughby and making a clean breast of it, especially as it involves me, and sooner or later I should have to tell him myself. Dr. Corney said no at all points. Now hear me, he said finally, this is between ourselves, and no breach of confidence which I'd not be guilty of for forty friends, though I'd give my hand from the wrist joint for one. My left, that's to say. Sir Willoughby puts me one or two searching interrogations on a point of interest to him, his house and name. Very well, and good night to that. And I wish Miss Dale had been ten years younger, or had passed the ten with no heart-strings and sinkings wearing to the tissues of the frame and the moral fibre to boot. She'll have a fairish health, with a little occasional doctoring, taking her rank and wealth in right earnest, 
and shying her pen back to Mother Goose. She'll do. And by the way, I think it is to the credit of my sagacity that I fetched Mr. Dale here fully primed, and roused the neighborhood, which I did, and so fixed our gentleman, neat as a prodded eel on a pair of prongs, namely the positive fact and the general knowledge of it. But mark me, my friend, we understand one another at a nod. This boy, young Squire Crossjay, is a good, stiff, hearty kind of a Saxon boy, out of whom you may cut as gallant a fellow as ever more epaulets. I like him, you like him, Miss Dale and Miss Middleton like him, and Sir Willoughby Patern of Patern Hall and other places won't be indisposed to like him mightily in the event of the sun being seen to shine upon him with a particular determination to make him appear a prominent object because a solitary and a patern. Dr. Corney lifted his chest and his finger. Now mark me, and verbum sup. Crossjay must not offend Sir Willoughby. I say no more. Look ahead. Miracles happen, but it is best to reckon that they won't. Well, now, and Miss Dale. She'll not be cruel. It appears as if she would, said Vernon, meditating on the cloudy sketch Dr. Corney had drawn. She can't, my friend. Her position's precarious, her father has little besides a pension, and her writing damages her health. She can't, and she likes the baronet. Oh, it's only a little fit of proud blood. She's the woman for him. She'll manage him. Give him an idea, he's got a lot of ideas. It'd kill her father if she were obstinate. He talked to me when I told him of the business, about his dream fulfilled. And if the dream turns to vapour, he'll be another example that we hang more upon dreams than realities for nourishment, and medicine too. Last week I couldn't have got him out of his house, with all my art and science. Oh, she'll come round. Her father prophesied this, and I'll prophesy that she's fond of him. She was. She sees through him. Without quite doing justice to him now, said Vernon. He can be generous in his way. How? Corn inquired, and was informed that he should hear in time to come. Meanwhile Colonel de Craye, after hovering over the park and about the cottage for the opportunity of pouncing on Miss Middleton alone, had returned crestfallen for once, and plumped into Willoughby's hands. "'My dear Horace,' Willoughby said, "'I've been looking for you all the afternoon. The fact is, I fancy you'll think yourself lured down here on false pretenses.' But the truth is, I am not so much to blame as the world will suppose. In point of fact, to be brief, Miss Dale and I... I never consult other men how they would have acted. The fact of the matter is, Miss Middleton, I fancy you have partly guessed it. Partly, said de Craye. Well, she has a liking that way, and if it should turn out strong enough, it's the best arrangement I can think of. The lively play of the colonel's features fixed in a blank inquiry. One can back a good friend for making a good husband, said Willoughby. I could not break with her in the present stage of affairs without seeing to that. And I can speak of her highly, though she and I have seen in time that we do not suit one another. My wife must have brains. I have always thought it, said Colonel de Craye, glistening and looking hungry as a wolf through his wonderment. There will not be a word against her, you understand. You know my dislike of tattle and gossip. However, let it fall on me, my shoulders are broad. I have done my utmost to persuade her, and there seems a likelihood of her consenting. She tells me her wish is to please me, and this will please me. "'Certainly. Who's the gentleman?' "'My best friend, I tell you. I could hardly have proposed another. 
allow this business to go on smoothly just now. There was an uproar within the colonel to blind his wits, and Willoughby looked so friendly that it was possible to suppose the man of projects had mentioned his best friend to Miss Middleton. And who was the best friend? Not having accused himself of treachery, the quick-eyed colonel was duped. Have you his name handy, Willoughby? That would be unfair to him at present, Horace. Ask yourself and to her. Things are in a ticklish posture at present. Don't be hasty. Certainly, I don't ask. Initials will do. You have a remarkable aptitude for guessing, Horace, and this case offers you no tough problem, if ever you acknowledge toughness. I have regard for her and for him, for both pretty equally. You know I have, and I should be thoughtfully thankful to bring the matter about. Lordly, said de Cray. I don't see it. I call it sensible. Oh, undoubtedly. The style, I mean, tolerably antique. Novel, I should say, and not the worse for that. We want plain practical dealings between men and women. Usually we go the wrong way to work and I loathe sentimental rubbish. De Cray hummed an air. But the lady, said he, I told you there seems a likelihood of her consenting. Willoughby's fish gave a perceptible little leap now that he had been taught to exercise his aptitude for guessing. Without any of the customer preliminaries on the side of the gentleman, he said, we must put him through his paces, friend Horace. He's a notorious blunderer with women, hasn't a word for them, never marked a conquest. De Cray crested his plumes under the agreeable banter. He presented a face humorously sceptical. The lady is positively not indisposed to give the poor fellow a hearing? I have cause to think she is not, said Willoughby glad of acting the indifference to her which could talk of her inclinations cause good cause bless us as good as one can have with a woman ah i assure you ah does it seem like her though well she wouldn't engage herself to accept him well that seems more like her but she said she could engage to marry no one else the colonel sprang up, crying, "'Clara Middleton said it?' he curbed himself. "'That's a bit of wonderful compliancy.' "'She wishes to please me. We separate on those terms, and I wish her happiness. I've developed a heart lately and taken to think of others.' "'Nothing better. You appear to make cocksure of the other party, our friend?' "'You know him too well, Horace, to doubt his readiness.' Do you, Willoughby? She has money and good looks, yes, I can say I do. It wouldn't be much of a man who'd want hard pulling to that lighted altar. And if he requires persuasion, you and I, Horace, might bring him to his senses. Kicking, it would be. I like to see everybody happy about me, said Willoughby, naming the hour as time to dress for dinner. The sentiment he had delivered was de Cray's excuse for grasping his hand and complimenting him, but the colonel betrayed himself by doing it with extreme fervour, almost tremulous. "'When shall we hear more?' he said. "'Oh, probably to-morrow,' said Willoughby. "'Don't be in such a hurry.' "'I'm an infant asleep,' the colonel replied, departing. He resembled one to Willoughby's mind, or a traitor, drugged. There is a fellow I thought had some brains. Who are not fools to beset spinning if we choose to whip them with their vanity? It is the consolation of the great to watch them spin. But the pleasure is loftier and may comfort our unmerited misfortune for a while in making a false friend drunk. Willoughby, among his many preoccupations, had the satisfaction of seeing the effect of drunkenness on Horace de Cray, 
when the latter was in clara's presence he could have laughed cut in keen epigram where the marginal notes added by him to that chapter of the book which treats of friends and a woman and had he not been profoundly preoccupied troubled by recent intelligence communicated by the ladies his aunts he would have played the two together for the royal amusement afforded him by his friend horace End of chapter 47 Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 48 of The Egoist This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Reading by Lars Rolander the egoist a comedy in narrative by george meredith chapter forty eight the lovers the hours was close upon eleven at night letitia sat in the room adjoining her father's bedchamber her elbow was on the table beside her chair and two fingers pressed her temples the state between thinking and feeling when both are molten and flow by us is one of our nature's coming after thought has quieted the fiery nerves and can do no more she seemed to be meditating she was conscious only of a struggle past she answered a tap at the door and raised her eyes on clara clara stepped softly mr dale is asleep i hope so ah dear friend Letitia let her hand be pressed. Have you had a pleasant evening? Mr. Whitford and Papa have gone to the library. Colonel de Cray has been singing? Yes, with a voice. I thought of you upstairs, but I could not ask him to sing piano. He is probably exhilarated. One would suppose it. He sang well. You are not aware of any reason? It cannot concern me. Clara was in rosy colour, but could meet a steady gaze. And Crossier has gone to bed? Long since. He was at dessert. He would not touch anything. He is a strange boy. Not very strange, Letitia. He did not come to me to wish me good night. That is not strange. It is his habit at the cottage and here and he professes to like me oh he does i may have wakened his enthusiasm but you he loves why do you say it is not strange clara he fears you a little and why should crossier fear me dear i will tell you last night you will forgive him for it was by accident his own bedroom door was locked and he ran down to the drawing-room and curled himself up on the ottoman and fell asleep under that padded silken coverlet of the ladies boots and all i'm afraid letitia profited by this absurd illusion thanking clara in her heart for the refuge he should have taken off his boots she said he slept there and woke up dear he meant no harm next day he repeated what he had heard you will blame him he meant well in his poor boy's head and now it is over the county oh do not frown that explains lady bush exclaimed letitia dear dear friend said clara why i presume on your tenderness for me but let me to-morrow i go why will you reject your happiness those kind good ladies are deeply troubled they say your resolution is inflexible you resist their entreaties and your father's can it be that you have any doubt of the strength of this attachment i have none i have never had a doubt that it was the strongest of his feelings if before i go i could see you both happy i should be relieved i should rejoice Letitia said quietly, 
Do you remember a walk we had one day together to the cottage? Clara put up her hands with the motion of intending to stop her ears. Before I go, said she, if I might know this was to be, which all desire before I leave, I should not feel as I do now. I long to see you happy. Him, yes, him too. Is it like asking you to pay my debt? Then please, but no, I am not more than partly selfish on this occasion. He has won my gratitude. He can be really generous. An egoist? Who is? You have forgotten our conversation on the day of our walk to the cottage? Help me to forget it that day and those days and all those days i should be glad to think i passed a time beneath the earth and have risen again i was the egoist i am sure if i had been buried i should not have stood up seeing myself more vilely stained soiled disfigured oh help me to forget my conduct letitia he and i were unsuited and I remember I blame myself then. You and he are not, and now I can perceive the pride that can be felt in him. The worst that can be said is that he schemes too much. Is there any fresh scheme? said Letitia. The rose came over Clara's face. You have not heard? It was impossible, but it was kindly intended judging by my own feeling at this moment i can understand his we love to see our friends established letitia bowed my curiosity is piqued of course dear friend to-morrow we shall be parted i trust to be thought of by you as a little better in grain than i have appeared and my reason for trusting it is that i know i have been always honest a boorish young woman in my stupid mad impatience but not insincere it is no lofty ambition to desire to be remembered in that character but such is your clara she discovers i will tell you it is his wish his wish that i should promise to give my hand to Mr. Whitford. You see the kindness. Letitia's eyes widened and fixed. You think it kindness? The intention. He sent Mr. Whitford to me, and I was taught to expect him. Was that quite kind to Mr. Whitford? What an impression I must have made on you during that walk to the cottage, Letitia. I do not wonder. I was in a fever. You consented to listen? I really did. It astonishes me now, but I thought I could not refuse. My poor friend Vernon Whitford tried a love speech? He? No, oh no. You discouraged him? I? No gently i mean no surely you did not dream of trifling he has a deep heart has he you ask that and you know something of him he did not expose it to me dear not even the surface of the mighty deep letitia knitted her brows no said clara not a coquette she is not a coquette i assure you with a laugh, Letitia replied, You have still the dreadful power you made me feel that day. I wish I could use it to good purpose. He did not speak? Of Switzerland, Tyrol, the Iliad, Antigone. That was all? No, political economy. Our situation, you will own, was unexampled, or mine was. Are you interested in me? I should be, if I knew your sentiments. I was grateful to Sir Willoughby, greed for Mr. Whitford. Real grief? 
because the task unposed on him of showing me politely that he did not enter into his cousin's ideas was evidently very great extremely burdensome you so quick-eyed in some things clara he felt for me i saw that in his avoidance of and he was as he always is pleasant we rambled over the park for i know not how long though it did not seem long never touching that subject not ever neighbouring it dear a gentleman should esteem the girl he would ask certain questions i fancy he has a liking for me as a volatile friend if he had offered himself despising me you can be childish clara probably you delight to tease he had his time of it and it is now my turn but he must despise me a little are you blind perhaps dear we both are a little the ladies looked deeper into one another will you answer me said letitia your if if he had it would have been an act of condescension you are too slippery stay dear letitia he was considerate in forbearing to pain me that is an answer you allowed him to perceive that it would have pained you dearest if i may convey to you what i was in a simile for comparison i think i was like a fisherman's float on the water perfectly still and ready to go down at any instant or up so much for my behaviour similes have the merit of satisfying the finder of them and cheating the hearer said letitia you admit that your feelings would have been painful i was a fisherman's float please admire my simile any way you like this way or that or so quiet as to tempt the eyes to go to sleep and suddenly i might have disappeared in the depth or flown in the air but no fish bit well then to follow you supposing the fish or the fisherman for i do not know which is which oh no no this is too serious for imagery i am to understand that you thanked him at least for his reserve yes without the slightest encouragement to him to break it a fisherman's float letitia baffled and sighing letitia kept silence for a space the simile chaffed her wits with the suspicion of a meaning hidden in it if he had spoken she said he is too truthful a man and the railings of men at pussy women who wind about and will not be brought to a mark become intelligible to me then letitia if he had spoken if and one could have imagined him sincere so truthful a man i'm looking at myself if why then i should have burned to death with shame where have i read some story of an inextinguishable spark that would have been shot into my heart shame clara you are free as much as remains of me i could imagine a certain shame in such a position where there was no feeling but pride i could not imagine it where there was no feeling but pride letitia mused and you dwell on the kindness of a proposition so extraordinary gaining some light impatiently she cried vernon loves you do not say it i have seen it i have never had a sign of it there is the proof when it might have been shown again and again the greater proof why did he not speak when he was privileged strangely but privileged he feared me feared to wound you 
and himself as well possibly men may be pardoned for thinking of themselves in these cases but why should he fear that another was dearer to you what cause had i given ah i see he could fear that suspect it see his opinion of me can he care for such a girl abuse me letitia i should like a good round of abuse i need purification by fire what have i been in this house i have a sense of whirling through it like a mad woman and to be loved after it all no we must be hearing a tale of an antiquary prizing a battered relic of the battlefield that no one else would look at to be loved i see is to feel our littleness hollowness feel shame we come out in all our spots never to have given me one sign when a lover would have been so tempted let me be incredulous my own dear letitia because he is a man of honour you would say but are you unconscious of the torture you inflict for if i am you say it loved by this gentleman what an object it is he loves that has gone clamouring about more immodestly than women will bear to hear of and she herself to think of oh i have seen my own heart it is a frightful spectre i have seen a weakness in me that would have carried me anywhere and truly i shall be charitable to women i have gained that but loved by vernon whitford the miserable little me to be taken up and loved after tearing myself to pieces have you been simply speculating you have no positive knowledge of it why do you kiss me why do you tremble and blush so clara looked at her as clearly as she could she bowed her head it makes my conduct worse she received a tenderer kiss for that it was her avowal and it was understood to know that she had loved or had been ready to love him shadowed her in the retrospect ah you read me through and through said clara sliding to her for a whole embrace then there never was cause for him to fear letitia whispered clara slid her head more out of sight not that my heart but i said i have seen it and it is unworthy of him and if as i think now i could have been so rash so weak wicked unpardonable such thoughts were in me then to hear him speak would make it necessary for me to uncover myself and tell him incredible to you yes that while yes letitia all this is true and thinking of him as the noblest of men i could have welcomed any help to cut my knot so there said clara issuing from her nest with winking eyelids you see the pain i mentioned why did you not explain it to me at once dearest i wanted a century to pass and you feel that it has passed yes in purgatory with an angel by me my report of the place will be favourable good angel i have yet to say something say it and expiate i think i did fancy once or twice very dimly and especially to-day properly i ought not to have had any idea but his coming to me and his not doing as another would have done seemed a gentleman of real nobleness does not carry the common light for us to read him by i wanted his voice but silence i think did tell me more if a nature like mine could only have had faith without bearing the rattle of a tongue a knock at the door caused the ladies to exchange looks letitia rose as vernon entered 
i am just going to my father for a few minutes she said and i have just come from yours vernon said to clara she observed a very threatening expression in him the sprite of contrariety mounted to her brain to indemnify her for her recent self-abasement seeing the bedroom door shut on letitia she said and of course papa has gone to bed implying otherwise yes he has gone he wished me well his formula of good night would embrace that wish and failing it will be good night for good to me clara's breathing gave a little leap we leave early to-morrow i know i have an appointment at bregenz for june so soon with papa and from there we break into tyrol and round away to the right southward to the italian alps and was it assumed that i should be of this expedition your father speaks dubiously you have spoken of me then i venture to speak of you i am not overbold as you know her lovely eyes troubled the lids to hide their softness papa should not think of my presence with him dubiously he leaves it to you to decide yes then many times all that can be uttered do you consider what you are saying mr whitford i shut my eyes and say yes beware i give you one warning if you shut your eyes of course she flew from him big mountains must be satisfied with my admiration at their feet that will do for a beginning they speak encouragingly one of them vernon's breast heaved high to be at your feet makes a mountain of you said she with the heart of a mouse if that satisfies me you tower too high you are inaccessible i give you a second warning you may be seized and lifted some one would stoop then to plant you like the flag on the conquered peak you have indeed been talking to papa mr whitford vernon changed his tone shall i tell you what he said i know his language so well he said but you have acted on it only partly he said you will teach me nothing he said vernon no oh not in this house that supplication coupled with his name confessed the end to which her quick vision perceived she was being led where she would succumb she revived the same shrinking in him from a breath of their great word yet not here somewhere in the shadow of the mountains but he was sure of her and their hands might join the two hands thought so or did not think behaved like innocents the spirit of dr middleton as clara felt had been blown into vernon rewarding him for forthright outspeaking over their books vernon had abruptly shut up a volume and related the tale of the house has this man a spice of religion in him the reverend doctor asked midway vernon made out a fair general case for his cousin in that respect the complimental dot on his eye of a commonly civilized human creature said dr middleton looking at his watch and finding it too late to leave the house before the morning the risky communication was to come vernon was proceeding with the narrative of willoughby's generous plan when dr middleton electrified him by calling out he whom of all men living i should desire my daughter to espouse and willoughby rose in the reverend doctor's esteem he praised that sensible-minded gentleman who could acquiesce in the turn of mood of a little maid albeit fortune had withheld from him a taste of the switch at school the father of the little maid's appreciation of her volatility was exhibited in his exhortation to vernon 
to be off to her at once with his authority to finish her moods and assure him of peace in the morning vernon hesitated dr middleton remarked upon being not so sure that it was not he who had done the mischief thereupon vernon to prove his honesty made his own story bare go to her said dr middleton vernon proposed a meeting in switzerland to which dr middleton assented adding go to her and as he appeared a total stranger to the decorum of the situation vernon put his delicacy aside and taking his heart up obeyed he too had pondered on clara's consent to meet him after she knew of willoughby's terms and her grave sweet manner during the ramble over the park her father's breath had been blown into him so now with nothing but the faith lying in sensation to convince him of his happy fortune and how unconvincing that may be until the mind has grasped and stamped it we experience even then when we acknowledge that we are most blessed he held her hand and if it was hard for him for both but harder for the man to restrain their particular word from a flight to heaven when the cage stood open and nature beckoned he was practised in self-mastery and she loved him the more letitia was a witness of their union of hands on her coming back to the room they promised to visit her very early in the morning neither of them conceiving that they left her to a night of storm and tears she sat meditating on clara's present appreciation of sir willoughby's generosity end of chapter forty eight read by lars rolander chapter forty nine of the egoist this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Egoist, a Comedy in Narrative by George Meredith Chapter 49 Letitia and Sir Willoughby we cannot be abettors of the tribes of imps whose revelry is in the frailties of our poor human constitution they have their place and their service and so long as we continue to be what we are now they will hang on to us restlessly plucking at the garments which cover our nakedness nor ever ceasing to twitch them and strain at them until they have stripped us for one of their horrible Walpurgis nights, when the laughter heard is of a character to render laughter frightful to the ears of men throughout the remainder of their days. But if in these festival hours under the beam of Hecate they are uncontrollable by the comic muse, she will not flatter them with her presence during the course of their insane and impious hilarities, whereof a description would be out brocken brockens and make grey malkin and paddock too intimately our familiars it shall suffice to say that from hour to hour of the midnight to the grey-eyed morn assisted at intervals by the ladies eleanor and isabel and by mr dale awakened and reawakened hearing the vehemence of his petitioning outcry to soften her obduracy sir willoughby pursued letitia with solicitations to espouse him until the inveteracy of his wooing wore the aspect of the lifelong love he raved of aroused to a state of mania he appeared he departed he returned and all the while his imps were about him and upon him riding him prompting driving inspiring him with outrageous pathos and eloquence to move any one but the dead which its object seemed to be in her torpid attention he heard them he talked to them 
caressed them, he flung them off and ran from them, and stood vanquished for them to mount him again and swarm on him. There are men thus impaunted, men who, setting their minds upon an object, must have it, breed imps. They are noted for their singularities, as their converse with the invisible and amazing distractions are called. Willoughby became aware of them that night. He said to himself upon one of his dashes into solitude, I believe I am possessed. And if he did not actually believe it, but only suspected it, or framed speech to account for the transformation he had undergone into a desperately beseeching creature, having lost acquaintance with his habitual personality, the operations of an impish host had undoubtedly smitten his consciousness. He had them in his brain, for while burning with an ardour for Letitia that incited him to frantic excesses of language and comportment, he was aware of shouts of the names of Lady Bush and Mrs. Mountstuart Jenkinson, the which, freezing him as they did, were directly the cause of his hurrying to a wilder extravagance and more headlong determination to subdue before break of day the woman he almost dreaded to behold by daylight. Though he had now passionately persuaded himself of his love of her, he could not, he felt, stand in the daylight without her. She was his morning. She was, he raved, his predestinated wife. He cried, Darling, both to her and to solitude. Every prescription of his ideal of demeanour as an example to his class and country was abandoned by the enamoured gentleman. He had lost command of his countenance. He stooped so far as to kneel and not gracefully. Nay, it is in the chronicles of the invisible host around him that in a fit of supplication upon a cry of Letitia, twice repeated, he whimpered. Let so much suffice, and indeed not without reason do the multitudes of the servants of the muse in this land of social policy avoid scenes of an inordinate wantonness which detract from the dignity of our leaders and menace human nature with confusion. Sagacious are they who conduct the individual on broad lines over familiar tracks under well-known characteristics. What men will do, and amorously-minded men will do, is less a question than what it is politic they should be shown to do. The night wore through. Letitia was bent, but had not yielded. She had been obliged to say, and how many times she could not bear to recollect, I do not love you. I have no love to give. And issuing from such a night to look again upon the face of day, she scarcely felt that she was alive. The contest was renewed by her father with the singing of the birds. Mr. Dale then produced the first serious impression she had received. He spoke of their circumstances, of his being taken from her and leaving her to poverty, in weak health, of the injury done to her health by writing for bread, and of the oppressive weight he would be relieved of by her consenting. He no longer implored her. He put the case on common ground, and he wound up, pray do not be ruthless my girl the practical statement and this adjuration incongruously to conclude it harmonized with her disordered understanding her loss of all sentiment and her desire to be kind she sighed to herself happily it is over her father was too weak to rise he fell asleep she was bound down to the house for hours, and she walked through her suite, here at the doors, there at the windows, thinking of Clara's remark, of a century passing. She had not wished it, but a light had come on her to show her what she would have supposed a century could not have effected. She saw the impossible of overnight a possible thing, 
not desirable, yet possible, wearing the features of the possible. Happily, she had resisted too firmly to be again besought. Those features of the possible once beheld allured the mind to reconsider them. Wealth gives us the power to do good on earth. Wealth enables us to see the world, the beautiful scenes of the earth. Letitia had long thirsted both for a dowering money-bag at her girdle, and the wings to fly abroad over lands which had begun to seem fabulous in her starved imagination. Then, moreover, if her sentiment for this gentleman was gone, it was only a delusion gone. Accurate sight and knowledge of him would not make a woman the less helpful mate. That was the mate he required, and he could be led. A sentimental attachment would have been serviceless to him. Not so the woman allied by a purely rational bond, and he wanted guiding. Happily, she had told him too much of her feeble health and her lovelessness to be reduced to submit to another attack. She busied herself in her room, arranging for her departure, so that no minutes might be lost after her father had breakfasted and dressed. Clara was her earliest visitor, and each asked the other whether she had slept and took the answer from the face presented to her. The rings of Letitia's eyes were very dark. Clara was her mirror, and she said, A singular object to be persecuted through a night for her hand. I know these two damp dead leaves I wear on my cheeks to remind me of midnight vigils. But you have slept well, Clara. I have slept well, and yet I could say I have not slept at all, Letitia. I was with you, dear, part in dream and part in thought, hoping to find you sensible before I go. Sensible, that is the word for me. Letitia briefly sketched the history of the night, and Clara said with a manifest sincerity that testified of her gratitude to Sir Willoughby. Could you resist him so earnest as he is? Letitia saw the human nature without sourness, and replied, I hope, Clara, you will not begin with a large stock of sentiment, for there is nothing like it for making your hard, matter-of-fact, worldly, calculating. The next visitor was Vernon, exceedingly anxious for news of Mr. Dale. Letitia went into her father's room to obtain it for him. Returning, she found them both with sad visages, and she ventured in alarm for them to ask the cause. It's this, Vernon said. Willoughby will everlastingly tease that boy to be loved by him. Perhaps, poor fellow, he had an excuse last night. Anyhow, he went into Crossier's room this morning, woke him up and talked to him, and set the lad crying. And what with one thing and another, Crossier got a berry in his throat, as he calls it and poured out everything he knew and all he had done. I needn't tell you the consequence. He has ruined himself here for good, so I must take him. Vernon glanced at Clara. You must indeed, said she. He is my boy as well as yours. No chance of pardon? It's not likely. Letitia, what can I do? Oh, what can you not do? I do not know. Teach him to forgive. Letitia's brows were heavy, and Clara forbore to torment her. She would not descend to the family breakfast table. Clara would fain have stayed to drink tea with her in her own room, but a last act of conformity was demanded of the liberated young lady. She promised to run up the moment breakfast was over. Not unnaturally, therefore, Letitia supposed it to be she to whom she gave admission, half an hour later, with a glad cry of, Come in, dear. The knock had sounded like Clara's. Sir Willoughby entered. 
He stepped forward. He seized her hands. Dear, he said. You cannot withdraw that. You call me dear. I am, I must be dear to you. The word is out, by accident or not. But by heaven, I have it, and I give it up to no one. And love me or not, marry me, and my love will bring it back to you. You have taught me I am not so strong. I must have you by my side. You have powers I did not credit you with. You are mistaken in me, Sir Willoughby, Letitia said feebly, outworn as she was. A woman who can resist me by declining to be my wife through a whole night of entreaty has the quality I need for my house, and I will batter at her ears for months with as little rest as I had last night before I surrender my chance of her. But I told you last night I want you within the twelve hours. I have staked my pride on it. By noon you are mine. You are introduced to Mrs. Mountstuart as mine, as the lady of my life and house. And to the world, I shall not let you go. You will not detain me here, Sir Willoughby? I will detain you. I will use force and guile. I will spare nothing. He raved for a term, as he had done overnight. On his growing rather breathless, Letitia said, You do not ask me for love? I do not. I pay you the higher compliment of asking for you, love or no love. My love shall be enough. Reward me or not. I am not used to be denied. But do you know what you ask for? Do you remember what I told you of myself? I am hard materialistic i have lost faith in romance the skeleton is present with me all over life and my health is not good i crave for money i should marry to be rich i should not worship you i should be a burden barely a living one irresponsive and cold conceive such a wife sir willoughby it will be you she tried to recall how this would have sung in her ears long back. Her bosom rose and fell in absolute dejection. Her ammunition of arguments against him had been expended overnight. You are so unforgiving, she said. Is it I who am? You do not know me. But you are the woman of all the world who knows me, Letitia. Can you think it better for you to be known? He was about to say other words. He checked them. I believe I do not know myself. Anything you will, only give me your hand. Give it, trust to me, you shall direct me. If I have faults, help me to obliterate them. Will you not expect me to regard them as the virtues of meaner men? You will be my wife. Letitia broke from him, crying. Your wife, your critic. Oh, I cannot think it possible. Send for the ladies. Let them hear me. They are at hand, said Willoughby, opening the door. They were in one of the upper rooms, anxiously on the watch. Dear ladies, Letitia said to them as they entered, I am going to wound you, and I grieve to do it, but rather now than later, if I am to be your housemate. He asks me for a hand that cannot carry a heart, because mine is dead. I repeat it. I used to think the heart a woman's marriage portion for her husband. I see now that she may consent, and he accept her, without one. But it is right that you should know what I am when I consent. I was once a foolish, romantic girl. Now I am a sickly woman, 
all illusions vanished privation has made me what an abounding fortune usually makes of others i am an egoist i am not deceiving you that is my real character my girl's view of him has entirely changed and i am almost indifferent to the change i can endeavour to respect him i cannot venerate dear child the ladies gently remonstrated willoughby motioned to them if we are to live together and i could very happily live with you letitia continued to address them you must not be ignorant of me and if you as i imagine worship him blindly i do not know how we are to live together and never shall you quit this house to make way for me i have a hard detective eye i see many faults have we not all of us faults dear child not such as he has though the excuses of a gentleman nurtured in idolatry may be pleaded but he should know that they are seen and seen by her he asks to be his wife that no misunderstanding may exist and while it is yet time he may consult his feelings he worships himself willoughby he is vindictive our willoughby that is not your opinion ladies it is firmly mine time has taught it me so if you and i are at such variance how can we live together it is an impossibility they looked at willoughby he nodded imperiously we have never affirmed that our dear nephew is devoid of faults if he is offended and supposing he claims to be foremost is it not his rightful claim made good by much generosity reflect dear letitia we are your friends too she could not chastise the kind ladies any further you have always been my good friends and you have no other charge against him letitia was milder in saying he is unpardoning name one instance letitia he has turned crossjay out of his house interdicting the poor boy ever to enter it again crossjay said willoughby was guilty of a piece of infamous treachery which is the cause of your persecuting me to become your wife there was a cry of persecuting no young fellow behaving so basely can come to good said willoughby stained about the face with flecks of redness at the lashings he received honestly she retorted he told of himself and he must have anticipated the punishment he would meet he should have been studying with the master for his profession he has been kept here in comparative idleness to be alternately petted and discarded no one but vernon whitford a poor gentleman doomed to struggle for a livelihood by literature i know something of that struggle too much for me no one but mr whitford for his friend crossjay is forgiven said willoughby you promise me that he shall be packed off to a crammer at once but my home must be crossjay's home you are mistress of my house letitia she hesitated her eyelashes grew moist you can be generous he is dear child the ladies cried he is forget his errors in his generosity as we do there is that wretched man flitch that sort has gone about the county for years to get me a bad character said willoughby it would have been generous in you to have offered him another chance he has children nine and i am responsible for them i speak of being generous dictate willoughby spread out his arms surely now you should be satisfied letitia said the ladies 
is he willoughby perceived mrs mountstuart's carriage coming down the avenue to the full he presented his hand she raised hers with the fingers catching back before she ceased to speak and dropped it ladies you are witness that there is no concealment there has been no reserve on my part may heaven grant me kinder eyes than i have now i would not have you changed your opinion of him only that you should see how i read him for the rest i vow to do my duty by him whatever is of worth in me is at his service i am very tired i feel i must yield or break this is his wish and i submit and i salute my wife said willoughby making her hand his own and warming to his possession as he performed the act mrs mountstuart's indecent hurry to be at the hall before the departure of dr middleton and his daughter afflicted him with visions of the physical contrast which would be sharply perceptible to her this morning of his letitia beside clara but he had the lady with brains he had and he was to learn the nature of that possession in the woman who is our wife end of chapter forty nine read by lars rolander Chapter Fifty of the Egoist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Egoist by George Meredith. Chapter Fifty. Upon which the curtain falls. Plain sense upon the marriage question is my demand upon man and woman for the stopping of many a tragedy. These were Dr. Middleton's words in reply to Willoughby's brief explanation. He did not say that he had shown it parentally while the tragedy was threatening, or at least there was danger of a precipitate descent from the levels of comedy. The parents of hymeneal men and women he was indisposed to consider as dramatis personae nor did he mention certain sympathetic regrets he entertained in contemplation of the health of mr dale for whom poor gentleman the proffer of a bottle of the pattern port would be an egregious mockery he paced about anxious for his departure and seeming better pleased with the society of colonel de craye than with that of any of the others colonel de craye assiduously courted him was anecdotal deferential charmingly vivacious the very man the reverend doctor liked for company when plunged in the bustle of the preliminaries to a journey you would be a cheerful travelling comrade sir he remarked and spoke of his doom to lead his daughter over the alps and alpine lakes for the summer months strange to tell the alps for the summer months was a settled project of the colonel's and thence dr middleton was to be hauled along to the habitable quarters of north italy in high summer tide that also had been traced for a route on the map of colonel de craye we are started in june i am informed said dr middleton june by miracle was the month the colonel had fixed upon i trust we shall meet sir said he i would gladly reckon it in my catalogue of pleasures the reverend doctor responded for in good sooth it is conjecturable that i shall be left very much alone paris strasbourg bal the colonel inquired the lake of constance i am told said dr middleton colonel de craye spied eagerly for an opportunity of exchanging a pair of syllables with the third and fairest party of this glorious expedition to come willoughby met him and rewarded the colonel's frankness in stating that he was on the lookout for miss middleton to take his leave of her by furnishing him the occasion he conducted his friend Horace to the blue room, where Clara and Letitia were seated, circling a half embrace with a brook of chatter, and contrived an excuse for leading Letitia forth. Some minutes later Mrs. Mountstuart called aloud for the colonel to drive him away. 
willoughby whose good offices were unabated by the services he performed to each in rotation ushered her to the blue room hearing her say as she stood at the entrance is the man coming to spend a day with me with a face like that she was met and detained by clara d cray came out what are you thinking of said willoughby i was thinking said the colonel of developing a heart like you and taking to think of others at last a hey, you are a true friend willoughby a true friend and a cousin to boot what has clara been communicative the itinerary of a voyage miss middleton is going to make do you join them why it would be delightful willoughby but it happens i've got a lot of powder i want to let off and so i have an idea of shouldering my gun along the sea coast and shooting girls which will be a harmless form of committing patricide and matricide and fratricide for there's my family and i come of it the girl and i have to talk lively to mrs mountstuart for something like a matter of twelve hours calculating that she goes to bed at midnight and i wouldn't bet on it such is the energy of ladies of that age willoughby scorned the man who could not conceal a blow even though he joked over his discomfiture gull he muttered a bird that's easy to be had and better for stuffing than for eating said d cray you'll miss your cousin i have replied willoughby one fully equal to supplying his place there was confusion in the hall for a time and an assembly of the household to witness the departure of dr middleton and his daughter vernon had been driven off by dr corney who further recommended rest for mr dale and promised to keep an eye for crossjay along the road i think you will find him at the station and if you do command him to come straight back here letitia said to clara the answer was an affectionate squeeze and clara's hand was extended to willoughby who bowed over it with perfect courtesy bidding her adieu so the knot was cut and the next carriage to dr middleton's was mrs mountstuart's conveying the great lady and colonel de cray i beg you not to wear that face with me she said to him i have had to dissemble which i hate and i have quite enough to endure and i must be amused or i shall run away from you and enlist that little countryman of yours and him i can count on to be professionally restorative who can fathom the heart of a girl here is lady bush right once more and i was wrong she must be a gambler by nature i never should have risked with a guess as that colonel d cray you lengthen your face preternaturally you distort it purposely ma'am returned d cray the boast of our army is never to know when we are beaten and that tells of a great-hearted soldiery but there is a field where the briton must own his defeat whether smiling or crying and i am not so sure that a short howl doesn't do him honour she was i am certain in love with vernon whitford all along colonel de cray ah the colonel drank it in i have learnt that it was not the gentleman in whom i am chiefly interested so it was not so hard for the lady to vow to friend willoughby she would marry no one else girls are unfathomable and lady bush i know she did not go by character shot one of her random guesses and she triumphs we shall never hear the last of it and i had all the opportunities i am bound to confess i had did you by chance ma'am d cray said with a twinkle drop a hint to willoughby of her turn for vernon whitford no said mrs mountstuart i am not a mischief maker and the policy of the country is to keep him in love with himself or patton will be likely to be as dull as it was without a lady enthroned when his bride is at ease he is a prince i can read men now colonel de cray pray be lively i should have been livelier i am afraid if you had dropped a bit of a hint to willoughby but you are the magnanimous person ma'am and revenge for a stroke in the game of love shows us unworthy to win mrs mountstuart menaced him with her parasol i forbid sentiments colonel de cray they are always followed by sighs 
grant me five minutes of inward retirement and i'll come out formed for your commands ma'am said he before the termination of that space de Grey was enchanting mrs mountstuart and she in consequence was restored to her natural wit so and much so universally the world of his dread and his unconscious worship wagged over sir willoughby pattern and his change of brides until the preparations for the festivities of the marriage flushed him in his country's eyes to something of the splendid glow he had worn on the great day of his majority that was upon the season when two lovers met between the swiss and tyrol alps over the lake of constance sitting beside them the comic muse is grave and sisterly but taking a glance at the others of a late company of actors she compresses her lips End of chapter fifty End of the Egoist by George Meredith